Examples from the town of Bromberg, where party and state officials had behaved less than heroically on the approach of the Red Army. The police chief had apparently deserted his post. A local army commander had gone against orders in retreating from a defensive position. The government president, head of the regional administration, and the mayor of Bromberg were subsequently degraded and sent to serve in punishment battalions. Faced with especially dangerous tasks, as was the party's district leader, having first been expelled from the party. All had been forced to attend the execution of the police president, SS Standartenfuhrer Karl von Salisch, shot by firing squad for cowardice. The army commander was also shot. On the 11th of February, Himmler put out a proclamation to the officers of Army Group Vistula, whose command he had just taken over, expecting of them a model of bravery and steadfastness in the decisive phase of the struggle against the Jewish Bolshevik danger, and a fanatical will to victory and burning hatred against those Bolshevik sub-animals, but reminded them that the police chief in Bromberg had been shot for not fulfilling the demands of his office. Bormann was by now, on Hitler's behalf, repeatedly instructing party leaders on the need for exemplary behavior, also from their wives, some of whom had left threatened areas before evacuation orders had been issued, again with the threat of severe reprisals for those found lacking. He felt it necessary to pass on Hitler's reminder that all orders were binding, to be implemented if necessary by draconian measures, and to be carried out by subordinates without contradiction, and swiftly. The German people had to understand more than ever at this time that it was led by a strong and determined hand, that signs of disintegration and arbitrary actions would be ruthlessly nipped in the bud, and that neglect by subordinate organs of the party would on no account be tolerated. Any party leader failing in his duties abandoning his people to find safety for himself and his family or gain some other advantage, distancing himself from the NSDAP, or fleeing as a coward instead of fighting to the last, was to be evicted from the party, brought before the courts for judgment, and subject to the most severe punishment. In his circular, stated to not be for publication, on the 24th of February, 1945, the 25th anniversary of the promulgation of the party program. Bormann reminded all party members in unequivocal terms that anyone thinking of himself, of quitting and making off, would be a traitor to the people and murderer of our women and children. Only steadfastness, down to death, without concern for one's own life, served as a defense against the elemental storm from the steppes, the methods of the inner Asiatic hordes. The Fuhrer demanded, and the people expected, of every party leader, that he holds out to the end and is never concerned for his own salvation. For the party rank and file, too, the call of the hour meant to follow, unconditionally, the sense of higher duty. Anyone seeking to save his life is with certainty also through the verdict of the people condemned to death. There is only one possibility of staying alive, he declared, with some contradiction. The readiness to die fighting and thereby to attain victory. For now, the party still, just about, held together. As discipline slackened worryingly in the Wehrmacht too, there was a similar resort to threats of drastic sanctions. Hitler let it be known through Keitel at the time that the Eastern Front was collapsing and his own orders were being challenged by his generals in East Prussia, that if military leaders failed to carry out commands unconditionally or transmit absolutely reliable dispatches, he would demand the most ruthless punishment of those guilty and would expect the courts to be severe enough to pass the death sentence. One plain indicator of the collapsing front was the enormously swollen number of stragglers heading back to Germany. Though many had genuinely become separated from their units, others were feigning detachment from their units in the hope of avoiding further front service. The distinction between those who had deserted and those who, genuinely or not, had lost their units was increasingly blurred. 
Intensified efforts were now made to pick up stragglers and return them to the front, sometimes using special military police detachments. Even on the wildly overcrowded station in Breslau in late January, as desperate evacuees fought to get on the last trains west, military police were searching for anyone in uniform to send them back to fight the Russians. At the end of the month, Himmler appealed to the German people to adopt a hard line towards shirkers, cowards, and weaklings who were failing in their duty. He urged women especially to show no sympathy for shirkers who tagged onto evacuation treks traveling westward. Men who take themselves from the front are not deserving of bread from the homeland, he declared. They had instead to be reminded of their honor and duty, be treated with contempt, and be sent back to the front. The Wehrmacht laid down detailed regulations for seizing stragglers and returning them to front-line duty, ominously adding, insofar as in individual cases judgment by a military court is not necessary. The commandant of Schneidermull, a designated fortress, was commended by Himmler in late January for shooting down retreating soldiers with a pistol, then hanging a notice around their necks, saying, This is what happens to all cowards. The bitter experiences in the East, Bormann noted, showed that in the face of enemy inroads, there is no longer an absolute reliance on the steadfastness of the front troops. Consequently, in early February, in preparation for the expected enemy offensive in the West, he asked Himmler to provide an increased number of interception squads, of the kind that had been successful in the collapse in France the previous summer, to pick up retreating soldiers through rigorous intervention and return them to joyful fulfillment of their duty. The squads were to be backed up, he told the Western Gauleiter, by all the force at the disposal of the police and the Volkssturm. From the local level upwards, regular reports were to be sent to the Gauleiter in the eastern regions, and from there to military commanders on the stragglers caught. Western Gauleiter were also to pay particular attention to the problem on account of expected hostilities in the region. A few days later, Himmler transmitted an order to the higher SS and police leaders in the western regions, advocating use of maximum severity, in tandem with the military authorities, and rounding up stragglers and shooting looters and deserters on the spot, in order to remove any obstacles from the western front in the forthcoming heavy attacks. Bormann had the order passed on in 130 copies to all party leaders at central and regional level. Should anyone intervene too harshly, Himmler stated, in coming out towns and barracks for so-called stragglers or soldiers journeying about with pretended march or travel orders, it was better than not having intervened at all. He had by then, on the 12th of February, announced the implementation in Army Group Vistula, of an order which he found so excellent, put out for Army Group Center by the inimitable Colonel General Schorner. Among the exhortations, in classical Nazi diction, to fanatical hatred against the enemy and the need for iron resolve with our homeland at stake, was the threat that stragglers who don't immediately register for redeployment or follow orders would be placed before a court-martial and charged with cowardice. The result in such an event was, invariably, a foregone conclusion. Schorner's way of dealing with trained stragglers, as he dubbed them, was even in Goebbels' eyes fairly brutal. He lets them be hanged from the next tree with a notice attached, saying, I'm a deserter and have refused to protect German women and children. That, naturally, has a good deterrent effect on other deserters, or those who think of deserting, the propaganda minister observed. At the end of February, Bormann reckoned there were up to 600,000 soldiers in the Reich avoiding front service. A priority throughout the Reich was to track them down and round them up. The public had to be made aware of the problem and a tough approach adopted, in contrast to 1917-1918. Drastic measures were necessary if ducking out of duty was not to spread. Every shirker has to be aware that he will, with great probability, be caught in the homeland, and then without doubt will lose his life. At the front, there was the mere possibility he would die. At home, 
Avoiding his duty, he would certainly do so, and in dishonor. Only when this message sank in shall we master this cowardice disease, he concluded. Some estimates put the number of deserters down to the end of 1944 at more than a quarter of a million. This can be no more than informed guesswork, and may well include honest stragglers, as well as those who, for whatever reason, could take no more and took enormous risks to lay down their arms. The figure relates, however, to the period before the collapse of the Eastern Front in January, sent the numbers of stragglers and those actually deserting, spiraling, perhaps doubling, in the last four months of the war. If the overall scale of the phenomenon must remain no more than an approximation, at least the figures for those punished for desertion by military courts, though not arbitrarily shot or otherwise executed in arbitrary action, are known. Compared with 18 cases in the German army in the First World War, those in the Wehrmacht sentenced for desertion during the Second World War numbered, in a sharply rising trend, some 35,000. Around 15,000 of these received the death penalty. Apart from desertion, any perceived undermining of the war effort brought rapid and harsh retribution. The contrast in severity, both with the sentencing in the German army in the First World War and with that of the Allies in the Second, is striking. For a variety of perceived serious offenses, a total of 150 German soldiers had been sentenced to death in the First World War, 48 of whom were actually executed. German military courts passed, in all, some 30,000 death sentences against German soldiers during the Second World War, with 20,000 carried out. During the Second World War, the British executed 40, the French 103, the Americans 146. The higher the rank, the less likely it was that perceived military failings would incur severe sanction. Generals might be dismissed, as Harpa, Reinhardt, and Hofsbach had been on the Eastern Front in January. But they were not disgraced, let alone sentenced to death or subjected to other forms of severe punishment, though not a few voices in the public could be heard still talking darkly, in tones reminiscent of the aftermath of the July plot in 1944, of traitors and saboteurs in high places. Still, as the military situation worsened, and the regime became increasingly ready in its mounting desperation to resort to violence within, even high officers needed to tread warily. Colonel Tilo von Trotta, in the Army General Staff, would have recognized the warning shot across the bows from a personal acquaintance none other than Colonel General Schorner, in late February. Among ourselves a frank word, wrote Schorner. I received a hint yesterday, most confidentially, of course, that your attitude to the party and its representatives is occasionally somewhat reserved. One could have the impression that you don't place sufficient value in certain things, such as the National Socialist leadership of the army. Dear Trota, he continued, I trust you have understood me. Either we succeed in having fanatical supporters and unconditional loyalists of the Fuhrer at the top, or things will go wrong again. A few days later, in a lengthy and secret missive to the commander-in-chief and generals in command, Schorner amplified this message in a broad attack on the failure of leadership in the staffs of some parts of the army. He praised the soldiers who had learnt to be brutal and fanatical in almost four years of an Asiatic war and had recently, in fighting on the river Nysa, taken no prisoners. In contrast, he scourged the indifference, bourgeois lifestyles, lack of soldier personalities, and defeatist tiredness of spirit of officers who were unable to stir the troops through fanaticism. I am in agreement with the commanders-in-chief and generals-in-command, and with every front soldier, he wrote, that in the Asiatic War we need revolutionary and dynamic officers, Stalin, he added, would have got nowhere if he had waged war with bourgeois methods. Schorner demanded clear and unambiguous fanaticism, nothing else. The scarcely veiled thread in Schorner's letter to Trota and his exhortation to leading generals is a further pointer 
to the lack of unity in the higher ranks of the army. Though many high-ranking officers had long since inwardly turned against the Nazi regime, the spectrum of attitudes reached at the opposite extreme as far as fanatics like Schorner. In such a climate of division, distrust and fear, any prospect of a common front against Hitler would be completely ruled out. The divisions ran throughout society. Far from the united community of fate trumpeted by Nazi propaganda, this was a riven society where individuals looked more and more to their own narrow interests, acquisition of the necessities of life, and above all else, survival. Never have the German people lived in such inner division, was the verdict of one colonel in February 1945. Despite the flood of reports telling them they were fighting a losing battle, Goebbels' propaganda chiefs intensified rather than lessened their efforts as Germany's plight worsened. Newspapers were distributed in Ruhr cities even after the worst bombing raids, though a suggestion that they be dropped by aeroplane was rejected as absurdly impractical. But even Goebbels himself was sick of the empty pathos of repeated exhortations to believe and fight, or to stay with the Führer to final victory. In the absence of reliable information, and in often frank disbelief of official reports, Rumor inevitably spread like wildfire and was difficult to control, most of all when it related to evacuation of the population in areas close to the front. One suggestion, later adopted, was to dispatch special units of, in all, around 1,500 political leaders of the party to key points on the eastern and western fronts to stiffen morale, notably in the west, given the expected hostilities there, to prevent signs of crisis arising as had been the case in the East, as areas had been evacuated and then fallen to the Red Army. The special propaganda units would not come under Wehrmacht command, but be directed by Bormann and Himmler, with the task of organizing and mobilizing the entire strength of the people of the areas in question for total deployment and the war effort. Directives for verbal propaganda issued in mid-February tried to do the near impossible in emphasizing the positives for Germany in the current war situation. The Soviet advance into German eastern territories had been at such a cost of men and materiel that the Bolshevik fighting strength was decisively weakened, it was claimed, opening an extraordinary chance for German counterattacks. The German leadership knew that attack was the best form of defense and would act accordingly. In the West, the length of Allied supply lines was a weakness, whereas German lines were short, units more easily maneuverable, and through the addition of the People's Grenadier Divisions, the Wehrmacht was stronger than the previous summer in Normandy. Not least, the deep echelon fortifications system, it was claimed, allowed reserves to be directed at the right moment to positions under pressure and at the same time forced the enemy into a damaging war of attrition. Little of this sounded convincing. The rallying cries, such as Himmler's to his divisional commanders in Army Group Vistula, passed on for wider circulation that strong hearts triumph over mass and materiel, accompanied by examples of heroic action at the front, must have sounded empty to most people. Other than in reinforcing defiance among the already committed regime loyalists, propaganda was, for the most part by now, visibly failing in its objectives. There was, however, one notable exception. Fear, all the more so after the traumatic events in January, was the prime motivator to hold out and fight on in the East. It formed a bond, even in a negative way forging a kind of integration as all else was falling apart. And in embellishing the already existing and well-justified anxieties of the consequences of Soviet conquest, propaganda still had a significant role to play, both among civilians and in the Wehrmacht. Troops were drilled with the need to combat the Asiatic storm from the east, and reminded through examples from distant history, such as the defeat of the Hungarians near Augsburg in 955 and of Ottoman forces besieging Vienna in 1683, that such attacks had always been repelled by fanatical defense when the enemy reached German soil. Even for some leading Nazis, 
playing on the fears of a population whose nerves were so stretched through the emphasis on Soviet atrocities went too far. But there could be no question of playing down one of the last effective propaganda weapons to hand. Already in mid-February, propaganda preparations were being laid for the defense of Berlin. Leaflets were drafted, addressed to the defenders of Berlin, urging fanatical hatred in the fight to repel the Bolsheviks. It's about countless German women and children who place their trust in you, the draft proclamation ran. Every house a fortress, every street passage a mass grave for the Red Hordes. Hatred against hatred, fight to the last, bloody revenge and thousandfold retaliation for the Bolshevik atrocities in our homeland. Fear of Bolshevism was undoubtedly an important factor in sustaining the readiness to fight on, particularly in those parts of Germany most obviously exposed to advances by the Red Army. The further the population was removed from the immediate threat of Soviet occupation, and the more probable it was that the area would fall to the Western Allies, the less direct resonance, however, the shrill anti-Bolshevik hate propaganda was likely to have. And in the Western parts of the Reich, there was little outright fear of Anglo-American occupation, other than among diehard Nazis and functionaries of the regime. Reports filtering back from areas already occupied even led to claims that the behavior of the Americans was better than our German troops. The reality was that, however much the propaganda machine went into overdrive, only a dwindling minority of Germans remained fully committed to the regime. These did, however, include among their number those who still had power of life and death in their hands. A word out of place could bring a denunciation and the direst of consequences. As the hold of the regime slipped and propaganda was widely disbelieved, repression was increasingly all that was left. A major reflection of the enhanced emphasis on repression and terror within was the decree issued on Hitler's orders on the 15th of February by the Reich Justice Minister Otto Georg Tirak and impatiently awaited by Gauleiter in threatened areas, introducing the establishment of summary courts martial in areas threatened by the enemy. Each court was to be chaired by a judge and to comprise, in addition, a political leader of the NSDAP or one of its affiliates and an officer of the Wehrmacht, the Waffen-SS, or police. The members of the court were to be nominated by the Gauleiter as Reich Defense Commissar for the region. The court was to deal with all offenses that could endanger fighting morale and could issue only three verdicts, death penalty, exoneration, or transfer to a regular court. The Reich Defense Commissar was to confirm the verdict and determine place, time, and manner of the execution. The Führer expects, Bormann added in his covering ordinance to the Gauleiter, that the Gauleiter will implement the task placed before them with the necessary severity and consistency and ruthlessly suppress every sign of disintegration, cowardice, and defeatism with the death sentences of the summary court's marshal. Anyone not prepared to fight for his people, but who stabs it in the back in its gravest hour, does not deserve to live and must fall to the executioner. Some days earlier, Bormann had informed the Gauleiter that this now gave them the weapon to destroy all those pests of people, and declared his expectation that this instrument will be used as the Führer would wish, ruthlessly and without respect to the standing or position of the person concerned. Bormann's guidelines, indicating Hitler's wishes, give clear enough indication that the new courts had little to do with conventional justice. They were, in fact, no more than a facade for increasingly arbitrary and wild terror, instruments of destruction in legal drapery. Death sentences were scarcely more than a formality, all the more so, since the judges were themselves under pressure to show their loyalty. Around six to seven thousand death sentences are known to have been handed out by the summary courts martial, though in countless other cases the executioners did not even wait for the farce of a quasi-judicial sentence. The summary justice became even more arbitrary and unconstrained after the 9th of March, when their reach was extended by Hitler's decree creating the flying court martial. The courts traveled around Germany, dealing with those accused of undermining the war effort in whatever way, and wasting no time before reaching their verdict, usually sentence of death, meted out by the senior officer presiding over the court, 
and without any appeal. By then, all semblance of centralized control over judicial action was visibly disintegrating, and authorized lawlessness and criminality in the name of upholding the struggle of the German people were becoming rampant as the last phase of the regime was entered. 4. In lashing out wildly at anyone seen to impair in the slightest the imperative of fighting to the last in an obviously lost war, the regime was like a wounded animal in its death throes. Any action that smacked of non-conformity could spell disaster for ordinary German citizens. For the designated internal enemies of the regime, the terror by now knew no bounds. Armies of foreign workers, many of them from the Soviet Union and other parts of Eastern Europe, and vast numbers of prisoners in jails and concentration camps were now exposed, within Germany itself, to the untrammeled brutality of the regime's desperate henchmen. The terror, greatly escalating since the autumn, was hugely magnified by the impact of the collapse of the Eastern Front. The closer Germany's enemies approached the borders of the Reich, and the more imminent defeat became, the more the representatives of the regime saw cause to worry about the security threat from the millions of foreign workers laboring under conditions of near slavery to keep the armaments industry going and to keep the country fed, since almost half of those employed in agriculture were foreigners. The precise number of foreign workers by February 1945 is unknown. The previous summer there had been not far short of six million, all forced laborers, and almost two million prisoners of war registered within Germany, in all comprising over a quarter of the total workforce. Of these, some 4.5 million, probably in fact an underestimate, were from the East, predominantly Poland and the Soviet Union, and were regarded both as racial inferiors and as a particular danger. The threat of internal unrest, not in terms of a revolution by the German population, but as a possible rising by internal enemies, not least foreign workers, was taken seriously by the regime. Instructions were laid down, for example, at the beginning of February for the defense of the government district in Berlin in the event of internal unrest. The feeling that foreign workers could pose a serious problem as military defeat loomed was not confined to Nazi paranoiacs. Even the previous August, one general in British captivity had mused that ten million foreign workers would rise up at the approach of enemy armies. Women, their husbands and sons away at the front, or dead, left to run farms with the aid of foreign workers, were worried about their personal safety, though, as it turned out, they seldom had actual cause to fear. In the big cities, the anxieties were palpable. In Berlin the previous autumn, Friedrichstrasse Station had housed, according to Ursula von Kardorf, a young journalist, an underworld almost exclusively inhabited by foreigners, including Poles with glances of hatred, and a mix of people such as was probably never to be seen in a German city. Any outsider was looked at with suspicion, she wrote. The foreign workers were reputedly excellently organized, with their own agents, weapons, and radio equipment. There are 12 million foreign workers in Germany, she said in a telling exaggeration, perhaps reflecting her own inner concern. An army in itself. Some are calling it the Trojan horse of the current war. Numerous reports pointed out that foreign workers were becoming increasingly assertive as they sensed the end of their torment approaching. They were also a very visible presence in big cities. The perception that they were an internal danger mirrored in good measure the appalling living and working conditions to which they had been reduced. Bombing had left hundreds of thousands of them homeless, with no alternative but to frequent air raid shelters, station waiting rooms, and other public places, or find the floor of a ruined office or apartment block to lay their heads down. Food shortages meant they were often forced to steal or loot bombed-out buildings to survive. As any semblance of an ordered society broke down, the fabled peace and quiet, beloved of the German middle classes, was long a thing of the past. The foreign workers offered an obvious scapegoat for the upsurge in criminality and lawlessness. Their image had come to resemble the caricature portrayed by the increasingly worried authorities, who reacted with characteristic harshness. Minor offenses were dealt with savagely, 
foreign workers were regarded not just as brigands, but also as saboteurs, though in fact there was little action that amounted to political resistance. For the most part it was simply a daily struggle for survival. Already in November 1944, Himmler had issued a decree empowering regional offices of the Gestapo to implement measures of atonement as reprisals for grave acts of terror and sabotage. The measures were to be directed usually against persons from foreign peoples who don't come into question as perpetrators but belong to the entourage of the perpetrator. The terror was plainly aimed to serve as a deterrent, opening up thereby a freeway to arbitrary killings, decided at the local level. Gestapo execution squads were recruited in numerous cities and equipped with a general remit to shoot looters, deserters, and other rabble. The decentralization of any control over executions effectively became complete by February 1945, when the head of the security police, Ernst Kaltenbrunner, authorized local police chiefs to use their own discretion on when they saw fit to execute foreign workers, especially Russians. The heads of the Gestapo stations in Dusseldorf, Munster, Dortmund, and Cologne had been warned on the 24th of January that elements among the foreign workers and also former German communists would take advantage of the current situation to engage in subversive action. In all reported cases, the response should be immediate and brutal. Those involved were to be destroyed without requesting special treatment beforehand from Reich Security Head Office. Arbitrary executions of foreign workers now became commonplace. At least 14 Russians were executed by a shot in the back of the head, then tumbled into a ready-made pit in a labor camp near Dortmund on the 4th of February. 24 members of a presumed subversive group, the Kavalenko Gang, were hanged or shot in Duisburg between the 7th and 10th of February. Seventy-four persons were murdered in Cologne, where, as we noted in an earlier chapter, something approaching a local war between dissidents and the police had been going on since the autumn, on the 27th of February, and another fifty hanged in Gestapo headquarters on the day before the Americans occupied the city at the beginning of March. In the north of Germany, the Kiel Gestapo regularly carried out mass executions from January onwards, totaling around 200 prisoners by the end of April. One such was the shooting of 20 to 25 persons in late January or early February, and 17 Russian prisoners on the 1st of March. In the east of the country, in the penitentiary of Zonenberg, near Frankfurt on der Oder, as many as 753 Gestapo prisoners among them around 200 foreigners, were massacred on the 30th and 31st of January. Even this was only the beginning of an orgy of killings of foreign workers in big cities across Germany in the final weeks of the war. For the legions languishing in Germany's prisons and concentration camps, the situation was even worse. The concentration camp population, at the beginning of 1945, numbered around 700,000 prisoners from all over Europe. Just under a third of them women, an estimated 200 to 250,000 of them Jews, the rest mainly political internees, watched over by 40,000 SS guards. A further 190,000 or so prisoners, many of them interned for political offenses, were held in German penal institutions at this time. This entire population of the dispossessed, beyond the reach of any conventional judicial constraints, however harsh, and utterly exposed to the whim of their captors, was now in the greatest peril. Hitler had made no bones about the need to eradicate any internal threat on enemy approach. Probably in February 1945, he issued verbal orders to blow up the concentration camps on the approach of the Allies. According to Himmler's masseur, Felix Kirsten, the Reichsführer SS told him at the beginning of March that if National Socialist Germany is going to be destroyed, then her enemies and the criminals in concentration camps shall not have the satisfaction of emerging from our ruin as triumphant conquerors. They shall share in the downfall. Those are the Fuhrer's direct orders, and I must see to it that they are carried out down to the last detail. Himmler himself had already, in June 1944, 
passed executive powers to the higher SS and police leaders to take necessary action in the event of a rising of prisoners on enemy approach. Camps were to be evacuated, and those interned there moved back into other camps. Should this not be possible, they were to be liquidated. In January, Himmler ordered the evacuation of the camps in the east, telling their commanders that Hitler held them responsible for ensuring that no prisoners should fall alive into enemy hands. Precise responsibilities were, however, as so often in the Third Reich, left unclear. When the camps came to be evacuated, it was amid much confusion and panic rather than through precise implementation of clear orders from above. Two imperatives, at least partially contradictory, played their part in the confusion. One was that prisoners should not fall living into the hands of the enemy, presumably to prevent their giving testimony about the barbarity of their treatment, and also because they might be used as hostages in any possible deal with the Allies. The other, offering the most slender of lifelines for the prisoners, was the need, still bizarrely felt even at this juncture, to retain them for their economic value as slave laborers for the war effort. Extermination versus economic exploitation had long been a contest of Nazi racial policy. The contest continued to the last. Himmler was by now playing a double game, demonstrating his unquestioned loyalty by maximum ruthlessness and brutality, exactly along the lines that Hitler would wish, while seeing his concentration camp empire as a pawn in possible feelers towards the Western Allies, with an eye on retaining a place in the post-Hitlerian order. Resorting to a long-held view in leading Nazi circles, he continued to entertain the vague notion that Jews could be used as hostages or a bargaining tool with the enemy. An attempt had already been made in spring 1944 to barter the lives of Hungarian Jews for lorries to be used on the Eastern Front in a fairly transparent tactic to try to split the enemy coalition. And in October 1944, Himmler met the former Swiss federal president, Jean-Marie Moussy, the go-between in an attempted deal to arrange the release of Jews in German hands against a payment of 20 million Swiss francs from Jewish sources in the United States. Himmler and Moussy met again in the Black Forest on the 12th of January, when the Reichsfuhrer agreed to transport 1,200 Jews to Switzerland every fortnight in exchange for $1,000 for each Jew to be paid into a Swiss account in Moussy's name. On the 6th of February, the first trainload of Jews from the camp at Theresienstadt in northwest Bohemia did actually reach Switzerland, and five million Swiss francs were deposited in Moussy's account. But Ernst Kaltenbrunner, involved in his own soundings, which eventually came to nothing, to ransom Jews, sabotaged the deal. Kaltenbrunner brought to Hitler's attention press reports of the arrival of the first transport of Jews in Switzerland, together with an intercepted piece of intelligence suggesting, wrongly, that Himmler had negotiated with Moussy about asylum for 250 Nazi leaders in Switzerland. An enraged Hitler promptly ordered that any German who helped a Jew to escape would be executed on the spot. Himmler immediately halted the transports, though he was soon to attempt another route to try to use the Jews as a bargaining pawn with the Allies, this time through Sweden. For now, Hitler and Himmler still needed each other, but Hitler's suspicions of his loyal Heinrich can only have been sharpened by what he had learned. It would be asking too much to look for coherence in Nazi policy in these weeks, even in the area of killing the defenseless, in which the regime excelled. In any case, the speed of the Soviet advance in the East, where some of the largest camps were situated, meant that decisions were usually taken on the ground, in maximum haste, and often chaotically by the local SS leadership, and frequently lacked any clarity of goal other than to evacuate the camp forthwith and prevent the enemy taking the prisoners alive. Mass killing of huge numbers of prisoners at the last minute, as guards were taken by surprise by the rapidity of the Soviet advance, was impractical. Leaving them alive for the enemy to find was explicitly ruled out, though in practice this sometimes happened, with those too weak to transport away. That left, forcing them, weakened and emaciated by their captivity, 
ill-clothed, and with scarcely any food, to be moved westwards, often on foot since insufficient transport was available, through the ice, snow, and glacial winds of midwinter. The result was predictably murderous. But the horror was more usually a matter of improvisation within the remit of general guidelines, rather than following clearly prescribed orders from above. For the guards, in any case, the haste of the marches, and the shooting or clubbing to death of stragglers and others who could not keep up the pace, was less dictated by the worry that the prisoners would fall into enemy hands than the fear of being taken captive themselves. The chaos of the actual evacuations of camps and prisons did not mean that no plans had been laid for the removal of the incarcerated when the enemy arrived. The judicial authorities in Berlin had, in fact, already in late 1944, devised guidelines for evacuating the inmates of penal institutions, which were passed on in early 1945 to areas close to the front lines. Prisoners were divided according to the severity of the offense and racial criteria. Remaining Jews and half-Jews, Zinti and Roma, Poles, and the most serious categories of habitual criminals, psychopaths, and asocial subversive prisoners were on no account to be freed or allowed to fall into enemy hands. If they could not be transferred to the police and removed, they had to be neutralized by shooting them dead, and the evidence carefully cleared up. The Soviet advance was so fast, however, that the 35,000 or so prisoners in 75 jails and penitentiaries in the path of the Red Army could not be transported back to central Germany in any orderly fashion. Forced marches of prisoners who were in no physical condition to endure the treks of more than 30 kilometers a day on icy roads and tracks with hardly any food and without warm clothing or adequate footwear were chaotically undertaken. Many simply dropped by the wayside, exhausted, frozen, and starving. Others were shot by trigger-happy guards, themselves desperate to flee from the oncoming Soviets. In one march of women prisoners, forced to cover 36 kilometers in a day in a temperature of minus 12 degrees Celsius, only 40 out of 565 arrived at their destination. But on some marches, a third of the prisoners managed to escape. Their guards were often too few in number, and more concerned to save their own skins than to bother about prisoners. Some guards just left their charges and fled into the unknown. Even so, the death rate during the prison evacuations was high, while several thousand prisoners were simply shot dead in their penitentiaries in the last months of the war, to add to those who died on the forced marches. For the inmates of the concentration camps, the death toll on the forced marches was far higher still. By the 27th of January, when the Red Army reached Auschwitz, by far the biggest concentration camp, which, with its nearby satellites, had combined a huge slave labor complex with an immense extermination capacity, only about 7,000 of the weakest prisoners, barely more than living skeletons, remained of a camp population that had once comprised as many as 140,000 terrorized individuals, the bulk of them Jews. Gassing operations had been halted in November 1944. About 1.1 million victims, around a million of them Jews, had perished there. Killing installations had been dismantled, and attempts made to erase the traces of the camp's murderous activities. The unexpected swiftness of the Soviet advance had caused panic among the Auschwitz guards, though reasonably clear guidelines had been laid down for the clearance of the camp. These included orders from the camp commandant, S.S. Sturmbannführer Richard Baer, to shoot stragglers on the march or any prisoner trying to flee. Beginning already on the 17th of January, some 56,000 prisoners, resembling columns of corpses, had marched off, in great fear and abject misery, scantily clad and without food, trudging through heavy snow in piercing cold. Some were forced to push wheelbarrows carrying the guards' belongings. Another 2,200 were transported by train six days later in open coal wagons with no protection from the glacial conditions. The guards scarcely knew where they were going, 
apart from the targeted destination of the camp of Grossrosen, some 250 kilometers to the west. Minimal food supplies were requisitioned in the villages the prisoner columns passed through. What rest the prisoners were allowed had often to be spent in the open. Even barns or schoolrooms could sometimes not be used for overnight stays, since they were already full of refugees. Any of the prisoners who could not go further was shot. Recall just over a year later one member of a column of about 3,000, mainly Jews, who left Auschwitz-Birkenau on foot in freezing conditions on the 18th of January. It was a complete shooting festival. Every hundred meters there's an SS milestone, the SS's own term for another corpse they had left in the gutter by the roadside with a bullet in the head, recalled another survivor, who endured sixteen days of the barely imaginable horror before arriving at Grossrosen. On the first awful night of the march, he had been forced to stand with the other prisoners for eight hours overnight in the freezing cold of a factory yard belonging to one of Auschwitz's subsidiary camps, without food or drink, not even permitted to move to relieve himself. By the time they moved on next morning, seventy prisoners were dead. The column tramped on as if in a trance, prisoners eating snow to quench a raging thirst. Whenever there was a fragment of food to be had, prisoners in near delirium fought each other for it, to the amusement of their guards. On one day, the 23rd of January, after marching for nine hours through the fierce cold, the prisoners caught a glimpse of a signpost, telling them that they were two kilometers farther from Gleivitz than when they had started that morning. Little wonder that some thought the torture had no point, other than marching on until they were all dead. Some yearned for death to end their misery, and the SS were glad to oblige. For others, survival was all that counted. For many, there was no survival. Up to 15,000 Auschwitz prisoners, most of them Jews, died on the marches. For those who reached Grossrosen, the agony of the marches was far from over. Initially a small camp, Grossrosen, at an important rail junction in Silesia, 60 kilometers southwest of Breslau, had swollen to become a huge complex comprising numerous subsidiary camps and held 80,000 prisoners. As camps and prisoners in the general government of Poland had been closed down over previous months and new prisoners had arrived on almost a daily basis, many of them swiftly to be pushed out again. Ross Rosen's overcrowding reached monstrous proportions, with some of the barrack huts forced to house up to nine times their normal complement. Hygiene and sanitation were as good as non-existent. Illness and infestation rampant. Rations consisted of bread and a spoonful of jam, with half a liter of salty soup distributed three times a week. We are a thousand men lying in a room with space for maximum two hundred, jotted one prisoner in his diary notes. We can't wash. We get half a liter of Svita broth and two hundred grams of bread. Up to today, there were two hundred and fifty dead in our barracks alone. And as conditions deteriorated, the terror inflicted by the guards became even more arbitrary. Many of the tens of thousands teeming into Grossrosen from Auschwitz were there only a couple of days before being transported onwards in open rail wagons on journeys that could last up to a fortnight before arrival at one of the equally overcrowded and grotesquely brutal hellholes in the Reich, such as Bergen-Belsen, Buchenwald, Flossenburg, Dora Mittelbau, or Mauthausen in Austria. On the 8th and 9th of February, the main camp at Grossrosen was itself evacuated in chaotic haste, though some of the outlying auxiliary camps fell into Soviet hands before the prisoners could be removed. The prisoners received a piece of bread each for the journey before being crammed, like cattle, into open goods wagons, so tightly and without protection against the bitter elements that many did not survive the journey. Others were shot even on the way to the station, and some while trying to escape. Many others, 500 in one transport of 3,500, were murdered at the station. Bodies lay strewn along the railway lines. Around 44,000 prisoners from Grossrosen reached other camps within the Reich. The number who died en route is not known, but was evidently very large. 
for a third huge concentration camp complex in the east, at Stutthof, near Danzig, at the Vistula estuary. Detailed evacuation plans had been worked out the previous summer. The idea was to ship a section of the prisoners westwards from Danzig to Gottenhofen, while the remainder would head overland to a temporary stationing at Lauenburg in Pomerania, before being moved on to camps in the Reich itself. A number of subsidiary camps were closed down at the approach of the Red Army in January, and the 22,000 prisoners, the majority of them women, held there, were moved out. The massacre at Palmniken in East Prussia, mentioned in the previous chapter, was the result of one such evacuation, but was far from the sole slaughter of prisoners removed from these subsidiary camps, particularly those not capable of undertaking the forced march, whom the SS did not know what to do with. The threat from the Red Army's advance to the vicinity of Elbing and Marienburg on the 23rd and 24th of January, leaving them only about 50 kilometers from Stutthof, led also to the hastily reached decision to evacuate the main camp. On the 25th of January, each taking 500 grams of bread and 120 grams of margarine for the trek, around 11,000 prisoners were forced out into the wintry wastes for a seven-day march to Lauenburg. German and the small number of Scandinavian prisoners were better treated than the Jews, Poles, and Soviets. Clear orders were given that the prisoners were to march in rows of five, and that any trying to flee or showing any signs of rebellion were to be ruthlessly shot down. By the time they reached Lauenburg, between the 1st and 4th of February, two-thirds of the prisoners were dead. Most were unfit to travel further into the Reich. An estimated 85%, 9,500 out of 11,000, who started the terrible march to Lauenburg, mostly Jews, did not survive. Some 113,000 concentration camp prisoners, in all, set out on the death marches in January and February. A cautious estimate is that at least a third did not survive. Those on the marches could expect little help from the villagers of the places they passed through. The guards did what they could to keep the prisoners segregated, and, where there was some contact, prevented attempts by anyone prepared to show sympathy by throwing them a piece of bread or another morsel. In other instances, people were hostile to the prisoner columns. Whether from fear of the guards, of the prisoners, or of both, or approval of the treatment of the Reich's enemies, most bystanders kept their distance. Often, too, the marches were passing through already evacuated districts or diverted to avoid contact with refugee treks. Of those who did manage to survive the terrible ordeal, the barely describable suffering was far from at an end. Having reached grossly overcrowded concentration camps within Germany, where conditions of existence, it could scarcely be called living, were deteriorating drastically by the day, in the last wild weeks of the Third Reich, they were forced to endure still further death marches, even more chaotic than those they had already barely survived. 5. In another way, too, Terra came home into the Reich on a new scale. This was the Terror from the Skies. Given its lasting symbol by the Allied raids on the 13th and 14th of February, 1945, which ruthlessly obliterated the historic and beautiful center of Dresden, a city labeled, on account of its cultural glory, Florence on the Elbe. By this time, hardly any German city or town of any size had wholly escaped the horrors of the Allied bombing campaign, and many had experienced death and destruction at the hands of the bombers on numerous occasions. Arthur Bomber Harris had presided over the campaign to destroy German cities since 1942. Northern and western cities, most easily reachable from British bases, had been the first to be targeted. By 1943, British nighttime area bombing was linked to daytime American so-called precision raids, often in fact considerably less than precise, as the severity of the attacks grew in the proclaimed strategy of round-the-clock bombing. In a especially terrible and devastating attack on Hamburg in July 1943, around 40,000 citizens perished in horrific firestorms. 
The cities of the Rhine-Ruhr industrial belt were relentlessly and repeatedly attacked as the bombing intensified over 1943 and 1944. Cologne, Essen, home of Krupp, Dortmund, the rural coal pot Bochum, and other major parts of the industrial conurbation were reduced to heaps of rubble. As Allied control of the skies grew and air bases could be situated closer to Germany, cities in the middle and south of the country became more frequent targets. Kassel and Darmstadt, Heilbronn, Stuttgart, Nuremberg and Munich were among those to suffer fearful attacks. The great metropolis Berlin, its sheer size as well as distance from enemy bases, an obstacle to the level of destruction caused in some other cities, was attacked 363 times in all during the course of the war. The heavy raid on the 3rd of February inflicted the worst destruction in the capital to date, laying waste the government district and the historic buildings of the city center, though, luckily for Berliners, causing only a fraction of the death toll the Allies had intended. There was a sharp escalation of the bombing as Allied strength grew, and the Luftwaffe was increasingly rendered ineffective. In 1942, a total of 41,440 tons of bombs were dropped on Germany. In 1943, the figure rose to 206,000 tons, and in 1944 expanded more than five-fold to 1,202,000 tons. And 471,000 tons, or more than twice the amount dropped in the whole year of 1943, were dropped between January and the end of April 1945. The 67,000 tons dropped by the RAF in March 1945 amounted, in fact, to almost as much as the entire tonnage unloaded onto Germany during the first three years of the war. Some of the most devastating attacks were made on near-defenseless populations in the very last weeks of the war, with a near obliteration of Fortsheim, gateway to the Black Forest, on the 23rd and 24th of February killing 17,600 people, a quarter of the population, and the savage bombing, militarily quite pointless, of Würzburg on the 16th of March, leaving 4,000 dead out of 107,000 inhabitants, as incendiaries destroyed 90% of the beautiful Baroque center, a cultural gem within 17 minutes. Germany was paying a dreadful price reaping the whirlwind for what it had begun even before the war with the merciless bombing of Guernica in 1937, and once the war had started, in the ruthless attacks on Warsaw, Rotterdam, Coventry, and densely populated parts of London. In all, it is adjudged that Allied bombing of Germany killed close to half a million people. A third of the population suffered in some way. More than a quarter of the homes in Germany were damaged by attacks from the air. In this terrible catalogue of death and destruction through enemy bombing, the ferocious attacks on Dresden on the 13th and 14th of February holds a special place. They were perfect conditions for complete aerial annihilation. Good weather for bombing, the almost total absence of air defenses, the lack of provision by the Nazi leadership, of even semi-adequate air raid shelters, apart from the bunker built for the use of Gauleiter Martin Muschmann, and a city overcrowded by the accommodation of thousands of refugees to add to the population of 640,000. All this was the target of a double British incendiary and explosive attack of enormous severity that ensured the complete firestorm which turned the old town into a raging inferno. This was followed by a further heavy raid next lunchtime, now by the Americans. People taking cover in makeshift shelters were suffocated. Those on the street were sucked into the devouring firestorm. When survivors emerged onto the street after the first attack, they were caught up in the second, which magnified greatly the ferocity of the firestorm and widened the area of devastation. Those diving into the large reservoir in the middle of the city to escape the flames, among them people who were injured or non-swimmers, found that, Unlike swimming pools, there was no easy way of getting out, since the walls were of smooth cement, and many drowned. On the burning streets, charred corpses lay everywhere. 
basements and cellars were full of bodies. In the main station, which had been crammed with refugees, there were corpses and parts of bodies wherever one looked, in the tunnel passages and waiting rooms in horrific numbers. Nobody got out of here alive. In the pandemonium, the difference between death and survival was a hair's breadth, often a matter of pure luck. The best hope was to reach the Elba and the safety of the river. When the firestorm finally blew itself out, and the bombers of the next day's raid had dispatched their lethal loads and left for home, Dresden was a city of the dead. But for a few, remarkably, the night of horror brought salvation. The remaining Jews of the city had been awaiting their imminent deportation and were aware what that meant. In the chaos, they were able to rip off their yellow star, join the homeless Aryan masses, and avoid deportation to their deaths. Even at this late stage of the war and amid all the mayhem of the ruined city, the regime showed a remarkable capacity for organizing an improvised emergency response. Aid teams were dispatched to Dresden the morning after the attack. Two thousand soldiers and a thousand prisoners of war, together with repair teams from other cities in the region, were rushed in. A command post and communication system were erected to coordinate work. Within three days, 600,000 hot meals a day were being distributed. Martial law was declared and looters arrested, and in numerous cases, executed forthwith. The gruesome task of collecting charcoal bodies started, some of it undertaken by prisoners of war. With bureaucratic precision, the city's authorities collected and counted the corpses. More than 10,000 were buried in mass graves on the edge of the city. Thousands more were cremated between the 21st of February and the 5th of March, in huge pyres on the Altmarkt in the center of town. The official report on the victims of the bombing, compiled in March, spoke of 18,375 dead, 2,212 seriously injured, 13,718 slightly injured, and 350,000 homeless. Taking account of others still presumed to be lying beneath the masses of rubble in the inner city, the report estimated the death toll at 25,000, still accepted as the most reliable figure. This figure is lower than the grim toll of mortalities in Hamburg in July 1943, though as a proportion of the population higher, if considerably smaller, than in Fortsheim, which, measured in this macabre way, suffered the worst rate of the entire war. The shock of Dresden was all the greater since it had long presumed that, as such a cultural jewel, they would be spared the fate of other big cities in the Reich. Of course, Munich's reputation as a city of priceless art and architecture had offered no protection against as many as 73 air raids. And the center of Würzburg, the testament to the Rococo genius of Balthasar Neumann, was almost totally wiped out in March. But Munich, apart from its art treasures, was the capital of the Nazi movement, as it had been labeled since 1933. And the flattening of Würzburg, where, despite the level of destruction, the death toll was perhaps a fifth of Dresden's, might have been a bigger shock had it preceded, not followed, the bombing of the Saxon capital. Dresden had been a huge attack, and with the end of the war in sight, had caused immense loss of life, and had destroyed a city of singular beauty. Perhaps all this was sufficient of itself to turn Dresden, of all the cities mercilessly pounded from the air, into the very symbol of the bombing moor. There was, however, something else. Dresden gave Goebbels a propaganda gift. He seized upon an associated press report, which, remarkably, passed the British censor, and spoke, not inaccurately, of a policy of deliberate terror bombing of great German population centers. Within days he was castigating a deliberate policy to wipe out the German people by terror attacks aimed not at industrial installations, but at the population of a peaceful center of culture, and the masses of refugees, many of them women and children, who had fled from the horrors of war. The numbers of refugees in the city, and killed in the attack, were inflated in the reportage, though many had indeed fallen victim to the bombing, 
and the Allies were well aware that refugees had poured into the city in recent weeks in the wake of the Red Army's advance. Also deliberately misleading was the image of a city without war industries, devoid of military significance. Its position as an important railway junction gave it some importance, and most of its industry was involved in war production. The attempt to disrupt the passage of German troops through Dresden to reinforce the Eastern Front, and thereby to assist the Soviet offensive, was in fact the rationale behind the bombing of Dresden, along with other eastern cities, including Berlin. It was, nevertheless, the case that the main target in Dresden had been the heavily populated area of the old town, not the more outlying industrial installations. Not least, Goebbels magnified the number of victims by the simple device of adding a zero onto the official figure. Instead of 25,000 dead, itself a vast number, Goebbels created a death toll of 250,000. From horrific reality, he created even more horrific and long-lasting myth. He and other Nazi leaders also used the bombing of Dresden to emphasize the need to fight on. The only response possible, his weekly newspaper, Das Reich, claimed, to the threat to Germany's existence posed by the Western Allies as much as by the Soviets. It seems unlikely that most ordinary Germans drew this conclusion from the devastating attack. True, there were voices to be heard, echoing Goebbels, that Germany would not be forced by terror to capitulation. But they were probably the exception. Letters to and from the front speak of the horror at the news of what had taken place, but not of strengthened morale or determination to hold out. Doubtless, the prevalent hatred of air gangsters gained some new sustenance. For the most part, however, the destruction of Dresden probably signified for most people not the need to resist to the last, but the helplessness against such wanton devastation and the futility of fighting on while Germany's cities were being obliterated. And Dresden, the most glaring manifestation of the Nazi regime's inability to protect its own population from the bombers, brought no deflection of the mounting antagonism of the German people towards their own leaders. Trust in the leadership shrinks evermore, ran a summary of letters monitored by the propaganda ministry in early March. Criticism of the upper leadership ranks of the party and of the military leadership is especially bitter. 6. The horror inflicted on Dresden did little or nothing to hasten the end of the war. But it was a reminder to many that the end was not far off. The regime's leaders, too, were well aware, not that they would openly acknowledge it, that the game was up, that it would be a matter of weeks, not months, before Germany was totally crushed. They could intensify the terror and repression directed now also at their own population, and throttle any possibility of a repeat of 1918. But they were powerless to stop the flood tide of impending defeat. The outward facade of invincibility had to be maintained. Robert Lai, the Labour Front leader, whose public utterances and reputation for drunkenness were an embarrassment to Goebbels and other leading Nazis, even managed to draw positives from the Dresden Inferno declaring that as a consequence the struggle for victory would no longer be distracted by concerns for the monuments of German culture. Yet privately, Ley could see as well as anyone how desperate the situation was on the fronts. Even within leading SS circles, Himmler held to the myth that the war would turn out well for Germany. Rituals were to continue as usual. Himmler wrote to Obersturmfuhrer Freier von Berlipsch, to congratulate him on the birth of his eighth child, and let him know that the light of life, part of the pseudo-religious cultism within the SS, for little Dietmar could be sent only after the war. The Reichsfuhrer SS let it be known among his leading aides that he wanted every year in May to establish which book he would give to higher SS leaders at the Yulefest, the order's pagan version of Christmas. A list was to be provided by the 30th of April, 1945, on which the titles of the books in question were to be presented. And replying to the father of one of his godchildren, 
who had written to thank him for all the presents to his family, mentioned that a Christmas plate, a Yule teller, had arrived broken. Himmler had Rudolf Brandt, his aide, provide assurance that, should a small contingent be available after the war, I will gladly again send you a Christmas plate. Speaking privately to Albert Speer, Himmler kept up pretenses. When things go downhill, there's always a valley bottom, and only when that's reached, Herr Speer, do they go up again. This maintenance of illusions came from a man wavering between his own growing sense of delusion and hard-headed awareness of realities, who was already making tacit overtures to the enemy with an eye to his post-war future. A curious mixture of unreality and business as usual prevailed, too, in the highest ranks of the state bureaucracy. Lutzgraf Schweren von Krossig, the long-serving finance minister, who had held office since 1932, before Hitler's accession to power, dispatched numerous letters in early 1945 to Nazi leaders and government ministers offering advice on the conduct of the war. Little notice was taken of them. His main preoccupation, however, was the desolate state of Reich finances. In January, he compiled a lengthy dossier sent to leading figures in the regime, which began by stating, The current finance and currency situation is characterized by rising costs of war, falling state income, increased money supply, and smaller purchasing power of money. It was urgently necessary, he concluded, drastically to restrict money supply by reducing Reich expenditure and by increases in postage, rail, and local transport prices, and by raising taxation on tobacco and alcohol, visits to the cinema, hotel accommodation, radio license fees and newspapers, as well as increasing the war supplement on gas, water, and electricity prices. With remarkable logic, justifying the post-war impression of him as an individual of singular ineptitude, an utter ninny, he reasoned that, it cannot be objected that essential provisions for the population are thereby being made more expensive, since a large part of the population has already been entirely without regular access, or with only restricted access, to water, gas, and electricity for months. He presented his proposals for a fourfold rise in property tax to a meeting of ministers on the 23rd of February, lamenting Bormann's absence from the meeting and his unwillingness to discuss the dangers of a collapse of the currency. All he could get out of the party chancellery was a suggestion that a program should be devised by state officials after which Bormann would be able to judge whether it could be politically implemented. In any normal political system, the imminent collapse of the state currency would have been a matter of the utmost priority. To the Nazi leadership in the conditions of February 1945, it was of no consequence. Undeterred, Krosig continued to work on his plans for tax reform, which were criticized in late March by Goebbels, as if they were about to be implemented, for placing the burden upon consumer tax rather than income tax. By that time, it was at best an arcane issue. Most of the country was under enemy occupation. Constantly in Hitler's close proximity, Martin Bormann was more aware than most of the true scale of the disaster closing in on Germany. His frequent letters to his wife, Gerda, show his anxious recognition of the plain realities of the military situation, brought home to him at first hand by the bombing of the Reich Chancellery on the 3rd of February. The day following this heavy raid, he feared, he wrote, that the worst phase of our fortunes is still to come, and told Gerda, frankly, how very unpleasant Indeed, if I am completely honest, how desperate the situation really is. But pretense had to be maintained, and he added, I know that you, like myself, will never lose your faith in ultimate victory. Next day he wrote again, first with scarcely veiled pessimism about the outlook on the Western Front, but then reverting to a form of fatalistic hope in the future. He wrote, Anyone who still grants that we have a chance must be a great optimist, and that is just what we are. I just cannot believe that destiny could have led our people and our Führer so far along this wonderful road, only to abandon us now and see us disappear forever. A victory for Bolshevism and Americanism 
would mean not only the extermination of our race, but also the destruction of everything that its culture and civilization has created. Instead of Meistersinger, we should see jazz triumphant. Goethe replied, One day the Reich of our dreams will emerge. Shall we, I wonder, or our children live to see it? Martin interpolated some words in his wife's letter at this point. I have every hope that we shall. In another letter to her, a little later, he added, As I have often emphasized, I have no premonitions of death. On the contrary, my burning desire is to live, and by that I mean to be with you and our children. I would like to muddle on through life together with you, as many years as possible, and in peace. Goebbels was, for many Germans, the outward face of the regime in the last months, appearing in public more frequently than any other Nazi leader, visiting troops at the front line, as well as urging on bombed-out civilians, a constant driving force in his radio broadcasts and newspaper articles, to ever greater efforts to hold out and fight on. He still worked feverishly to drum up new recruits for the Wehrmacht, and now to plan the defense of Berlin, for which he saw Bolshevik methods in Leningrad and Moscow as a possible model. He remained among the most utterly fanatical Nazis, widely regarded alongside Himmler as one of the strong men of the regime. He urged rapid sentencing by drumhead courts martial and execution to address the miserable mood among the 35,000 stragglers and deserters recently rounded up, looking to Stalinist methods to restore order and combat sunken morale. His fanaticism led him to advocate the execution of tens of thousands of Allied prisoners of war in response to the bombing of Dresden. He was still a figure of remarkable dynamism, able not just to put on a show for the masses, but also to fire up those in his entourage and continue to represent the face of optimism and defiance. Yet he was among the most clear-sighted of the Nazi leaders. When, in early February, his wife Magda lamented the loss of so many territories that Germany had once conquered, and the weakness now unable to prevent the threat to Berlin itself, Goebbels replied, Yes, sweetheart, we've had it, bled white, finished. There's nothing to be done. Despite such sentiments, he had not conceded defeat. He still saw in late February, so his aide, Wilfred von Oven, recorded, a slim chance of avoiding complete disaster if Germany were to gain some time. Then, a delusion he shared with other leading Nazis, negotiate to let in the Western Allies to join in a fight against Bolshevism. But he readily admitted that Hitler did not share this view, and still insisted that 1945 would bring the decisive change for the better in Germany's fortunes. He was skeptical about Hitler's extraordinary adherence to undiluted optimism. But a visit to the Fuhrer bunker was nevertheless invariably an antidote to any fleeting moments of depression. The atmosphere there, increasingly given to flights from reality, usually dissipated his doubts and pandered to his willingness to believe in some near-miraculous change in war fortunes. After one visit in mid-February, he came away enthused by discussions with the architect Hermann Geisler, who had just shown a fascinated Hitler his model of Linz, as it was to be after the war. Geisler told Goebbels, as he had indicated to Hitler, that he thought most German towns could be rebuilt within three to five years. Goebbels found himself, as in 1933, at the end of the struggle for power, longing to take part in the work of reconstruction. He still pressed, as he had long done, for a radicalization of the home front, the dismissal of Goering and Ribbentrop, both of whom he regarded as utter failures, and an obstacle to any new initiatives, and a search even at this late stage for a political solution to end the war. But he remained, as always, a faithful acolyte of Hitler, unwilling and unable to take an independent step. He saw Hitler as a stoical disciple of Frederick the Great, fulfilling his duty to the end, a model and an example to us all. For Goebbels, too, reality and illusion were by this time closely interwoven.
More realistic than other Nazi leaders in his appraisal of the situation was Albert Speer. On the 30th of January, as it happened, the 12th anniversary of the takeover of power, he submitted a lengthy memorandum to Hitler outlining the armament situation for February and March. He pointed out the dire consequences from the loss of Upper Silesia, hitherto Germany's last intact coal-producing area. He provided figures demonstrating the dramatic fall over the previous year of weapons and munitions production. At the current levels of coal and raw steel capacity, it was, he wrote, impossible to sustain the German economy for long. Collapse could only be delayed for a few months. After the loss of Upper Silesia, the armaments industry was no longer remotely in a position to cover the demand for weaponry to replace losses at the front. Speer concluded his memorandum in underlining bold type. The material superiority of the enemy can accordingly no longer be countered by the bravery of our soldiers. Goebbels drew the logical conclusion from the memorandum, which he recognized as showing things as they really are, that Speer was indicating the need to try to find a political way out of the war. But he saw no prospect of that. He was right to be pessimistic. Hitler forbade Speer to give his memorandum to anyone else, somewhat belatedly, since Goebbels and others had already seen it, and, referring specifically to its conclusions, told him coldly that he alone was entitled to draw conclusions from the armament situation. That was an end to the matter, as Speer acknowledged. Hitler's authority was still intact. In sustaining his unchallengeable leadership position, he could thank, now, as before, in no small part, his provincial chieftains, the Gauleiter. Although he had to insist in early February that the Gauleiter blindly follow orders from Berlin and stop the tendency to govern in their own way, actually a tendency that grew, rather than diminished, in the last weeks of the war, he was soon afterwards lavishing praise on them for their utter dependency in controlling matters of civil defense. Most of them, like Gauleiter Albert Forster of Danzig, West Prussia, had probably given up hope of a positive outcome to the war in Germany. But whatever their private feelings and the secret hope some of them cherished of escaping the tightening vice, they remained a group of outright loyalists. Summoned to what turned out to be their last meeting with Hitler, in the Reich Chancellery on the 24th of February, 1945, the 25th anniversary of the promulgation of the party program, the Gauleiter, minus Koch and Hunka, unable to leave East Prussia and Breslau, respectively, initially shared criticisms and complaints with each other, not least about Bormann. But they were all still full of belief in victory, at least on the surface. In truth, they were anxious about betraying any defeatist sentiment. Karl Wall, Gauleiter of Swabia, had the feeling, so he wrote later, that they all lived on the moon, when Hitler finally arrived, they were shocked at his appearance, that of an old, ill, physical wreck of a man, whose left arm shook the whole time. Tears came to Val's eyes at the sight of such a decrepit individual. For him, it was the end of the world. Hitler had begun the meeting by shaking hands with each individual Gauleiter for what seemed an age. Looking them in the eyes, he did so. But his speech an hour and a half long, was a disappointment. He spoke at great length, as he had done so often, about the past, the First World War, his entry into politics, the growth of the party, the triumph of 1933, the reshaping of Germany thereafter, but hardly touched upon what they had come to hear, how Germany stood in the war, what he had to say about the impact of the new U-boats and jet planes was less than convincing. The much-vaunted miracle weapons were not even mentioned. It seemed a far cry from the old Hitler. But after the formal proceedings, he relaxed visibly in their company over a simple meal until, their own conversations petering out, they all found themselves listening, as ever, to a monologue. Hitler spoke now with a verve earlier lacking about the certainty that the alliance of madness ranged against Germany would break up into two irreconcilable fronts, and of the dangers for the West in a Pyrrhic victory, 
that would raise Bolshevism to a dominant position in Europe. Our depressed mood evaporates, recalled one Gauleiter, Rudolf Jordan, party boss of Magdeburg Anhalt. The disappointment of the last hours has vanished. We experience the old Hitler. They were left in no doubt. He would fight on, to the bitter end. That much was clear, as it always had been. There could be no talk of defeat, no talk of surrender. It was good to have burnt one's bridges. On the evening of the 12th of February, the communique from the Yalta Conference, where Stalin, Roosevelt, and Churchill had met for a week in crucial deliberation to determine the post-war shape of Europe, was read in Berlin. The communique stipulated that Germany would be divided and demilitarized, the Nazi party abolished, and war criminals put on trial. There could now be no lingering doubt for Nazi leaders that Germany's fate was sealed. There would be no negotiated end to the war. Unconditional surrender meant just that. For Hitler, it simply confirmed what he already knew. I've always said there can be no question of a capitulation, was his response to Yalta. History does not repeat itself. Chapter 7 Crumbling Foundations Is there nobody there who will restrain the madman and call a halt? Are they still generals? No. They are shitbags, cowardly poltroons. They are cowards, not the ordinary soldier. Diary Entry of an Officer in the West The 7th of April, 1945 1. By March 1945, Allies were closing in, east and west, for the kill, as the Reich's military weakness was fully exposed. The Eastern Front was reinforced at the expense of the West, but the troops were invariably already battle-weary and increasingly ill-trained young recruits. The huge losses could simply no longer be made good. The fighting strength of divisions had fallen drastically. The greatly weakened, though still tenaciously fighting, German forces faced an impossible task in trying to halt the Red Army, once it had regrouped and consolidated its supply lines after the big advance of January. In the West, the Ardennes Offensive had inflicted a temporary shock rather than a major reversal on the Western Allies. They soon regathered and prepared for the assault on the Western frontiers of the Reich against a Wehrmacht whose impoverished resources were incapable, despite its tough rearguard action, of repelling immensely superior might. The task was rendered completely hopeless through the near-total impotence of the Luftwaffe, whose limited capability in the West had been cut back in order to supply, wholly ineffectively, the Eastern Front. After the disasters of January, the Army High Command did all it could to reinforce the Front in Pomerania and along the Oder. Army Group Vistula, commanded by Himmler and comprising 25 infantry and 8 panzer divisions, defended an extensive sector running from Elbing, in the east, to the Oder, little more than 80 kilometers northeast of Berlin. The whole of its southern flank, however, faced the Red Army, impatient to press northwards towards the Baltic coast. Once a weak German counteroffensive in mid-February had fairly easily been parried, the loss of Pomerania, allowing the Soviets to secure their northern flank for the coming assault on Berlin, swiftly became unstoppable. On the 4th of March, the Red Army reached the Baltic coast between Koslin and Kolberg. The coastal town of Kolberg was a vital strategic stronghold. The spectacular color film Kolberg, referred to in an earlier chapter, which Goebbels had commissioned, depicted the town's heroic defense against Napoleon's forces. This time there was, however, to be no heroic defense. Kohlberg was besieged on the 7th of March, and declared by Hitler a fortress to be held at all costs. The town commandant held out only until the civilians, including around 60,000 refugees, many of them wounded, could be shipped away by the navy, then left himself over the sea on the 18th of March, along with the town's remaining defense force. Other Pomeranian strongholds were lost soon afterwards. By the 20th of March, after days of bitter fighting, Stettin's harbor and wharves 
had been wrecked and could no longer be used by the German Navy. Though German troops held on to a bridgehead, and the city itself, now largely deserted, fell to the Soviets only towards the end of April. Gottenhofen held out until the 28th of March, and the key city of Danzig till the 30th of March, enabling the Navy to ferry many desperate refugees and wounded civilians and soldiers to safety. By this time, German forces in Pomerania had been broken, then crushed. What remained of them, around 100,000 men, retreated to the long, thin Hela Peninsula, facing Gottenhofen in the Bay of Danzig and the Vistula Delta, where they remained down to the capitulation. Overall, between the beginning of February and the middle of April, Army Group Vistula suffered losses of around 143,000 officers and men killed, wounded, or missing. In East Prussia, the battered forces of Army Group North still comprised 32 divisions in early February, 23 of them belonging to the 4th Army, and the heavily fortified Heilsberg Pocket, about 180 kilometers long and 50 deep. A second grouping was besieged in Konigsberg. A third, the 3rd Panzer Army, contained on the Zamlan Peninsula. For a brief time in mid-February, intense fighting opened up a corridor from the encircled Konigsberg to Pilau, the last remaining port in German hands in the province. This enabled some civilians in Konigsberg to escape and provisions to be brought in for the garrison. Once the corridor was closed off again, the fate of the remaining inhabitants of Konigsberg was sealed. Though capitulation did not follow until the 9th of April. Meanwhile, the position of the troops in the Heilsberg pocket had worsened sharply. The replacement of Rundelich by Colonel General Walter Weiss as Commander-in-Chief Army Group North on the 12th of March could bring no improvement. By the 19th of March, the German pocket was reduced to an area of no more than about 30 kilometers long and 10 deep, exposed on all sides to intense Soviet firepower. By the time the last remnants of the 4th Army were transported across the Frischishof from Balga, and then to safety from Pilau on the 29th of March, only 58,000 men and around another 70,000 wounded could be rescued out of an original complement of half a million. The eight divisions left on Zamland continued to fight on for some weeks, until Pilau was eventually taken on the 25th of April, when the broken and demoralized remainder retreated to the Frischenerung. There they stayed, though with further losses through repeated heavy Soviet bombardment, until the end of the war. On the Oder, the German Ninth Army, under General Theodor Busse, sought, with weakened forces, to hold the defenses of the heavily fortified town of Kustrin and the designated fortress of Frankfurt under Oder. Reinforcements were rushed to the area, but could not compensate for the bloodletting and the fierce fighting. The Panzer Division Kurmark alone lost between 200 and 350 men a day, and the Soviets were able gradually to extend their bridgehead. By early March, Kustrin could be supplied only through a narrow corridor three kilometers wide, which was closed off on the 22nd of March. Much of Kustrin fell on the 13th of March, after bitter street fighting over previous days. But what remained of the 15 battalions defending the town under the leadership of SS Brigadefuhrer Heinz Reinefahrt, the former police chief in the Warteland, who had also been prominent in the savage brutality used to put down the rising in Warsaw, retreated within the old fortress walls. When an attempted counteroffensive to relieve the siege failed, amid high German casualties, Guderian was made the scapegoat. He became the last chief of the general staff to be dismissed by Hitler on the 28th of March, when he was replaced by General Hans Krebs. A second attempt to reach Kustrin that same day had to be abandoned after a few hours. Reinefart ignored Hitler's order to fight to the last, and the garrison of almost a thousand officers and men managed to break out of the encirclement on the 30th of March, just before Kustrin fell. For this disobedience he was court-martialed, and was fortunate to escape with his life. Further south on the Oder, in Lower Silesia, the Red Army made relatively slow progress. Schorner's Army Group Center comprising some twenty infantry and eight panzer divisions, battled ferociously, though, in the end, vainly. 
The Germans fought hard to keep open a corridor to Breslau, though once this was closed by the 16th of February, some 40,000 troops, along with 80,000 civilians, were sealed off in the Silesian capital. Another 9,000 were encircled to the north in Glogau. Tough German resistance was unable to prevent the Soviets reaching the right bank of the Nysa near its confluence with the Oder by the 24th of February. In mid-March, a big drive by the Red Army in the Opeln area overcame fierce fighting to surround and destroy five German divisions. Around 30,000 Germans were killed and another 15,000 captured. When Rotterbor fell on the 31st of March, the last large industrial city in Silesia was lost to the Germans. What was left of Army Group Center was forced back onto the western reaches of the Nysa and southwest into the Sudetenland. On the southern flank of the Eastern Front, where 19 infantry and 9 panzer divisions were located, the intense fighting around Budapest, which had lasted for weeks, was finally reaching its denouement. Ferocious street fighting, ultimately in the sewers, came to an end on the 13th of February. Between them, the Germans and Hungarians had lost 50,000 men killed and 138,000 captured in the battle for Budapest. Soviet losses were even higher. Heavy fighting continued to the west of Budapest. Hitler insisted against Guderian's advice on a counteroffensive centered on Lake Balaton. A successful outcome, so ran the strategic thinking, would free nine divisions to be sent to the Oder for an eventual counteroffensive there in May. It would also block the Soviet approaches to Vienna. Most crucially, it was vital to the continuation of Germany's war effort to retain control of the remaining oil wells in the region. Sepp Dietrich's 6th SS Panzer Army, refreshed since the failure in the Ardennes, was sent down to spearhead the attack, which began on the 6th of March. The German forces battled their way forwards around 20 to 30 kilometers over a 50-kilometer stretch, but after ten days, amid heavy losses and exhaustion, the attempt ran out of steam. General Otto Wohler, Commander-in-Chief, Army Group South, gave out orders to fight to the last. But even the elite troops of the 6th SS Panzer Army preferred retreat to pointless self-sacrifice. The orders were disobeyed as Dietrich's men fought their way back westwards into Austria in some disarray, narrowly avoiding complete destruction, but abandoning much heavy equipment as they went. In blind fury, Hitler ordered that Sepp Dietrich's units, including his own bodyguard, the Leibstandarte SS Adolf Hitler, should be stripped of their armbands in disgrace. Even General Hermann Balk, the tough panzer commander in Hungary, who himself had telephoned Guderian to request action be taken against intact units of the Leibstandarte, retreating with all their weapons, thought the degradation too harsh a punishment. Worse than the prestige issue of the armbands, from a German perspective, was that by the end of March the oil fields were lost, along with the whole of Hungary. The Austrian border now lay directly in the path of the Red Army. By the end of March the Red Army had made significant headway on all parts of the Eastern Front. Berlin was now under imminent threat. In the West, too, February and March saw German defenses put up stiff opposition but ultimately crumble as the Western Allies were able to cross the Rhine, the last big natural barrier protecting the Reich, and advance deep into Germany itself. By February 1945, Germany's Western Front was defended by 462,000 soldiers in 59 divisions, about a third as many as on the Eastern Front. These were hopelessly outnumbered by the forces of the Western Allies who by this time had more than 3.5 million men on the European continent. The German divisions were smaller than earlier in the war, on average just under 8,000 men, and the actual fighting strength of each of them only about half that number, many of them young recruits already worn down by constant fighting. Tanks, artillery, and aircraft, like manpower, had had to be sacrificed for the Eastern Front. It was made clear to the commanders of the Western Army Groups, Army Group H in the north, under Colonel General Johannes Blaskowitz, who had replaced Colonel General Kurt Student on the 28th of January, 
Army Group B in the center of the front under Field Marshal Walter Model, and Army Group G in the south led by Colonel General of the Waffen-SS, Paul Hauser. That, given the situation in the east, they could reckon with reinforcements of neither men nor materiel. The imbalance with the armaments of the Western Allies was massive, and most pronounced in the air, where Allied supremacy was as good as total. Before the Allies could tackle the crossing of the Rhine, they faced tenacious defenses west of the Great River from north to south. In Alsace, French and American troops had already forced the Germans back across the Rhine near Colmar in early February. The main Allied attack began, however, further north, on the 8th of February. Despite initial slow progress against fierce resistance, abetted by bad weather and the opening of dams to hamper tank and troop movements, Canadian and British forces, pushing southeastwards from the Nijmegen area, and Americans pressing northeastwards from around Durin, took Krefeld on the 2nd of March, and by the 10th of March had encircled nine German divisions near Wesel, capturing 53,000 prisoners, though many German troops were nonetheless able to retreat over the Rhine, destroying the bridges as they went. By this time, once the Americans had reached the Rhine south of Dusseldorf, on the 2nd of March, a long stretch of Germany's most important river was in Allied hands, and with that, a vital artery for delivery of rural coal and steel blocked. On the 5th of March, American troops broke through weak defenses, many manned by the Volkssturm, to reach Cologne. The following morning, the retreating Germans blew up the Hohenzollern Bridge in the city center, the last remaining crossing in the Rhine metropolis. The problem for the Allies of gaining a bridgehead on the eastern bank of the Rhine was, however, soon solved by a slice of good luck. German troops retreating at Remagen, farther south, between Bonn and Koblenz, had failed to detonate the explosives laid, and the Americans, to their great surprise, finding the bridge intact on the 7th of March, crossed and swiftly formed a small bridgehead on the eastern bank. Desperate German attempts to clear it meant that precious reserves were sucked into Remagen, to no avail. Farther south, Trier fell on the 1st of March. General Patton's 3rd U.S. Army, after struggling since mid-February to overcome strong resistance, was able to force the defenders back across the Rhine and Mosul by the 10th of March, the day after Field Marshal von Rundstedt had been relieved of his command for the last time and replaced his commander-in-chief West by the tough Field Marshal Albert Kesselring, adjudged to have acquitted himself well in the rearguard action in northern Italy. Three days later, the Americans were crossing the Mosul and preparing to attack the Tsarland, still producing about a tenth of German iron and steel. Kesselring refused to evacuate such a vital industrial area. Intense fighting followed, but there could be only one outcome. The German forces eventually retreated into the eastern Tsarland, then the Palatinate and finally across the Rhine, suffering severe losses, also inflicting them on the enemy. By the 25th of March, the Tsar was lost to Germany. By that time, the Americans had also occupied Kaiserslautern, Worms, and Mainz. Meanwhile, Koblenz had fallen on the 17th of March. Six days later, the entire stretch of the Rhine, from Koblenz to Ludwigshafen, was in American hands, and a second bridgehead over the river had been established at Oppenheim, south of Mainz, where troops had crossed in assault boats in a daring maneuver on the night of the 22nd to the 23rd March. That day, the British commander, Field Marshal Montgomery, led his forces over the lower Rhine at Wesel, and by the end of March had consolidated an extensive bridgehead on the eastern bank of the river. The basis for the assault on the Reich's biggest industrial region, the Ruhr, was thereby laid. Farther south, now the Americans were over the Rhine, fierce German resistance was unable to halt their progress deep into the western parts of the Reich. Mannheim, Ludwigshafen, and Frankfurt on Main were in American hands by the 29th of March, Heidelberg two days later. From here on, the advance into central Germany, and to the south into Bavaria, would rapidly unfold. In the defense of Rhine positions, the Germans had suffered appalling losses, 
with more than 60,000 men killed or wounded and 292,000 taken prisoner. The loss of tanks, artillery, and other heavy weaponry, as the troops had been hastily forced back over the Rhine and Mosul, was huge. German fighting power, weak enough at the onset of the Allied offensive, was now drastically diminished. Even the paper strength of the divisions, itself much reduced during the fighting of February and March, belied the reality that only a minority, many of them raw recruits, were by now capable of frontline service. Defenses otherwise were dependent upon the poorly equipped Volkssturm and hastily assembled units transferred from the Luftwaffe and Navy. If Allied superiority on all fronts in manpower and armaments was ultimately simply overpowering, the characteristic refusal by Hitler and the high command of the Wehrmacht to countenance tactical retreats until it was too late exacerbated the losses. Coupled with this was the rejection of all entreaties by Guderian and others to withdraw German forces still located outside the Reich's borders. These included, most prominently, 200,000 battle-hardened troops stranded in Courland, together with forces occupying the Low Countries, Scandinavia, and still fighting in northern Italy. The main reason for the catastrophe, nevertheless, lay in the consistent refusal by the Reich's leadership to surrender and determination to fight on when any realistic hope had long been extinguished. By the end of March, then, Germany's enemies were across the Oder in the east and across the Rhine in the west. That even now there was a readiness to fight on when little, if anything, could be gained, though continued destruction and heavy loss of life were thereby guaranteed, is little less than astonishing. The readiness should not, however, be mistaken for widespread popular commitment to the German war effort. In the East, it is true, fear of the Soviets was a strong deterrent to defeatism and willingness to surrender. For most people, however, whether in the army or among the civilian population, there was simply no alternative but to struggle on under the terroristic grip of the regime in the dwindling parts of the Reich that were still not occupied. 2. All the indications point to a slump in morale within the Wehrmacht, especially in the West, as the defenses gave way and the enemy pressed into the Reich. It was matched by the state of civilian morale. The regime reacted to try to combat the signs of disintegration, as always, through ramping up still further its propaganda efforts and through ferocious repression to serve as a deterrent. The party went to great lengths in March 1945 to intensify propaganda efforts to sustain and improve the fighting spirit within the Wehrmacht and among the civilian population. At the start of the month, Bormann sought support from the Gauleiter for a new propaganda drive that aimed to avoid any empty slogans, but to reinforce a fanatical will to resist. A special action of the party chancellery was set up to organize intensive propaganda activity through deputations of party functionaries in Wehrmacht uniform and army officers. Propaganda, it was accepted, had to be improved. Based on recommendations from Goebbels, it had also to be far more realistic than hitherto, an oblique recognition of some of the failings of hopelessly optimistic prognoses. Soldiers had to be given answers to the central questions preoccupying them, whether there was still a point in fighting and whether the war could be won. A number of themes had to be highlighted, that Germany still had enough supplies of armaments and food and sufficient reserves of manpower and materiel, none of which was true, belying the emphasis on realism, the development of new miracle weapons, on which there was by now all too justified widespread disbelief, the effectiveness of the Panzerfaust, the German type of bazooka widely associated with the Volkssturm's despairing defensive efforts, and the fact that the Americans had to deploy their forces over a huge area, which of course had not stopped them making massive inroads through German defenses. None of this was much of a recipe to restore the rapidly waning confidence and slumping morale. Party speakers serving with the Wehrmacht were selected to address the troops, all the more necessary since transport difficulties were preventing written material from reaching them. In the region of Hessen-Nassau, 
arrangements were made to bus party speakers chosen by the Reich propaganda leadership to frontline troop units. The leaflets such speakers were to distribute included reminders to think of the mass murder of Dresden, to encourage them in the belief that the British and Americans, as their destruction of the homeland through terror bombing showed, were no better than the Bolsheviks. The only lesson was to stand and fight to the last. Another approach was to try to deflect attention from complaints and grievances by turning the spotlight on the enemy. This included disparaging the Americans as inferior to the Germans in every respect other than the sheer might of their weaponry, and the claim that Britain was at the limits of its tolerable losses. More remarkably, criticism of German mishandling of occupied territories was to be met with assertions that German measures had in fact been superior to those of the Allies, that we could in any case have a really good conscience in the question of treatment of most of the peoples hostile to us. Understanding for the tasks of the party and its achievements in the war effort could be improved through comparing these with the running of the First World War. The speaker action included advice on how to deal with commonplace criticisms. Defeatist talk, for instance, had to be met with insistence that only determination and the will to resist could master the crisis. Blame attached to the party for the war was to be countered by emphasizing that war had been declared on Germany, not the other way round, and that the enemy aimed to destroy not just the leadership but the very existence of Germany, that it would be far worse than after 1918. A rejoinder to the widespread view that the air terror was the most unbearable burden of all, and accompanying expressions about unfulfilled promises, was that hardships had temporarily to be endured to allow time to produce better weapons. Pessimistic remarks that Germany had been unable to do this with its industry intact, and could therefore hardly hope to do so with so much of it destroyed, were to be turned round by saying that the loss of territories meant a smaller industrial output sufficed. Finally, dejection at enemy inroads in East and West had to be faced down by instilling confidence that countermeasures had been taken and would become stronger, that the fight was continuing at the front and at home, and that it was necessary to hold out to allow time for military and political decisions to ripen. The tenor of all speeches had to be an insistence that Germany would not lose the war, but would still win it. People had to be given the conviction that there was a united fighting community which would on no account give in, but would be determined to endure the war with all means in order to gain victory. Little of this could sound convincing to any but the willfully blind and obtuse. People in Berlin likened propaganda to a band playing on a sinking ship. Most soldiers as well as civilians could see the hopelessness of the situation and form their own judgments on the feeble attempts of propaganda to contradict the glaringly obvious. The diary entries of a junior officer on the Western Front, who kept a careful eye on propaganda statements, comparing them with reality as he saw it, give one impression of feelings as the Americans advanced through the Rhineland. Wherever you go, only one comment, an end to the insanity, he observed on the 7th of March, the day after Cologne had fallen. He did admit, however, that the occasional optimist, such as one of his comrades, a former Hitler youth leader, and a great show-off, still existed, though such figures could provide no grounds for their optimism. He could barely believe the reports of street fighting in the ruins of Bonn. Ruins, he remarked. That is the legacy for people after the war. How differently Ludendorff acted at the end of the First World War, when he recognized that all was lost to some extent still conscious of his responsibility. The unspoken criticism of Hitler was obvious. Commenting on what proved to be the last Heroes Memorial Day on the 11th of March, the diarist noted how the dead are being misused, their memory and their sacrifice. There should and must now be an end. Reports reaching the propaganda ministry in early March told of many soldiers looking bleakly towards a bitter end to the war. Goebbels himself acknowledged in early March 
in exhorting party propagandists to ever greater exertions that troop morale was a problem in parts of the army. On the 11th of March, he noted that the morale of our troops and our population in the West has suffered exceptionally. Something can only now be achieved in the West through brutal measures, otherwise we'll no longer be master of the developing situation. Hitler briefly contemplated scrapping the Geneva Convention, which stipulated good treatment for prisoners of war, to encourage his soldiers to fight as hard on the Western as on the Eastern Front. But there were problems in the East, too. Guderian felt forced to provide a vehement denial of a scathing report about defeatist attitudes, even among the general staff of Schorner's Army Group Center. Though the report was inevitably colored by the usual party antagonism towards general staff officers, the officers' recorded criticism of the poor quality and wavering resolve among the infantry is unlikely to have been fabricated. In Danzig, there was talk of a second Stalingrad, since the army gave the impression of being paralyzed and lacking in initiative. Hundreds of soldiers were said to have deserted their posts at Kustrin, described as no more than one single heap of rubble at the end of the siege, where there were plain signs of demoralization. They had fled westwards along with Folkstrom men only to be picked up by the secret police and forced back into their units. Given the reported scale of looting by German troops in Kustrin, people muttered grimly that the Russians could be no worse. Looting of houses and other property by retreating soldiers was by now, however, almost everywhere a commonplace occurrence, despite the threat of severe sanctions for those involved. There were other indications of army indiscipline. A party district leader in the Halle merseburg region reported a minor mutiny of 200 soldiers from a panzer division and complained about the inability of police checks at stations to pick up deserters. At the fall of Trier, most of the Volkssturm defenders were said to have gone over to the enemy. Others did all they could to avoid military duty. German troops on the Mosul, surprised by American tanks, had simply fled in whatever vehicles were at hand, leaving their arms and equipment behind. Of course, there were plenty of exceptions to the widespread longing of so many ordinary soldiers for the end of the war. One long letter home from a battalion sergeant major, based in Wiesbaden, just after the Americans had crossed the Rhine at Remagen, reveals an undiluted Nazi mentality and sense of unbroken defiance, though his own comments make plain that he was a rarity among his comrades, and he admitted that we can no longer rely 100% on our soldiers. He scorned American hopes, as he saw them, that Germans would lay down their weapons, or would fight with them against the Russians, as Jewish tricks. Though he admitted the situation was extremely grim, he refused, he said, to lose his belief that we'll nevertheless win the war. I know that I'm laughed at by many people or thought mad. I know that there are only a few apart from me who have the courage to claim this. But I say it over and again. The Fuhrer is no scoundrel, and not so bad as to lie to an entire people and drive it to death. Up to now the Fuhrer has always given us his love and promised us freedom and carried out all his plans— and if the Fuhrer prays to God that he may pardon him the last six weeks of this war, of the nations, then we know that there must and will be an awful and terrible end for our enemies. It was therefore imperative to stay brave and strong. What use are all our material advantages if we end up later somewhere in Siberia? He added. He was confident that Germany would strike back within the next few weeks with new weapons that would end this desolate situation, and decisively turn the war in Germany's favor. We must firmly believe in Germany's future. Believe, and evermore believe. A people that has so courageously lost so much blood for its greatness cannot perish. Only our faith makes us strong. And I rely on the words of the Fuhrer that at the end of all the fighting there will be German victory. As the Allies crossed the Rhine and pushed into Germany, such naivete was distinctly a minority taste. By the end of March, only 21% of a sample of soldiers captured by the Western Allies still professed faith in the Fuhrer, a drop from 62% at the beginning of January, while 72% had none. 
a mere 7%, still believed in German victory. 89% had no such belief. A detailed report to the propaganda ministry from Hessen-Nassau in late March, as the Americans were advancing into the Mine Valley, painted a dismal picture of disintegration, antipathy between the military and party leadership in the area, organizational disorder, and civilians refusing orders to evacuate, on the grounds that they had nowhere to go, and, in any case, it's all over. Many people, propaganda offices reported in March, had given up hope and there was a widespread view that the war was lost for Germany, though there remained a readiness, it was claimed, to continue doing their duty since it was recognized that capitulation would mean the complete destruction of the German people. The defeatism was furthered, and much bitterness caused, by troops fleeing eastwards as fast as they could go, leaving badly trained and poorly equipped Volkssturm units behind, and displaying a complete lack of comradely behavior towards the wounded and civilian evacuees, as they brusquely commandeered vehicles for their retreat. The long-serving Gauleiter of the area, Jakob Sprenger, who had already requested permission to set up summary courts martial in his region, added that the morale of the troops was influenced by the defeatism of the civilian population. The sense that defeat, at least at the hands of the Western Allies, would mean the end of German existence was scarcely apparent. White flags had been shown in various places on the approach of enemy troops, and the erection of tank barriers blocked. The population of numerous places on the Mosul acted in similar fashion, exhorting the troops to cease fighting to avoid further destruction. A despairing SD agent wrote to Bormann of his bitter disappointment, shared with the many now serving on the Western Front who had come from the East, and had, like himself, lost everything at the hands of the Bolsheviks, when they saw the defeatist attitude of the civilian population in the Moseland region as Allied troops approached. People showed friendliness towards the Americans, he reported, but hostility towards their own troops. Propaganda attempts to inculcate hatred of the enemy were a complete failure. The Hitler greeting had disappeared from use. No rooms any longer had pictures of the Fuhrer adorning them. White flags had replaced the swastika banner. Weapons were concealed or thrown away. There was, of course, no willingness to serve in the Volkssturm, and the attitude towards the party was one of total annihilatory rejection. In the Rhineland, civilians were said to have hurled insults at soldiers, accusing them of prolonging the war and causing additional misery by blowing up bridges and digging tank traps. They cut wires and engaged in minor acts of sabotage, prepared white flags of surrender, burnt party emblems and uniforms, and encouraged soldiers to put on civilian clothes and desert. Such acts of localized opposition were, even so, not typical of the majority of the population. The longing for an end to the war was certainly near universal, but doing anything to shorten it was highly risky. Most people were not prepared to risk their lives at the last moment. This, together with an ingrained acceptance of authority, meant that resigned compliance, rather than resistance, was the norm. And however extensive outward expressions of rejection of the continued war effort were on the Western Front, they were rare, if not non-existent, in the East, where the civilian population was wholly dependent on the fighting troops to keep the feared enemy from their throats. Army discipline still held, by and large, and not just in the East. Even so, desertion by troops was, by now, a serious concern for the military and party leadership. Goebbels noted in early March that the desertion plague has worryingly increased. Tens of thousands of soldiers, allegedly stragglers but in reality wanting to avoid frontline service, are said to be in the big cities of the Reich. Discussions in the party chancellery to tackle the problem included the suggestion, found to be impractical in the circumstances of mounting disorganization, of a nationwide general raid on a specific day to round up all detached soldiers. Another was to leave executed deserters hanging for a few days in prominent places, a tactic said to have been effectively deployed in the East as a deterrent. One woman, describing her flight from Silesia as a young girl, recalled her horror at seeing four corpses left to swing from lampposts, with notices pinned to their bodies, telling passers-by, 
I didn't believe in the Fuhrer, or I am a coward. Such fearsome reprisals, which proudly had much support from those who felt they were doing their utmost for the war effort, were to be accompanied by emphasizing the motto of Gauleiter Hanka, holed up in besieged Breslau, that he who fears death in honor will suffer it in dishonor. On the 12th of March, Field Marshal Kesselring, the new commander-in-chief West, announced as one of his first orders the establishment of a motorized special command unit of military police to round up stragglers, who, he declared, were threatening to endanger the entire prosecution of the war in the West. Three days earlier, a flying court-martial, mentioned in the previous chapter, had been set up under the fervent loyalist Lieutenant General Rudolf Hubner, a dentist in civilian life and cheerful executioner, who allegedly said it gave him great satisfaction to shoot a general who had neglected his duty, to counter desertion and defeatism. The first victims were five officers found guilty of failing to detonate the bridge at Remagen, and peremptorily condemned to death. Four were shot that very day. The fifth, luckily for him, had been captured by the Americans. Model and Kesselring proclaimed the verdict to all their troops as a deterrent example, adding that the greatest severity was expected of the court's marshal. As the desperation increased, other frontline commanders also threatened, and deployed, harsh enforcement of discipline, even if Colonel General Schorner stood out, as we have seen, for the scale of his brutality. Rundelich ordered unwounded stragglers who had left their units to be summarily shot, Himmler, as commander-in-chief of Army Group Vistula, published orders that after the 25th of March any straggler would be sentenced by drumhead court and shot on the spot. Demands for fanatical defense of the Reich accompanied such severity. Unambiguous politicized fanaticism, as Stalin's troops had displayed, was required by Schorner in the East. In the West it was scarcely less savage. Paul Hauser, a Waffen-SS general commanding Army Group G in the south of the front, recommended the imprisonment of family members as a deterrent and ordered his soldiers under pain of punishment immediately to open fire on any soldier seen crossing the lines. The commander-in-chief of Army Group H, based in the Netherlands, Colonel General Blaskowitz, was certainly no SS extremist. In fact, he had been castigated by Hitler in 1939 for... Salvation Army Methods, for courageously criticizing the barbarity of the SS in Poland. But in the harshness of the treatment of his own troops in the last war months, Blaskowitz was no different to other generals, threatening deserted soldiers on the 5th of May with being summarily condemned and shot. The enemy must have to fight for every step in German land through the highest possible bloody losses, Rundstedt had ordered at the beginning of March. His successor in the Western Command, Kesselring, sought the assistance of the party's Gauleiter to impress upon the public the need to fight for German towns and villages now within the war zone, with absolute fanaticism. This struggle for the existence or non-existence of the German people does not exclude in its cruelty cultural monuments or other objects of cultural value, he proclaimed. Jodl appealed to commanders in the West to ensure that the enemy encountered a fanatical will to fight among troops defending the Reich. Regard for the population, he added, could currently be no consideration. Generals were no mere tools of Hitler, much as they claimed to have been such in their post-war apologetics. They acted from conviction, doing all in their power to inspire and compel their troops to ever greater efforts. Though they subsequently liked to portray themselves as professional soldiers, doing no more than their patriotic duty. They were, in fact, the most indispensable component of the dying regime. Though few shared Schorner's undiluted belief in the doctrine of National Socialism, they all accepted some of its articles of faith. The combination of extreme nationalism, meaning belief in German superiority and the unique glory of the Reich, and anti-communism, together with a passionate resolve to prevent the occupation and, as they mostly believed, the destruction of Germany, sufficed to sustain their undiminished exertions in a lost cause. A distorted sense of duty was a strong additive. 
Without their extraordinary commitment to continuing the struggle, when rational assessment demanded an end to the destruction, the regime would have collapsed. Among the military leaders displaying the greatest fanaticism in the final weeks of the Reich, counter to the post-war image he cultivated, was Grand Admiral Karl Donitz, Commander-in-Chief of the Navy. His series of short situation reports were seen as so valuable by Bormann for their defiant fighting spirit that he had them sent out to Gauleiter and other leading party functionaries. The first of Donitz's reports on the 4th of March began, There is no need to explain to you that in our situation, capitulation is suicide and means certain death. That capitulation will bring the death, the quick or slower destruction of millions of Germans, and that, in comparison with this, the blood toll even of the harshest fighting is small. Only if we stand and fight have we any chance at all of turning round our fate. If we voluntarily surrender, every possibility of this is at an end. Above all, our honor demands that we fight to the last. Our pride rebels against crawling before a people like the Russians, or the sanctimony, arrogance, and lack of culture of the Anglo-Saxons. He appealed for a sense of duty, honor, and pride to fight to the last. In the Navy, more than in the Luftwaffe, where morale had suffered from its heavy losses and from the drastic decline in public standing as Allied bombers dominated the skies, or the Army, such appeals were not without effect. In 1918, the revolution had begun with a mutiny of sailors in Kiel. Sailors schooled in the Third Reich were well aware of this stain on the Navy's history. Not that there was any likelihood of a repeat in 1945. As in the other branches of the Wehrmacht, attitudes and forms of behavior varied widely. War weariness was evident, but desertion, mutiny, and indiscipline in the Navy were rare. For the most part, morale remained high, and readiness to fight on was present to the end, when, indeed, thousands of sailors were transferred to help in the Battle of Berlin. Since taking over as commander-in-chief at the end of January 1943, Donitz had done all he could to instill in the Navy the most brutal will to victory that derived from National Socialist ideology. Bolstering his readiness to utmost resistance in the fight with the Western powers, Bolshevism, and Jewry, was the message passed on by one of his subordinate officers, the head of a destroyer flotilla based in Brest. How much this sort of rhetoric shaped the unbroken fighting spirit of ordinary sailors is nevertheless hard to judge. Other factors may well have been more significant. Donuts had ensured that naval crews had good welfare provision, material and psychological, and the war at sea, for all its perils, was somewhat detached from the daily brutalities of the land war in the East. For some, indeed, the part they played in helping to rescue tens of thousands of stranded refugees gave the continued war some purpose and sense of idealism. Others perhaps found purpose in the claims of the naval leadership that the continued war at sea was tying down enemy forces and that the navy would be an important bargaining counter in any negotiated settlement. Most important of all, however, was almost certainly the feeling of comradeship, enhanced by the close confines of a ship or submarine, where class divisions were less apparent than on land, as officers and men lived cheek by jowl sharing exactly the same dangers. Finally, as in the remainder of the Wehrmacht and among the civilian population, there was another factor at work, impossible to quantify but doubtless widespread. Passive acceptance of the situation, since there was no obvious alternative. If this did not amount to positive motivation, it certainly did not pose any barrier to the military system continuing to function. And with that, to the war continuing. 3. High-ranking military officers had possibilities of a wider perspective on the war than might be expected among the rank and file. What did the generals see as the purpose of still fighting on at this stage? Was there any sense of rationality, or was nothing left beyond a fatalistic dynamic that could not be halted short of total defeat? Was there any clear-sightedness at all? 
Colonel General Heinrich von Fiedinghoff Scheel, in the last phase of the war, commander-in-chief of the German forces in Italy, pointed out a few years later that, following the great increase of size of the army in the course of the conflict, the number of generals by 1945 had risen to around 1,250, though he estimated that only about 50 had any insight into the overall strategic position. Addressing the question of potential political power of the generals to block the disastrous course of the war, he took the view, naturally involving more than a tinge of apologetics, that even among the field marshals, the slightest attempt to bring together a majority to unified action against Hitler would have been condemned to failure and become known to Hitler, apart from the fact that the troops would have refused to go along with such a move. He rejected the notion that generals serving at the front could have resigned in protest. This simply would have meant abandoning their troops and would have flown in the face of all sense of comradeship and honor. It would have been cowardice. Finally, voluntary capitulation would have been feasible only if the troops had been prepared to follow the order, which they would not have done, he claimed. The war, Fiedinghoff wrote on release from captivity, was unquestionably lost once the Rhine Front had collapsed in March 1945. Ending it at that point would have spared countless victims and massive destruction. It was the duty of the Reich leadership to draw the consequences and negotiate with the enemy. Since Hitler refused to entertain such a proposition, this duty fell to everyone in a position of responsibility, able to do something to achieve that end. In this situation, the duty of obedience reached its limits. Loyalty to the people and to the soldiers entrusted to him was a higher duty for the commander. However, in taking such action, he had to be sure that the troops would follow him. This, Fiedinghoff still felt, at the beginning of April, with German troops holding a line south of Bologna, unable to guarantee. The majority of the troops, he claimed, an exaggerated claim at this stage, in all probability, still had faith in Hitler, and the regime would swiftly have blamed the commander for treachery, exhorting the troops not to obey him. Solidarity among the fighting troops would have collapsed, as some would have wanted to carry on the fight, others to surrender. It would be some weeks yet before Fiedinghoff finally agreed to a capitulation in Italy. Even then, he was unsure until late in the day, so he later implied, about the readiness of the troops to surrender. Post-war memoirs by former military leaders frequently, like Fiedinghoff's, have a self-serving flavor. They can, nonetheless, still illustrate ways of thinking that shaped behavior. Fiedinghoff shared the sense of obedience, honor, and duty that had long been bred into the officer corps and posed a psychological barrier to anything that smacked of treason. He at least did eventually act, though by then the Red Army was almost literally at the portals of the Reich Chancellery. His uncertainty about the readiness of the troops to follow orders to surrender also sounds plausible. And whether he would have sought a partial capitulation, even at such a late stage, had he been serving on the Eastern or Western Front, might reasonably be doubted. For all its apologetics, Fiedinghoff's account gives an indication of why German generals could not contemplate breaking with the regime. Though numerous generals confided their opinions to paper after the end of the war, contemporary expressions of their private views are relatively rare. Few generals in those hectic weeks had time to compile diary entries or other current reactions to events. They had in any case, like everyone else, to be wary of expressing any critical, let alone defeatist, comments that might fall into the wrong hands. Penetrating their public stance is, therefore, difficult. Some insight into the mentality of German generals in the last phase of the war can be gleaned from the private conversations, which they did not know were being bugged, of those in British captivity. These were, of course, by now viewing events from afar, and without any internal insights into developments. On the other hand, they could express their views freely without fear that they would be denounced as traitors or defeatists and suffer for their criticism of the regime. Strikingly, despite recognition that the war was undoubtedly lost, these high-ranking officers drew quite varied conclusions, 
depending in part on their susceptibility to Nazi thinking and propaganda. Some of the more Nazified officers believe that if Bolshevism triumphs today, then it will be a question of the biological annihilation of our people. Speculation after the failure of the Ardennes Offensive that Rundstedt might surrender in the West in order to fight on in the East was dismissed as impractical. The Western Allies would not accept a partial surrender. Rundstedt could in any case do nothing because SS Panzer divisions among his army group would not allow it. And there was the fear that anyone attempting such unilateral action would be killed immediately. Non-Nazi, relatively critical, officers were still in February and March 1945, evoking elementary military honor in demanding that nobody in the front line, not even the commander-in-chief, can even consider whether or not he should carry on fighting. Honor was a crucial consideration. Whatever defeats they may yet suffer, ran another comment, this nation can only go down with honor. A lower-ranking officer, captured at Altsai, between Worms and Mainz, in mid-March 1945, gave his Allied interrogators his own views, based on what he had gleaned at Army General Staff Headquarters at Zossen, on why the Germans kept on fighting. The realists in the General Staff, he said, expected the Rhine and Elbe lines to collapse and meant to go down fighting. Whilst Hitler was in power, it was not considered possible for the German forces to lay down their arms. Any attempt to overthrow him was presumed out of the question after the failure of the Stauffenberg plot the previous July. The intentions were to hold the line of the Oder as long as possible, and when this was no longer tenable, to make a fighting withdrawal to the Elbe. In the West, the priority was to wipe out the Remagen bridgehead. It was not anticipated that the Allies would be able to cross the Rhine anywhere else. In the North, troops would be withdrawn from western Holland to hold the line on the lower Rhine. It was believed, he added, that the line of the Elbe in the East and of the Rhine in the West could be held for as long as proved necessary. It envisaged that sooner or later a split would occur between the U.S. and U.K. on the one hand, and the U.S.S.R. on the other, which would enable Germany to restore her position. The reemergence of the Luftwaffe, with production of jet fighters as a first priority, was seen as a prerequisite for the strategy, so oil refineries and other vital installations were provided with especially heavy anti-aircraft defenses. One contemporary glimpse of the thinking of a high-ranking officer based inside the Reich, away from the front lines, is afforded by letters, cautiously couched to avoid anything smacking of defeatism, of Colonel Kurt Pollux, from the 9th of January, 1945, Chief of Staff to the Head of Wehrmacht Armaments. Pollux was a cultured individual and no Nazi, but he was fatalistic and passive, accepting that he could do nothing other than continue with his duties, which of course helped the regime in his own sphere still function, and brace himself for the hurricane soon to come. He had a realistic sense of impending disaster, but felt in his way as helpless as the millions of soldiers and civilians in lowly positions to do anything to prevent it, or see any alternative. Everything is carrying on at present as if it would be all right at the end, he wrote on the 5th of March. He mentioned hopes in the U-boats, but was evidently skeptical. He did not know how anyone could still believe Goebbels, still proclaiming the impact of V-weapons. He was especially dubious about talk of an aeroplane that they call Germany's bird of fate, something to change the course of the war. If a change was to come, it had to be very soon, he remarked, dryly. He just carried on with his duties. My people understand me, he added. He immersed himself in his work, acting as if everything were as it is written in the newspaper. But he refrained from criticizing Goebbels' speech at the end of February, leaving open the outcome of future developments and whether the Führer and Goebbels might prove right in the end. Perhaps there would, after all, be a change in fortune. The Führer claims it will be so, I'm just a poor fool with no sixth sense, who unfortunately sees nothing, he remarked. 
with scarcely veiled sarcasm. He had not imagined the Americans crossing the Rhine so quickly. But it's not fully out of the question that we could still master this situation, he added, again seeming to doubt his own words. There were still those, he acknowledged, who shared Hitler's confidence in final victory. Plainly, he was not among their number. It was obvious to him that Hitler would not capitulate. He thought it would end with a battle on the Obersalzburg. There were wonderful things in preparation, but they would come too late. Even now, however, there were signs that he had not altogether given up hope. Conflict between the Russians and the Americans would still give Germany a chance. Just as a motor race could be decided by a puncture 100 meters from the finishing line, Away from such reveries, work seemed pointless. He was still going through the motions. Orders by now had in any case little effect. The ostrich policy operated as people buried their heads in the sand. Pollux could entertain his quasi-philosophical reflections well away from the front. Colonel General Gotthard Heinrichi, brought in on the 20th of March by Hitler to replace Himmler, whose command of Army Group Vistula had laid bare his evident incapacity for military leadership, and used his recognized abilities as a defensive strategist to try to hold the front in Pomerania, made his assessments much closer to the action. An archetypal Prussian career officer who had served in the First World War and had long experience of command in the Second, Heinrichi was a strong patriot, but had always kept his distance from the party. Soon after the war, in British captivity, he provided his own explanation for the continued fighting down to the end, however despairing the situation. He praised the fighting spirit, determination, and resolute defense of German troops on the Oder against greatly superior enemy might. He was well aware of the deficiencies in armaments, the lack of fighting experience of around half his troops, and the fact that some of the more experienced soldiers having narrowly survived so many battles, had lost the will to fight to the last as the end approached. None of this overshadowed, however, the overall strategic picture, which, he said, was clear, both to the leadership and to the ordinary soldier. As long as German forces could hold the Rhine, the defense of the Oder did not seem hopeless, and was certainly worth fighting for. Once the enemy was over the Rhine, and pressing on towards the Elba, however, ordinary soldiers inevitably asked themselves whether there was any point to carrying on. What made them do so, he attributed primarily to their sense of patriotic duty to halt the advance of the Russians. It was clear to every soldier what could be expected from the Russians, and it was seen as imperative to protect the civilian population as far as possible from the sort of horror that had occurred east of the Oder. Beyond that, he said, the military leadership believed that it could not undermine any possible bargaining position in negotiations through premature collapse. When hopes that the Oder could be held proved vain and German forces were smashed, disintegration swiftly followed. If the soldier decided to fight on, then this was no longer to halt the enemy but to save his own life, or not to fall into Soviet captivity. Terror, he stated, was no longer sufficient to compel soldiers to fight. Survival alone was now the driving force. After the war, Dunitz argued, attributing much responsibility to the Allied insistence on unconditional surrender, that no one in authority could have signed an instrument of capitulation without knowing full well that its terms would be broken by soldiers in the East refusing to accept orders to stay and enter Soviet captivity, and instead, like the civilian population, choosing to flee westwards. Whatever his self-justificatory motivation in such remarks, which clash with his contemporary demands for a fanatical fight to the last, Donuts did have a point in the implication that the millions still serving on the Eastern Front would have felt betrayed, and might well have taken matters into their own hands in trying to get to the West. Whether this would have been worse for them than what did actually happen is a moot point. In the East especially, a passionate desire for an end of the war, 
detestation of the party, criticism of the regime, and even loss of faith in Hitler, were perfectly compatible with soldiers' continued determination to repel the Russian invader on Reich soil, who posed such a threat to families and homes. And ultimately, as Heinrich points out, when all idealism had vanished and pure desperation took hold, soldiers fought on for self-survival. In the West, the situation was different. Certainly on the Western Front, despite the attempts of propaganda, equivalent anxieties about falling into the hands of the Americans or the British rarely existed beyond the ranks of party functionaries. Once the enemy had reached German soil and then crossed the Rhine, there was, even so, still much determination to repel the invader. Unable to see beyond the immediate battlegrounds, Many soldiers were compelled to believe, beyond what their senses were telling them, that they were still fighting to gain time, for the leadership to fend off the Soviets, seek a worthwhile peace settlement, see the breakup of the enemy coalition. Who knew, exactly? Moreover, units on the Western Front also included many soldiers, whose homes and families were in eastern or central regions of Germany, and who saw fighting on as necessary as long as the British, Americans, and French remained in alliance with the Soviets. Some unquestionably thought the Western Allies would eventually see sense and realize that the real war was against Russia. Germany is saving Europe and England and America from being gobbled up by Bolshevik Russia, claimed officers captured in the West. The British and Americans will one day awaken to the real situation and will join the Germans in holding off Russia. Beyond such motivations were more immediate, unpolitical feelings. The unwillingness, as in most armies, to leave close friends and comrades in the lurch. The sense of comradeship often provided its own motivation for fighting on when idealism was lacking. And ultimately there was the sense that there was nothing to be done about it. There was no potential for mutiny or rising to overthrow the regime. The scale of harsh repression was simply too great. Stepping out of line was little less than suicidal, and when it happened, desertion was usually an individual act, not mass mutiny. It reflected a desperate attempt at personal survival, not a collapse of the military order. Apart from the savagery of reprisals and fears for one's family, the capacity to organize any mutiny was as good as absent in part because the sheer intensity of the fighting and scale of losses at the front left no chance to organize political action, partly, too, because constant losses left too little continuity in the manpower of troop units. There was nothing for it, therefore, but to struggle on. The situation in 1945 contrasted sharply with the revolutionary conditions of 1918. In 1918, we experienced more open revolutionary tendencies, commented one cavalry general in British captivity in March 1945. As the end drew near, the men were already behaving in a very insolent fashion. They didn't do that now. In the last months of the First World War, there had been a gathering collapse of authority in the military command. Perhaps as many as a million soldiers in the final weeks, encouraged by the stirring revolutionary mood at home, among workers and soldiers in home-based garrisons, and aware of peace demands in the Reichstag, voted with their feet against continuing to fight. In 1918, military discipline had been much in line with that of the other belligerent powers. Losses were smaller. German cities had not been reduced to rubble. Civil society was largely intact. Pluralist politics continued to exist. Most crucially, there had been no brutal Russian occupation of eastern Germany and threat to the Reich capital itself, and there had been no western invasion of the Reich. German troops could return home, seemingly undefeated, in the field. There had also been the workers' councils in factories, bodies to give voice to the simmering unrest and to organize mass strikes and protest meetings. There had been no equivalent of the Nazi party ensuring through its ruthless hold over the population that organizational space to engender a popular uprising was totally unavailable. 
At least, there was no equivalent to the terroristic police apparatus of 1945. In 1918, rejection of the Kaiser and Germany's ruling class, extensive within the army and within the population, could be openly expressed and ultimately transformed into revolutionary action. In 1945, detestation of Hitler and the regime, or heated criticism of policies that had produced the misery of a lost war, were sentiments best swallowed. The faintest whiff of insurrectionary sentiment could spell instant, brutal retaliation. Paradoxically, therefore, increasing defeatism among ordinary soldiers not only failed to prompt them to lay down their arms or rise in mutiny against their superior officers, but was compatible with continued readiness to fight on. Exhausted, demoralized troops provided no basis for insurrection. If one sentiment could sum up the myriad views of soldiers, it was probably fatalism, hoping for the best because that was all anyone could do. They saw no alternative but to carry on. Change could only come from above, but there were no indications that it ever would. 4. For the civilian population, the sense of helplessness as the maelstrom gathered force was almost totally embracing. In bomb-ravaged big cities, conditions by March 1945 were intolerable, though the countryside, for all its privations, fared better. The misery was near universal as people simply awaited the end of the war, unable to do anything to hasten it, left to their fate to face the continued bombing and the inroads of the enemy, with all the uncertainty, anxiety, and, in the East, downright fear that entailed. The only hope was that the war would soon end and that the British and Americans would arrive before the Russians. A graphic display of feeling in one Alpine village, said to mirror the true attitude of the people, was the refusal of the soldiers, Folkstrom men and civilians assembled for Heroes Memorial Day on the 11th of March, to return the Sieg Heil to the Führer at the end of the Wehrmacht commander's speech. The SD summed up attitudes at the beginning of March. No one wanted to lose the war, but no one believed Germany could now win it. The leadership was to blame. Confidence in it had collapsed like an avalanche in recent days. There was much criticism of the party, certain leaders, and propaganda. The Führer was still the last hope of millions, a necessary ritualistic concession in such reports, but was more vehemently, by the day, included in the question of confidence and the criticism. Finally, the feeling that fighting on was pointless was, by now, eating at the readiness to continue, at self-belief, and at belief in other people. Shortage of food was becoming a big issue in the cities, Owing to lack of transport, acute shortages, exacerbated by hoarding, especially by military personnel, had existed in Rhineland cities before the Allies arrived. Hunger, terror from the air, and the military situation determined the popular mood, according to a report from Stuttgart in late March. A large section of the population is already completely at an end as regards bread, fats, and foodstuffs. There were serious worries about food supplies in Berlin, too, as rations were reduced again. Many claimed they already had nothing to eat, though painted and powdered ladies wearing expensive furs and afternoon dresses were said still to frequent the few remaining restaurants. Anxieties were said to be mounting over likely future acute shortages. The Allies, it is true, had reported adequate supplies of food hidden away, some of it allegedly looted from the homes of neighbors who had evacuated when they marched through the Rhineland. But even in the country, where farmers especially always seemed to have sufficient in store, the diminishing rations were making themselves felt. Just enough if you can sleep the whole day, bemoaned one worker in South Germany, where there was much bad blood over shortages of potatoes and other foodstuffs. Many individuals tried to pretend that they had lost their ration cards, as applications for substitute cards soared 
after the drop in rations was announced. Directives from Bormann, perhaps emanating from Hitler himself, instructing the Gauleiter to coordinate measures to make more use of wild vegetables, fruits, berries, mushrooms, and herbs, to mitigate food ration reductions, and wild medicinal herbs to compensate for a shortage of medicines, were unlikely to have been warmly welcomed. Cuts in electricity and gas supplies and severe coal shortages were commonplace in big cities. Drains were often blocked by bomb damage. Water could, in some places, be had only from standpipes in the street. People in some rural areas had to resort to cooking on stoves fired with peat. Schools and universities had mainly closed by now. Some schools were requisitioned as field hospitals for the wounded. Floods of refugees placed a massive additional burden on housing and other public services. Welfare work was made more difficult by the lack of unified control, resulting, typical for the Third Reich, in conflicting demands from different agencies. Hospitals could not cope with the high numbers of casualties from air raids. In early March, Bormann ordered the incorporation of the personnel of hospitals and clinics into the Volkstrom. There was huge disruption of the railways. If a journey had to be undertaken, and even if a place on a train could be found, delays of many hours were to be expected. People coped as best they could under the extremely difficult circumstances, but the cuts in public services had complicating side effects. Electricity cuts meant, for instance, that shops were shutting early, when it became too dark for business, leaving no possibility for those in work to buy food in the early evening hours. And once the electricity was restored in mid-morning, there was often an air raid alarm so that people had no time to eat. A source of particular concern to the millions of families desperate for news of sons, brothers, fathers, or other close relatives at the front was that postal services were in a state of near collapse. By late March, post offices had often been put out of action by bombing. Telephone, telegraph, and rail communications had largely broken down for ordinary citizens, and often too for public authorities and businesses. The Reich Post Minister, Wilhelm Onesorga, laid down stipulations for ensuring a minimum postal service. If trains were unable, motor vehicles had to be used to shuttle post to the nearest functioning railway station. If no vehicles were available, local transport had to be requisitioned. In the last resort, the most urgent post was to be carried by bicycle or on foot in rucksacks. There was, it is true, still a veneer of what passed for normality in the diminishing parts of Germany, not under occupation or sucked into the fighting zones, though anything resembling civic society had long since vanished. One of the few places bomb-threatened people of big cities found any semblance of communal activity in these weeks was in the air raid shelter. Work itself, however hard, tedious, and long, must have been for many a distraction from the heavy worries and burdens of daily life. And wages and salaries continued to be paid as Germany collapsed. Newspapers still appeared, though by March there were only 814 of them, compared to 2,075 daily papers in 1937, and they were only two to four pages in length. Periodicals had been cut back still further because of the shortage of paper and other difficulties. Only 458 out of 4,789 in pre-war times were still in circulation. Radio remained the most important means of communication, though power cuts meant big interruptions in programs, not just for propaganda but also for entertainment programs. The main transmitters in big cities continued to function to the end. Not least, the radio was crucial for giving warnings of approaching bombers, while receivers in air raid shelters passed on party directives following raids. Despite stiff penalties, many continued surreptitiously to listen to enemy broadcasts, especially the BBC. People could still find escapism in the cinema. Entertainment films provided a temporary release from the horrors and misery of reality. They were more attractive than the fight-on propaganda conveyed through films like Kohlberg, 
which can only have reminded people of what was actually happening in the town at the time, or newsreels that could only show Germany's desperate plight. However, bombing of cinema buildings, blackouts, and air raid alarms had taken their toll on attendance. And for those who did go to the cinema, leaving the building was to re-enter a reality beyond the imagination of any film producer. Outside the most war-ravaged zones and the worst bombed areas of the big cities, a still-functioning, if hugely creaking, bureaucracy and the far-reaching tentacles of party control ensured that skeletal and emergency administration, accompanied by much hand-to-mouth improvisation, continued in some measure to operate. Routine administration carried on, even with much reduced personnel through recruitment to the Wehrmacht. Forms, more of them than ever, had to be completed. Reports filed, the myriad tasks of minor bureaucracy, which civil servants down the ranks had always done, still undertaken. The usual local health and social welfare, finance and economic issues, even building planning, continued amid the mayhem, however unreal it often seemed. And local police stations were still sending in their reports on maintenance of order down to the end. Much of the work of local and regional authorities was, however, inevitably preoccupied with finding housing for those bombed out of their homes, trying to cope with the influx of refugees, organizing food rations and distribution of increasingly stretched provisions, regulating air raid measures and the deployment of the hard-pressed fire service, many of whom were volunteers, taken out of their normal work for fire brigade duties. Few of the lower-ranking civil servants were by now, if they ever had been, inspired by gung-ho Nazi propaganda and sloganeering about fighting to the last ditch. But hardly any would have contemplated doing anything other than what they saw as their duty to ensure that they carried out their work as conscientiously and efficiently as possible. They were merely small cogs in a big machine. But they did their best, even at this late stage, to ensure that the machine continued to function as well as possible. In any case, much of their work had been usurped by party functionaries. Here, the level of political commitment was still far greater and where it was flagging, a sense of self-protection against possibly costly reproaches from higher party offices could produce its own activism. Local and district leaders, down to block leaders, based in tenement blocks, would do all they could to carry out the directions of the Gauleiter in all matters of civil defense, organizing anti-aircraft batteries, the running of air raid bunkers, clearing up after air raids, and through NSV, providing whatever social welfare was possible. But all this frenetic activism was coupled with still unceasing attempts to mobilize the population and instill in them the need to fight on. However ineffective the actions of the local party functionaries were in practice, and whatever antipathies they now encountered as the end approached, they still served as a crucial control mechanism on the population. Even the NSV, the huge party welfare organization, which had employed more than 60,000 people full-time, mainly women, in mid-1944, was, in essence, still a vehicle for political control, whatever work it did, in addition to, and often in competition with, state-run welfare, to help the victims of bombing raids, provide for wounded soldiers, organize evacuations, or take care of refugees. The party's organizational structures, still incorporating if affiliates are included, huge numbers of citizens, mobilizing young Germans as flak helpers in anti-aircraft defense, and half a million women for service as Wehrmacht assistants, then some of these even for fighting, ensured that the overwhelming majority of citizens remained compliant, even as the regime crumbled. Few were prepared to risk stepping out of line. Political dissidents could prove lethal for any individual, and as regarded by most people as not just foolhardy, but unnecessary as the end loomed. At higher levels of state administration, the erosion had intensified. Following the heavy bombing of the government district of Berlin in early February, especially, the work of major state ministries was heavily impaired. New addresses were circulated almost weekly, 
as improvised accommodation had to be found for the ministerial staff. The finance minister, Schweren von Krosig, for example, had to move his office to his home in the suburb of Dahlem. Parts of ministries were now increasingly evacuated from the Reich capital. It was seen by many as rats leaving the sinking ship. Coordination of work was ever more difficult. Written communication between ministerial offices could often only be achieved now through a courier service. And much of the work was merely trying to reconstitute files destroyed in bombing raids. Central government administration increasingly resembled rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. Practically all matters of substance outside the military sphere had anyway been taken over by the party. The Gauleiter remained the key figures in the provinces still not occupied, bulwarks of loyalty to Hitler and diehards without a future, who, in varying degrees according to ability, temperament, and attitude, represented the radical drive of the party to mobilize all forces for the last stand, even when any semblance of rationality told them that all was lost. Gauleiter Wilhelm Mür of Württemberg, for instance, party boss in the region since 1928, was determined, in the face of the evident longing of the people of the area for peace, that there would be no surrender in his domain. He threatened instant execution for anyone showing a white flag or obstructing German defenses. Karl Wall, the Gauleiter of Swabia, centered on the city of Augsburg in the west of Bavaria, had also run his province without interruption since 1928. He counted as one of the less extreme of the Gauleiter, an image he was keen to burnish after the war, and as a result did not stand high in the esteem of Hitler and Bormann. In mid-March, however, after the debacle at Remagen, Wall recommended to Bormann the use of suicide pilots to fly their planes loaded with bombs into the Americans' temporary supply bridges over the Rhine. A new heroism, not known in history, was needed, he claimed. There are surely sufficient loyal followers of the Fuhrer, who would be prepared to sacrifice themselves if they could save the people through their deed. Is it not better that a few dozen choose to die than that, by not undertaking this essential emergency measure, tens of thousands must lose their lives? Nothing came of the idea. Perhaps Vol proposed it cynically, reckoning with its rejection, but believing it would uphold his credentials as a fanatical backer of the Fuhrer's cause. Even so, the proposal illustrates the stance that Germany's ruling cohorts felt they had to display in the last weeks of the war. It was rapidly coming to be the rule of the desperados. By the end of March, Vol was promoting in his region the creation by Goebbels and Labour Front leader Robert Lai of partisan organizations to engage in terroristic, guerrilla activity to hinder the enemy advance and at the same time to combat and deter defeatism, the so-called Wehrwolf and Freikorps Adolf Hitler. The idea of a partisan-style movement had been first mooted in 1943, and it took preliminary organizational shape under the aegis of the SS in the autumn of the following year, when the name Wehrwolf, or Werewolf, resonating in German tradition with connotations of ferocious defiance as well as shadowy lupine terror, was attached to it. Some guerrilla activity was carried out on the Eastern Front and to a lesser extent in the West in the winter months of 1944-45, though it could inflict no more than pinpricks on the advancing enemy. Its most notable activities were terroristic in nature. A number of American-appointed mayors in the newly occupied parts of western Germany were assassinated, for instance, most notably the mayor of Aachen, Franz Oppenhoff, in March 1945. Once the Western Front had crumbled and the Allies were pressing deep into Germany, underground resistance movements began to gain more importance in Nazi thinking, particularly when the party leadership started to show interest in them. Martin Bormann saw their potential for tackling defeatism and possible insurgency within the Reich itself. But Werwolf took shape, however dimly, in public consciousness only when Goebbels turned it into a propaganda enterprise, muscling in on the territory, both of the party chancellery and of the SS, though with Hitler's backing. 
On the 1st of April, Verwolf Radio began broadcasting its tirades against the Allies. Exultant news of real or imaginary acts of sabotage, and dark threats against defeatists and traitors in the homeland. Just before this, Lai, one of the zanier zealots in the last phase, had approached Hitler with the notion of creating an organization similar to that of the Werwolf, aimed at mobilizing young fanatical activists equipped with little more than bicycles and bazookas to shoot down approaching enemy tanks. Hitler agreed to the establishment of a Freikorps, bearing his own name. Goebbels' only objection was that it was under the leadership of a man he regarded as little more than a clown. He himself expected much of the partisan activity, chiefly to hunt down every German traitor on the side of the Western enemy, though he prided himself that the Werwolf had caused horror in the enemy camp and aroused fears of a partisan Germany that would cause unrest in Europe for years. This was an overestimation of Allied fears, though the Allies certainly took seriously the prospect of having to combat guerrilla warfare as they fought their way through Germany, and of the likelihood of a national redoubt in the Alps, where the Nazis would continue to hold out. It also grossly overrated the appetite for partisan activity among the exhausted German people. Overall, the Werwolf and Freikorps Adolf Hitler added up to little. Their victims, an estimated three to five thousand killed, including continued post-war activity, were not insignificant in number. But for the Allies, they were, beyond the worries they initially aroused, no more than a minor irritant. And among the German population, they had little support, though there was undoubtedly some appeal to fanaticized Hitler youth members. Their main capacity was to terrorize, and this they did to the very last days of the war, when they were still engaged in sporadic and horrific murders of those wanting to avoid, rather than promote, pointless destruction as the Allies marched in. Ultimately, the partisan organizations of these weeks represented the regime's lasting and massive capability for destructiveness. But just as great in these weeks was its capacity for self-destructiveness. 5. The deepening fissures in the foundations were now starting to show, too, among the regime leadership. One sign was the increasing desperation with which, even at this late hour, efforts were made to prompt a search for a political solution to the end of the war. As war fortunes had plummeted, leading Nazis, among them Goebbels, Ribbentrop, Goering, and even Himmler, had pondered seeking a negotiated exit route from the path leading inexorably towards Germany's doom. But whenever tentative suggestions had been made for exploring an opening, whether with the Western powers or even with the archenemy, Bolshevik Russia, Hitler had been dismissive. He persisted with his dogmatic stance that negotiations were carried out from a position of strength, so could only follow a major German military success. The Ardenne Offensive had been a last attempt to acquire such a bargaining position. Since then, the calamitous cave-in on the Eastern Front, followed by the disastrous collapse in the West as the Allies pushed over the Rhine and the Mosul, meant that hopes of acquiring any sort of worthwhile negotiating position became more illusory by the day. Even at the beginning of March, Hitler purported to believe, or at least held to the fiction, that the Rhine could be held, the Soviets pushed back, and some sort of deal then done with Stalin. He was shrewd enough to know how unrealistic this was, even before the Rhine was crossed. Any negotiated end would, in any case, have inevitably meant Hitler's own end, as he well knew. Negotiations would now more than ever have amounted to capitulation. This would have ruptured everything that had driven his political career. That there would be no repeat of the shameful capitulation of 1918. Hitler retained at the core an extraordinary inner consistency, a dogmatic inflexibility that had terrible consequences for his country. Refusal to contemplate negotiations was for him both logically consistent and easy, since his own life was forfeit anyway, whether Germany capitulated or fought on. 
It was not that he worked out a choreograph of downfall. It was quite simply that there was no way out. With the war lost, as even he, inwardly, by now recognized, there could be no possible alternative in his mind to fighting on to the last. Going down in glory was, for him, wedded to the heroic myths of the Germanic past, inconceivably greater than the coward's way out of surrender, and negotiations from weakness amounted to the same thing. The heroism would set an example for later generations, as he emphasized to Goebbels. To his soldiers, he underlined once again on Heroes Memorial Day in mid-March, the year 1918 will not repeat itself. Of the top-ranking Nazi leadership below Hitler, only Goebbels, still the worshipping acolyte, was prepared to follow the same line to its logical conclusion. He had, at numerous points, wanted to negotiate. But after the Allies crossed the Rhine, he was clear-sighted enough to see that Germany's last hope of a political settlement had collapsed. His decision, as he told Hitler in early March, that he, his wife Magda, and their six children would stay in Berlin, come what may, was consistent with his view that fighting on with honor was all that was left. He was scornful when he heard, early in March, that Ribbentrop, whom he utterly despised, a sentiment that unified the otherwise scarcely harmonious Nazi leadership, was making overtures to the Western powers. He was then irritated when these led to exaggerated stories in the Western press, but full of derision when the abortive escapade predictably came to nothing. At least it was plain, he remarked, that hopes of an internal revolution in Germany against National Socialism or the person of the Führer are illusory. Even now, however, Ribbentrop had not wholly given up. In mid-March, immediately following this failed attempt, he summoned Dr. Werner Dankwort, deputy ambassador in Stockholm, to fly back to Berlin. He told an incredulous Dankwort that it was now a matter of gaining time to unleash the new weapons, long in preparation but now almost ready, which would restore the initiative to Germany, turn around the fortunes of war and fend off the threat to the country's existence. Germany has won the war if it does not lose it, he said, with his own brand of reasoning. The Western Allies had rejected every attempt he had made to help prevent the westwards advance of Bolshevism. Other ways had to be tried. Dunkfort was left to ponder these thoughts over the following days, when he was summoned twice more to Ribbentrop's presence. On his third visit, Ribbentrop, in some excitement, informed him that the redoubtable Soviet emissary in Stockholm, Mademoiselle Alexandra Mikhailovna Kolontai, was leaving for Moscow and not expected to return. He wanted Dunkfort to find a suitable intermediary to propose a message for her to take to Moscow that the Western Allies would, once the war was over, use their military superiority to remove from the Soviet Union territory it had conquered during the war, and that Germany alone would be in a position to guarantee a large portion of the lands would stay in Soviet hands. It was an unlikely proposition. In any case, as Ribbentrop told Dunkfort, he had first to obtain the Fuhrer's approval. The foreign minister promptly rang Hitler's bunker to be told that the Führer was in a briefing which would last until midnight. An air raid alarm disturbed the wait, allowing Dankfurt to experience the dismal mood below zero as the foreign minister's staff descended into the cellars. Ribbentrop himself disappeared into his private air raid shelter. It was after midnight when the all-clear sounded, and back in Ribbentrop's office the call from Hitler finally came through. It was a short conversation. Dongfort heard Ribbentrop say in a resigned tone, Thank you. Good night. The foreign minister turned to Dongfort. The Fuhrer let me know that he regards every attempt as pointless. We must fight to the last moment. Dongfort could scarcely believe the pointlessness of his arduous journey to the Reich capital. He took the first plane he could back to Stockholm heartily relieved to escape from the Berlin madhouse. Himmler had by now for some time been secretly looking to a possible future after Hitler, 
while continuing to show himself to be the most loyal of the Führer's paladins. SS Brigadefuhrer Walter Schellenberg, head of the Foreign Intelligence Service in the Reich Security Head Office, had persuaded Himmler in mid-February to meet Count Fulke Bernadotte, a member of the Swedish royal family and vice president of the Swedish Red Cross. Bernadotte was in Berlin to explore possibilities of negotiating the release of prisoners, especially those from Scandinavia, from concentration camps. From Himmler's point of view, it was a chance to show himself in a good light, conciliatory, an honest broker, and to look to a possible opening to the West. The Swedish connection was taken further in March through the intermediacy of Himmler's masseur, Felix Kirsten, who had moved to Sweden, though he retained property in Germany. The fact that the end of the war was evidently approaching, that Hitler as adamantly as ever excluded all possible exit routes other than going down in flames, and that Himmler had no intention of joining him in the self-immolation, made the Reichsfuhrer open to the potential that Bernadotte and his foreign connections might offer. When Goebbels visited him in hospital in Hohenlichen at the beginning of March, where the Reichsfuhrer was suffering from an angina attack, Himmler accepted that the morale of the troops had slumped and that the war could not be militarily won, but he thought from instinct that a political possibility would open up sooner or later. By the middle of March, he was all the more ready to contemplate alternatives, after enduring an almighty dressing down from Hitler over his failings as commander-in-chief of Army Group Vistula. Hitler had apparently already, in February, rebuked Himmler as a defeatist. In his command of the defense of Pomerania, Himmler had actually been too weak to countermand tactical interference from Hitler, which he knew to be catastrophic as well as demonstrating that he had no knowledge of how to handle an army. Hitler, in his characteristic search for scapegoats, held Himmler personally responsible for the inability to hold the Red Army in Pomerania, reproaching him with secret sabotage and direct disobedience. The Reichsfuhrer was relieved of his command on the 20th of March. The retreat, against orders, of Sepp Dietrich's 6th SS Panzer Army in Hungary, resulting in Hitler's furious demand that Himmler remove the insignia of the Leibstandarte Adolf Hitler, was a further humiliation for the Reichsfuhrer. Guderian claimed to have tried on the 21st of March, just prior to his own dismissal, to persuade Himmler to use his foreign connections to try to secure an armistice. Himmler refused, point-blank. He could still not risk an open breach with Hitler. Himmler had the reputation of being the most feared man in Germany, but he himself knew that was not true. He was fully aware that he remained completely dependent on a higher power. He feared Hitler even at this stage, and with justification. But a serious estrangement had now clouded their relations. Himmler was practically in disgrace. His resentment must have encouraged him to take further his soundings with Bernadotte. Against Hitler's wishes, he agreed to allow concentration camps to be handed over to the enemy, a promise he did not keep, and permitted small numbers of Jews and thousands of Scandinavian prisoners to be released. There was still no direct suggestion from Himmler that he might be involved in negotiations with the West. But by the beginning of April, Schellenberg, doubtless at Himmler's prompting, was sounding out Bernadotte about the possibility of arranging a capitulation on the Western Front. Bernadotte refused, saying that the initiative had to come from Himmler. At this juncture, it was still not forthcoming, but Bernadotte recalled Schellenberg telling him that Himmler had talked of a capitulation in the West and, but for Hitler, would not have hesitated to ask him to approach the Allied Supreme Commander, General Eisenhower. It would not be long before Himmler made his move. In the meantime, one of Himmler's former closest associates, SS Obergruppenführer Karl Wolf, head of his personal staff until being transferred in September 1943 to Italy as Supreme SS and police leader there, then from July 1944 to plenipotentiary general of the German Wehrmacht, effectively German military governor in the occupied parts of the country, had already edged towards capitulation south of the Alps. 
Through intermediaries, Wolf had in February secured a link to the American Secret Service, the OSS, and arranged a clandestine meeting in Zurich on the 8th of March with its head of European operations, Alan W. Dulles. Another meeting followed on the 19th of March, when Wolf undertook to arrange for the unconditional surrender of German forces in Italy. Various interests pushed in the same direction. Wolf plainly had an eye on saving his skin through gaining immunity from prosecution for war crimes. The Wehrmacht leadership in Italy, certainly once Kesselring, who would not commit himself to Wolf's move, had been replaced on the 10th of March by the more sympathetic, if still highly cautious, Fiedinghoff, was favorably disposed to steps towards ending a conflict that could now be continued only at huge and senseless cost. The Allies saw obvious gain in liquidating the front south of the Alps, where the two main armies of Army Group C, around 200,000 men, were still fighting a tenacious rear-guard battle and eliminating the danger of continued resistance centered on the feared Alpine Redoubt. Even Hitler, who seems to have had a vague indication of Wolff's intentions, though not his detailed plans, which amounted to treason, was prepared to let him proceed, at least for the time being. He had been non-committal, taken by Wolf to be a tacit sign of approval, when the latter had, in early February, in Ribbentrop's presence, carefully hinted at negotiations through his own contacts to win time for Germany to develop its secret weapons and to drive a wedge through the Allied coalition. The use of Italy as a possible bargaining pawn in dealings with the Western powers meant that there was no attempt made from Berlin to halt Wolf's maneuvering. Nor was Wolf, in fact, the only leading Nazi trying to secure a deal with the Allies in Italy. None other than the feared head of the security police, Ernst Kaltenbrunner, was at the same time taking his own secret soundings about a separate settlement with the Western Allies. Nothing conclusive had materialized from either Wolf's or Kaltenbrunner's feelers by the end of March. Still, it was the case by now that the head of the SS, the head of the security police, and the SS leader in Italy, were all, independent of each other, pursuing ways to avoid the Armageddon that Hitler was inviting. Mutual distrust and fear of Hitler ruled out any collaboration in either bypassing or confronting him. Nevertheless, the leadership of the Third Reich was starting to crumble. The most enigmatic member of Hitler's court was also beginning to distance himself from Hitler. Over the previous months, Albert Speer had consistently tried to prevent the complete destruction of German industrial plant as the Wehrmacht retreated. This had an obvious rationale for the war economy. It meant production could continue as long as possible, and possibly be restored if lost territory were to be recaptured. But by the spring of 1945, other motives were taking over. Speer's close connections with industrialists inevitably led him to look to a world beyond Hitler, where it would be necessary to rebuild their factories. He recognized that even after a lost war, the country would require an economic infrastructure. The German people would survive their dictator and need a functioning economy to support them. Not least, and increasingly, considerations of his own future after likely defeat, perhaps hoping to inherit what was left of power in the Reich, made him insistent on temporary immobilization of industry, not its wanton destruction. Hitler's thinking ran, as it always had done, along diametrically opposed lines. In his characteristic fashion of posing only stark alternatives, he had early in his career declared that Germany would be victorious, or it would cease to exist. The more any semblance of victory had evaporated, the more his thoughts had turned to the opposite pole. Defeat would be total. The German people would have deserved to go under through proving too weak, and there was therefore no need to make provision for the future. Destruction, wherever and whatever the cost, to bar the enemy advance and its inroads into Germany, was what he wanted. Speer had often had to struggle to water down the orders for destruction of industrial plant, which the high command of the Wehrmacht had been ready to pass on, to turn them merely into immobilization. Usually, as we have seen in earlier chapters, he had succeeded, 
pandering to Hitler's lingering hopes, and persuading the dictator to accede to his wishes by arguing that the Reich would need the industries again when it reconquered the lost territory. It was an argument, however contrived, to which Hitler was susceptible. But with the enemy now on Reich territory, and the fiction of reconquest harder to uphold, the issue of destruction or immobilization was bound to arise again, and in radical fashion. At the beginning of March, the deliberate destruction of the transport infrastructure by the military was causing great concern to rural industrialists. Speer, who had meanwhile secured control over transport to add to his other extensive powers, traveled west to reassure them that temporary paralysis, not permanent destruction, of industry and transport infrastructure remain the policy. Any opposition to the orders to this effect had to be broken. He repeated his key argument. We can only continue the war if the Silesian Industrial Belt, for example, or also parts of the Ruhr district are again in our hands. Either these areas are brought back, or we have definitely lost the war. A unified approach was essential. It was pointless to paralyze industry only to find that the military were destroying all means of transport. He would speak to the commanders-in-chief of the army groups and try to obtain a directive from Hitler. He went on to underline the duty to ensure the repair of water supplies and provide food for the civilian population. After food, coal was the most urgent area of production. Alongside troop transports, food supplies would have priority, even over armaments, a point he said he had cleared with Hitler. These measures were not put forward on humanitarian grounds, but to retain the strength of resistance of the population. The war, Speer's remarks made plain, was far from over. He spoke further of concentrating steel production on munitions, and he repeated the priorities for transport which Hitler had decided, on his suggestion, for areas being evacuated. Troop transports first, then foodstuffs, and finally, where possible, refugees. Hitler was still insisting on the evacuation of the population from the threatened western areas back into the Reich so that men capable of fighting should not be lost to the enemy. The Gauleiter of such areas knew how impractical this demand was. Goebbels saw it as another heavy loss of prestige for Hitler's authority. Even Goebbels accepted that evacuation was not possible, influenced by a report Speer had given him in the middle of the month. Speer, he commented, had expressed irritation at the evacuation orders. He had taken the view that it is not the task of our war policy to lead a people to an heroic downfall. The armaments minister told Goebbels that the war was, in economic terms, lost. The economy could hold out for only another four weeks, implying until about mid-April, and would then gradually collapse. Speer, noted Goebbels, strongly opposes the position of destroyed earth. He explains that if the artery of life through food and in the economy should be cut off to the German people, that must be the enemy's job, not ours. If Berlin's bridges and viaducts were to be detonated as planned, the Reich capital would face imminent starvation. A conflict was plainly brewing. Speer had learnt that Hitler intended the destruction of factories, railways, bridges, electricity and water installations, rather than allow them to fall into enemy hands. He approached Guderian, seeking his help to prevent the madness of measures which would destroy the crucial economic infrastructure and ensure lasting misery and poverty for the civilian population. He and Guderian agreed that the detonation of bridges, tunnels and railway installations required special permission. A furious Hitler refused to implement the draft decree. On the 15th of March, Speer gave an unvarnished picture of realities. The collapse of the economy was no more than four to eight weeks away, after which the war could not be continued militarily. A firm order was needed to prevent the destruction of vital installations in Germany. Their destruction means the elimination of every further possibility of existence for the German people. Speer concluded, We have the duty to leave the people all possibilities that could secure them reconstruction 
in the more distant future. Speer passed the memorandum to Niklaus von Bello, Hitler's Luftwaffe adjutant, and asked him to deliver it at a suitable moment. Bello eventually did so on the 18th of March, though the dictator already knew what was coming. In an attempt to lessen the anticipated hefty reaction and demonstrate his continued loyalty, Speer asked for a signed photograph of Hitler for his 40th birthday next day. He also gave Hitler another memorandum, one which he never mentioned after the war. It was a shorter document and couched in a wholly different tone. It began by stating that, since economic collapse was unavoidable, drastic measures were needed to defend the Reich at the Oder and the Rhine. Defense beyond these borders was no longer possible. So for the coming eight weeks it was crucial to take every ruthless measure needed to mobilize all possible resources, including the Volkssturm, for the defenses along these two rivers. Forces currently in Norway and Italy should be transferred to serve in this defense. Only such measures had a chance of securing the front. He concluded, Holding out tenaciously on the current front for a few weeks can gain respect from the enemy, and perhaps thus favorably determine the end of the war. Speer's motive in producing this second memorandum was unclear. Possibly, he hoped it would soften the blow of the first, though he never subsequently claimed this. His silence about the second memorandum is telling, since its wording ill-fitted his cultivated post-war image of being the one Nazi leader to have tried to act humanely and broken with Hitler before the end. Perhaps more likely it was written to try to head off any charges, dangerous in the climate, by Hitler or those in his entourage, that he was a defeatist and practically a traitor to the cause. Maybe, since the current front on the Rhine was on the verge of being lost, it was an obliquely clever way of encouraging Hitler to draw the conclusion that now was the time to end the war. If so, it is odd that Speer never made this point in any of his post-war statements. The final possibility is that Speer actually believed what he was saying, that a last-ditch effort could still wring some sort of deal from presumably the Western allies. He later sought to portray himself as one whose early recognition of Germany's inevitable defeat made him selflessly work for the preservation of the economic basis needed for the people's survival. But the memorandum of the 18th of March shows how late he was in accepting that the war was irredeemably lost. His efforts to restrict the destruction of the economic infrastructure and acceptance that, economically, Germany was close to the end, were still compatible with an assumption that the war could not be won, but was not yet totally lost. Up to this point, Speer told Hitler only a few days later, he had still believed in a good end to the war. It was not rhetoric. As the memorandum shows, until then Speer had remained a believer of sorts. The continued destruction that fighting on would inevitably entail might have been reconciled by Speer with his attempts otherwise to restrict demolition of the economic infrastructure on the grounds that this was collateral damage rather than willful self-destruction. At the very least, with this memorandum, Speer was showing Hitler that he still stood by him. The conflict with Hitler over destruction of the means of production was a serious one but it did not amount to a fundamental rejection of the leader to whom he had been so closely bound for more than a decade. Hitler wasted no time in providing his answer to Speer. Already on the 18th of March, he overrode all objections in ordering the compulsory evacuation of the entire civilian population of the threatened western areas. If transport was not available, people should leave on foot. We can no longer take regard of the population, he commented. Next day came Hitler's notorious scorched earth decree, his Nero order, completely upturning Speer's recommendations to spare destruction wherever possible. All military transport, communications, industrial and supplies installations, as well as material assets within Reich territory, which the enemy can render usable immediately or within the foreseeable future, are to be destroyed. 
Responsibility for the implementation of the destruction was placed in the hands of the military command as regards transport and communications, and the Gauleiter as defense commissars in the case of industry and other economic installations. Down to the 18th of March, Speer, for all his criticism of measures guaranteed to destroy any basis of post-war reconstruction, had, as his memorandum of that day shows, still believed that there was something to be gained from continuing the war. But on that day, then confirmed by the Scorched Earth Decree, his attitude dramatically changed. The breaking point came when Hitler told him, point-blank, if the war is lost, then the people, too, is lost. This fate is irreversible. It was not necessary, therefore, to provide even for their most primitive future existence. On the contrary, it was better to destroy even this basis, because the people had shown itself to be the weaker, and the future belongs exclusively to the stronger people of the East. What will remain after this struggle will be in any case only the inferior ones, since the good ones have fallen. At these words, Speer told Hitler in a handwritten letter he delivered to the dictator some days later, he was deeply shocked. He saw the first steps to fulfilling these intentions in the destruction order of the following day. During the days that followed, backed by Walter Roland and his colleagues in the Ruhr staff of his ministry, Speer traveled through western Germany trying, partly by using Nazi arguments, that the installations were necessary to sustain production for winning the war, to overcome the initial readiness of the Gauleiter to implement Hitler's order. How easy it would have been in practice for them to carry out the destruction might actually be doubted. It seems likely that industrialists and factory bosses would have cooperated with party functionaries to block many attempts at senseless destruction. Speer also persuaded them that Hitler's evacuation orders were impracticable. Modell, too, after some hesitation, came round to accepting Speer's arguments and agreed to keep destruction of industrial plant in the Ruhr to a minimum, though the military, as implementation orders show, would have been prepared to carry out the destruction. In Würzburg, Gauleiter Otto Helmut, generally seen as one of the more moderate party bosses, was all set to go ahead with implementing the Nero order. It would indeed be pointless, though, he admitted, if there were no chance of a change in the situation at the last minute. He asked Speer when the decisive miracle weapons were going to be deployed. Only when Speer told him bluntly, they're not coming, did he agree not to destroy the Schweinfurt ball-bearing factories. Hitler had, however, meanwhile learnt of Speer's efforts to sabotage his order. When the armaments minister, on his return to Berlin, was summoned to meet him, he met a frosty reception. Hitler demanded that he accept that the war could still be won. When Speer demurred, Hitler allowed him twenty-four hours to consider his answer. On his return, after composing a lengthy handwritten justification of his position, which in the event he did not hand over, Speer said merely, My Fuhrer, I am unconditionally behind you. That sufficed. Hitler felt his authority intact. There had been no loss of face. Speer had backed down. A brief glimpse of the old warmth between the two returned. Speer exploited the situation to obtain from Hitler the crucial concession and vital qualification of his earlier order that the implementation of any destruction lay in the hands of his armaments minister. With that, Speer was able to prevent the scorched earth that Hitler had ordered, though the Wehrmacht nevertheless blew up numerous bridges within Germany as it retreated. It was an important victory, even if it might cynically be interpreted as aimed as much at securing Speer's own future existence as that of the German people. And on top of Hitler's inability to insist that his evacuation orders were carried out, it was a further sign, as Goebbels recognized, that Hitler's authority was waning. This was nevertheless not the point of collapse. The foundations were shaking, but they still, just about, held together. Decisive in that, as ever, 
was the leadership position of Hitler himself. Though the leaders of the Third Reich plainly saw Hitler's days as numbered, they still knew that they openly crossed him at their peril. Ribbentrop dared not take his peace feelers further without Hitler's imprimatur. Himmler and Kaltenbrunner were extremely careful to hide their own soundings. Wolf, too, knew what dangerous ground he was treading, though at least he had some geographical distance between him and Berlin. And Speer had ultimately retreated from complete confrontation. He had avoided the possibility of the severe sanctions that might then have arisen, even if he now saw Hitler's favor in armaments matters turn from him to his long-standing rival, Karl Otto Zauer. In no case had any of the paladins looking to their own positions in a post-Hitler future openly challenged the dictator. Apart from fear of the consequences, since Hitler could still call upon powerful military and police forces to back him, each of them still acknowledged that his own powers still rested on the higher authority of the Fuhrer. Divided among themselves, fearful of the consequences, and still beholden to Hitler, they posed no threat of a fronde. Hitler's power was set to go on, to the end. Chapter 8 Implosion We're issuing orders in Berlin that practically don't even arrive, let alone can be carried out. I see in this the danger of an extraordinary diminution of authority. Josef Goebbels, Diary Entry the 28th of March, 1945. 1. Berlin in April 1945 was a city bracing itself for the storm about to blow. All possible preparations were being hastily made to try to counter the coming onslaught from the east. Everyone knew that it could not be long before the city was engulfed in the fighting. The mood had reached rock bottom. Only the occasional expression of Gallo's humor punctuated the fatalistic acceptance that there was no way out. But as the seemingly interminable dark days of those truly terrible winter months of 1944-45 gradually gave way to a sunny and warm spring, some Berliners tried their best to shut out the war for a few fleeting moments. For anyone passing through the Tiergarten, the beautiful park in the center of the city, if now horribly damaged, occupied by heavy artillery and serving as a source of much-needed firewood. Beneath trees coming into bloom and accompanied by the chirping of birds, or looking out from the balconies of spacious villas in the Grunewald on the western outskirts of Berlin, the war could seem far away, though the ruins of some villas could provide a swift reminder. But fleetingly pleasant activities, unremarkable strands of peacetime everyday life, were, in early April 1944, no more than an attempt to seize the day, to grasp what might be one of the last chances of enjoyment before grim reality overtook them. Others sought to seize the night, as women and soldiers in districts of central Berlin frantically engaged in a hectic search for pleasure in shelters, basements of buildings reduced to rubble, and dark pathways through the ruins. Looting and thieving were commonplace. Despite the harsh penalties, a black market flourished in food and almost any material goods to be found. Resort to any form of alcohol, including stolen medical supplies, served for many to blot out fears of what was in store. Whatever illusions people still briefly entertained swiftly passed, and in any case, only a few were in a position to share them. Most were too worn down by cares and worries, trying to cope with the severe privations of daily existence. For the city, like every other big city in the country, was in physical appearance and the psychological disposition of its inhabitants deeply scarred by the war. The main feature of Berlin's outward appearance was, in fact, not just the devastated city center. The desolate facades, the bomb craters, the ruined buildings that were no more than empty shells, but its emptiness, the lack of traffic and people on the streets, the shops bereft of goods, the houses without furniture. At night, 
A ghost town of cave dwellers was all that was left of this world metropolis, noted one observer. Practically every evening, as people ate their meals by flickering candlelight, since electricity usage was heavily rationed, sirens would announce the latest air raid and lead to the nightly descent into the nearest shelter. It was a sharp tug out of any reveries, a reminder that the end was fast approaching, and that the Red Army was only a short distance away, poised to launch its attack on the Reich capital. Hitler's own dream world during nocturnal visits to the cellars of the new Reich Chancellery as he sat by the model, constructed by his architect Hermann Geisler, of his hometown of Linz as it would appear at the end of a victorious war, provided him, too, with a momentary distraction from the clammy pressure of the war. Beyond that, his fantasies fitted the mask that he wore even now, refusing to concede to himself or anyone else that his world had collapsed into ruins. He had, at the latest since the failure of the Ardennes Offensive, known that defeat was certain. But he could not openly admit it. This was part of the continuing act of the indomitable Führer, which he had unceasingly upheld throughout the mounting adversity. The constant pretense, to himself as well as to his entourage, that all would eventually turn out well. His dreams and illusions were a defiance of the reality gripping him most of the time, of a lost war, of an imminent end that had to follow his own death. Since he could never contemplate surrender, as long as he lived, the immense suffering and destruction of the war would continue. And since he would not allow himself to be captured, suicide was the only way out. His monstrous ego had led him long since to conclude that the German people had proved themselves unworthy of him. Their defeat had shown them to be weak. They did not deserve to survive. He could weep no tears for them, but he had yet to decide when and where to end his own life. For those in his entourage who saw him on a daily basis, his authority remained utterly unquestioned. Beyond the bunker, deep below the garden of the Reich Chancellery in the center of Berlin, that he had made his last home since returning from the Western Front in mid-January, it was a different matter. The Reich itself had drastically shrunk. Goebbels pointed out on the 9th of April that German possessions were by now reduced to little more than a narrow band running southwards from Norway to the Adriatic coast of northern Italy. Much of what had been the Reich was now under enemy occupation and beyond Hitler's reach. And for most ordinary people in areas still under German rule, Hitler had long been a shadowy presence, someone encountered only through the occasional proclamation or newsreel pictures, though they were aware that, as long as he lived, there would be no end to their misery. For the Gauleiter, the regional rulers of the Reich, his writ was ceasing to run. It was not that they thought of openly challenging his authority— they had been his loyal viceroys for years, the pivot of his power in the provinces, and even now the consequences of any rebellious acts were to be feared. But huge communication problems and the advances of the Western Allies meant that control from Berlin was scarcely possible any longer. They had to tackle the situation confronting them directly, not await for unrealistic and impracticable orders from Berlin. In any case, it was obvious that Germany could hold out at best for only a week or two longer. Most of Hitler's henchmen thought of little beyond saving their skins. Few of them contemplated leaping into the funeral pyre with their leader. As Nazi rule disintegrated ever more rapidly, and fragmentation took the place of any semblance of centralized governance, the regime increasingly ran amok. Police, SS, and regional and local party officials took matters into their own hands in a ferocious repression of anything hinting at rebellion or attempts to prevent senseless last-minute destruction. Internal enemies were at extreme risk as Nazi desperados turned on them in the last agony of the regime, determined to exact revenge for their hostility and to ensure that they would not be able to exult in triumph at the downfall of Nazism. And the fate that had befallen the prisoners of the concentration camps in the East was inflicted upon those in the remainder of the Reich, forced out of the horrendous hellholes, and in one final spurt of intense terror, 
dragooned on seemingly aimless death marches. Now, as before, as the regime visibly fell apart, its leaders in the party and in the military lacked both the unity of spirit and will and the organizational capacity, which the Italian fascist leaders had exercised in toppling Mussolini in July of 1943, to confront Hitler and try, even at the final hour, to halt Germany's descent into the abyss. The last act in the drama remained, therefore, to be played out. 2. With the loss of the Rhine front in March, any lingering logic to continuing the war in the West had evaporated. Nevertheless, the generals fought on. Keitel and Jodl in the high command of the Wehrmacht, and the commander-in-chief West, Field Marshal Kesselring, had believed, so they later claimed, to the end of March that they could prevent the total collapse of the front on the Rhine and stabilize, for a while, the position in the West. The only faint rationality was presumably the old one of buying time for the Western Allies to recognize that their true enemy lay in the East, bringing the collapse of the unholy coalition with the Soviet Union and allowing the remnants of the Wehrmacht to find new purpose by joining with the Western powers against the Red Army. If that did represent the thinking at the time, it was by now even more obviously the mere pipe dream it had always been. With victory so close, the last thing on the minds of Roosevelt and Churchill was breaking with the Soviet allies who continued to bear the brunt of the human losses in the fight to crush Hitler's regime. The total collapse in the West was unstoppable. The swift American advance, once U.S. troops had consolidated positions over the Rhine, had driven wedges between Modal's Army Group B in the Ruhr and the Army Groups H to its north and G to the south. By the 2nd of April, Modal's forces, still numerically strong but with weak heavy weaponry, were cut off in the Ruhr and could be supplied only from the air. Two days later, the American Ninth Army began its attack to destroy the surrounded German forces. They had to surmount initial fierce resistance, but the outcome was never in doubt. Mayors of some major cities, encouraged by leading industrialists and backed by social democrats, Communists and other anti-Nazi groups, emerging from years of suppression, surrendered without a fight. Duisburg, Essen, Solingen, Bochum, and Mulheim fell without inflicting further unnecessary suffering on populations deprived of the most basic amenities and forced to dwell in cellars, bunkers, and bombed-out buildings. In contrast, fighting continued for four days before Ham was taken, and Dortmund eventually fell only after being encircled, then stormed by powerful American forces on the 13th of April. By this time, Modell had reported that about two-thirds of his army lacked weapons. Troops were now deserting in droves, simply disappearing into the woods or the ruined cities, and a number of commanders surrendered their units. American forces had, in the meantime, advanced deep into central Germany. By the middle of April, they had pushed into Thuringia, taking Erfurt, Weimar, and Jena, from where they pressed southwards toward Coburg and Bayreuth, as well as advancing into Saxony to the outskirts of Halle, Chemnitz, and Leipzig, and to the northwest, capturing Hanover and Braunschweig. On the 11th of April, they had reached the Elbe. There was no longer a German front to speak of, Continued fighting was, nevertheless, sporadically fierce, and the Americans still encountered pockets of tenacious resistance. As in the Ruhr, the civic officials of numerous towns and cities preferred surrender to senseless destruction. Gotha, Göttingen, and Weimar were among those that capitulated without a fight. In Magdeburg, by contrast, the refusal of the city's military commandant to surrender on the 17th of April prompted a devastating attack by 350 planes the same afternoon, before the last resistance faded the following day. To the north, the British and Canadians made slower progress against the still relatively strong forces of Blaskowitz's Army Group H. But by the 10th of April, the British had reached Sella, northeast of Hanover, and further north reached the Vesa, south of Bremen, while the Canadians had forced their way northwards through the Netherlands almost to the coast. 
The major North Sea ports and links to Denmark and Norway remained, however, in German hands, and the Wehrmacht in the northwest constituted one of the last relatively intact bases of power for the Nazi regime. In southern Germany, the situation was more ominous. Hitler dismissed Colonel General of the Waffen-SS, Paul Hauser, Commander-in-Chief of Army Group G, on the 2nd of April, after he had wanted to retreat to the south and southeast. His replacement, General Friedrich Schultz, tried to implement Hitler's orders to hold out for two to three weeks to gain vital time, so it was claimed, to introduce jet planes which would transform the military situation and pressed all available forces into a display of fanatical resistance in the area of Aschaffenburg on the Main. Until the middle of the month, he succeeded in blocking American advance until he was outflanked by the 3rd U.S. Army heading south from Thuringia, at which the retreat of Army Group G turned into flight. American and French troops had, meanwhile, advanced towards Stuttgart. Heilbrunn, an important railway junction on the eastern bank of the river Neckar, was taken only after intense fighting. The town was defended by a relatively heavy concentration of Wehrmacht troops supported by Volkssturm contingents. Its citizens, terrorized by a fanatical Nazi leadership, had been unable, as in many other places, to instigate moves to capitulate without a struggle. The result was that Heilbrunn suffered a week's bitter but futile fighting before the inevitable surrender. That was the exception. Most places were able to engineer a surrender and avoid being blown to smithereens in a senseless attempt to hold out. The French had easily taken Karlsruhe and other towns in Baden without a struggle, though for reasons still unclear they almost completely destroyed Freudenstadt in the Black Forest. By the middle of the month they were set to attack Freiburg, which fell to them with little fighting on the 21st of April. Stuttgart, the capital city of Württemberg, was surrendered the next day without a struggle, despite the insistence of the Gauleiter on a fight to the last after the Nazi leaders had fled. Prominent anti-Nazis had managed to persuade the mayor, a long-standing Nazi himself, to spare the city pointless destruction. The French swiftly took control of Stuttgart and the surrounding areas. For local inhabitants, fear of the Nazis, who in most cases skedaddled, turned into anxiety about the French conquerors. Unlike the Americans, whose occupying forces were largely disciplined, the French troops, especially it seems a minority of the feared colonial troops from North Africa, looted extensively and perpetrated numerous rapes on entering German villages and townships, as reports by the local clergy and others made plain. In Freudenstadt, the worst instance, the raping, looting, and pillaging went on for three days. In the meantime, driving south through Franconia, American troops encountered resistance, sometimes heavy, but took town after town. Most surrendered without a fight, before, on the 16th of April, reaching Nuremberg, the very shrine of Nazism. Hitler ordered the city of the Reich party rallies to be defended to the last. The fanatical party leadership, with nothing to lose, and Gotterdammerung mentality intact, refused to capitulate. It simply delayed the inevitable. After four days of fierce fighting and further unnecessary bloodshed and destruction, the former party stronghold and symbol of Nazi power eventually fell. It was the 20th of April, Hitler's birthday. On the 15th of April, the Western Allies laid down their immediate future objectives. In the north, press on to Lübeck, consolidate positions on the Elbe in central Germany, and in the south, advance to the Danube and into Austria. That same day, Hitler stipulated that, should the Reich be split into two by enemy advance through central Germany, Grand Admiral Dönitz in the north and Field Marshal Kesselring in the south should take command of defenses as his delegates in whichever part of the country he himself was not situated. The Wehrmacht in the west was by now in a truly desolate situation. And in the east, the awaited big Soviet offensive directed at Berlin was set to begin before dawn of the very next day, April 16th. 
In East Prussia, the Soviets had finally broken the siege of the once beautiful, now devastated, city of Konigsberg. On the 9th of April, with his forces on the verge of complete destruction and the city an inferno, its commandant, General Otto Lasch, finally surrendered. Though only when Red Army soldiers stood outside his bunker. The defense of Konigsberg had cost the lives of 42,000 German soldiers and 25,000 civilians. Some 27,000 soldiers left in the garrison at the end entered Soviet captivity. In a towering rage, Hitler had Lash sentenced in his absence to death by hanging, a sentence impossible to have been carried out, and his family imprisoned. He also dismissed General Friedrich Wilhelm Müller, last commander of the Fourth Army, which, apart from remnants still holding out in the Zamland, was by now effectively defunct. By the time the harbor at Pilau eventually fell on the 25th of April, only 3,100 of an army, once comprising half a million soldiers, were left, barricaded on the Frische Nerung until the end of the war. To the southeast, there had been a further greater disaster. After a siege lasting nearly two weeks, the Austrian capital, Vienna, fell, a ruined shell to the Red Army on the 13th of April, after days of intense street fighting that continued into the heart of the city with heavy losses on both sides. The Soviets could now push further westwards into Austria on both sides of the Danube. Few German soldiers forced to retreat further into a shrinking Reich could have placed much faith in Hitler's empty words two days later. Berlin stays German. Vienna will be German again. And Europe will never be Russian. By then, Zhukov's troops, massed on the Oder, only some 70 kilometers from Berlin, awaited the signal to launch the attack, which, they were confident, would destroy Hitler's regime and bring them victory. A mighty army had been assembled for the Battle of Berlin. Zhukov's first Belarusian front, and further north, preparing to attack westwards from Pomerania, the second Belarusian front, under Rokossovsky, together comprised 1.4 million men, with more than 4,000 tanks and 23,000 pieces of heavy artillery. To the south, Konev's first Ukrainian front, ready to be launched from bases on the Nysa, had a further 1.1 million men and 2,150 tanks. Each of the fronts was backed by massive air superiority, amounting in all to 7,500 planes. Facing them were Heinrichi's Army Group Vistula, an outdated name since they were now preparing to fight west of the Oder, consisting of the 3rd Panzer Army under Manteuffel in the north and the 9th Army under General Theodor Busse, directly guarding the approaches to Berlin, together with defending the attack from the Nysa and protecting the southern outreaches of the city, part of Schonerer's Army Group Center, the 4th Panzer Army under General Fritz Hubert Grosser. The German forces amounted in total to a million men, 1,500 tanks and armored vehicles, and 10,400 artillery pieces, backed by 3,300 fighter planes. The imbalance in forces was compounded by the fact that many of the Germans were young, ill-trained recruits, while the air strength was purely nominal since many planes were grounded through lack of fuel. Only the three concentric rings of deep echelon fortifications barring the path to the capital gave an advantage to the defenders. Zhukov's offensive began at 3.30 a.m. on the 16th of April, with an immense artillery barrage amid a battery of searchlights aimed at blinding the enemy and illuminating the path of attack. But German defenses held for two days before, after ferocious fighting and huge losses on both sides, the heavily fortified Silau Heights, a steep outcrop of hills ranging 90 meters above the Oder Valley between Silau and Vritzen, and the last formidable natural defensive barrier outside Berlin, fell to Zhukov's troops. With this, Busse's Ninth Army was split into three parts and forced into retreat to the north, center, and south of the front. Konov's offensive from the Nysa, meanwhile, had broken through more easily, driving the defenders back towards Dresden, but even more menacingly, 
rapidly advancing northwards towards Berlin and the rear of Busse's army. By the 20th of April, the first Belarusian front had forced its way through the outer defensive ring around Berlin, and its right flank was preparing to press the advantage to the north of the city. Berlin was on the verge of being encircled. South of Berlin, Konev's tanks had reached Jüterbog, the German army's major ammunition depot, and were about to overrun Zossen, its communication center. Zhukov's forces had taken Bernau, north of the capital, early in the morning. A few hours later, his guns opened fire directly on Berlin. 3. In the last desperate weeks, in which the gains from fighting on were hard to rationalize, Hitler's front commanders remained paralyzed from taking any action other than continuing the struggle, whatever the cost in lives and destruction. Since they had attempted nothing to halt the gathering self-destructive as well as massively devastating momentum over previous months, there was no likelihood of their doing anything when the end was so close. On the contrary, through an almost Darwinistic selection achieved by the dismissal of so many generals, only hardline loyalists committed to continuing the fight whatever the cost were left in key posts. Field Marshal Kesselring, Commander-in-Chief West, though by now with little of a Western Front to command, had for a time in the 1930s been Chief of Staff in the Luftwaffe, commanded an air fleet in the early years of the war, then sealed his reputation as a tough Commander-in-Chief in Italy, a military leader of high professional competence who took care to keep out of politics. He was an arch-loyalist, always exuding real or contrived optimism, however grim the military situation, and invariably impressed by Hitler's will to hold out. It was little surprise that Speer had no success in trying to persuade him not to implement Hitler's Nero order to destroy Germany's economic infrastructure on retreat. Speer was again disappointed in the field marshal when Kesselring arrived in the Führer bunker in early April to inform Hitler of the hopelessness of the situation. After only a few sentences, Hitler interrupted with a lengthy disquisition on how he was going to turn the tables on the Americans, whether he was genuinely convinced or, more likely, taking the easy way out. Kesselring was soon agreeing with Hitler's fantasies. After the war... In his self-serving memoirs, Kesselring gave a glimpse of his mindset in mid-April, with the Ruhr lost and the battle for central Germany unfolding. He saw meaning in sustaining the fight in the Hartz Mountains in order to hold up the enemy's advance until a stronger organized striking force came to the rescue. He had in mind the 12th Army, scraped together at the end of March and stationed east of the Elbe, and in the region stretching from Dessau to Bitterfeld, and Wittenberg. Only with its help could there be a certain assurance that the course of events on the Russian front would not be influenced from the West, and the splitting of Germany into two halves be prevented. His views, he stated, coincided with those of the high command of the Wehrmacht. At the moment I did not examine the question of the effect of these operations on the outcome of the war, which was no longer a matter for profitable thought. All I was trying to do was to prolong the battle by all available means in front of the hearts to give time for our operations on the Russian front to mature. Even if the Russians and the Western Allies were to meet on the Elbe, or in Berlin, there would still be a justification for continuing the war. The imperative necessity to gain time for the German divisions engaged in the East to fight their way back into the British and American zones. The commander-in-chief of Army Group B, encircled in the Ruhr, Field Marshal Model, had long been numbered among Hitler's most trusted generals, and was described by the dictator, towards the end of April 1945, as having been his best field marshal. Like Kesselring, Model had disingenuously insisted, while serving Hitler to the best of his ability, that he was unpolitical. Like almost all of his fellow generals, in fact, he shared at least partial identities with Nazism, including detestation of Bolshevism and belief in both the superiority of German culture and Germany's rightful supremacy in Europe. As the war had turned irredeemably against Germany, his own fanatical will to stave off defeat 
and prevent the victory of the Reich's enemies, was reflected in his unwaveringly confident proclamations to his soldiers and orders for ruthless punishment of inferior elements in the civilian population, who displayed a defeatist or hostile attitude. He echoed demands of the regime to hold out at all costs, and even the vocabulary of Nazi propaganda. At the end of March, his proclamation to his sub-commanders had described the duty of officers as setting an example to their men, if need be through their own deaths, and convincing them of the need to continue the struggle even more than before, down to self-sacrifice. He demanded immediate action against those sections of the civilian population who had been infected by Jewish and democratic poison of materialist ideas, and put the protection of their own belongings above unconditional support for the fighting troops. Model remained conscious of his loyalty and obedience to Hitler, even as German hopes crumbled. This was still the case after his strategic recommendations on the Ardennes offensive had been ignored, and even after a confrontation with Kesselring about a possible breakout from the Ruhr had led to his vehement denunciation of Keitel in Yodel at Wehrmacht High Command. Increasingly in conflict with this, as the end approached, was his sense of soldierly duty. Unlike Kesselring, he was amenable to Speer's entreaties not to destroy vital economic infrastructure. But he refused all attempts to persuade him to surrender his encircled army. Feelers towards a possible capitulation had initially been made by Walter Roland, Speer's tank expert, with Colonel General Josef Harpa, now commanding the 5th Panzer Army in the West. Harpa, who had been dismissed from his command during the retreat in the East in January, refused to act since going against the will of Model and the five Western Gauleiter would have meant certain condemnation to death. Hitler's order, following the fall of Königsberg, to have families arrested in the event of capitulation or refusal to accept orders, apparently weighed heavily with Model. By the 17th of April, the fighting in the Ruhr was over. When all hope had gone for his troops, Model dissolved his army group rather than formally capitulate to the enemy. Some 317,000 German soldiers and 30 generals entered captivity. Model had long seen suicide as the only honorable way out for a field marshal, and had hinted for some weeks at his own death and defeat. He shot himself in the woods near Duisburg on the 21st of April. Field Marshal Schorner, Hitler's favorite commander and the last one to whom he gave the field marshal's baton on the 5th of April, was, as we have had cause to note in earlier chapters, notorious for his brutality even among his peer group of tough generals, all of them strict disciplinarians. Anything other than driving his troops on to continue the fight against what he saw as an Asiatic enemy was here inconceivable. While Schorner did not have an equivalent anywhere else in the army. He had no monopoly of ruthlessness towards his own troops. The successor to SS Colonel General Hauser, as Commander-in-Chief of Army Group G in southern Germany, General Schultz, issued orders for the most severe measures to be taken to prevent the possibility of soldiers taking to flight at the appearance of enemy tanks. Every soldier leaving his position in battle without a command had to be made aware of what awaited him. Acknowledging the shortage of weaponry, he demanded that soldiers compensate with small arms and the Panzerfaust. Fighting on had become an end in itself. As Kesselring's reflection, quoted previously, indicated, it was not thought worthwhile to contemplate how actions might affect the outcome of the war. Most generals were perfectly capable of rational assessment of the situation. They chose instead to overlook their own dire assessments of the lack of weaponry shortage of men, and minimal prospects against overwhelming force, to stress the need to do everything not to disappoint the onward-driving will of the Führer. This fitted par excellence the stance of those in Hitler's own direct military entourage. Here, independence of judgment had never existed. Though General Jodl had on earlier occasions not refrained from speaking frankly to Hitler, he remained an ultra-loyalist, still enthralled to the genius of the Führer. Field Marshal Keitel had never throughout his career shown a flicker of willingness to stand up to Hitler, and was not going to start now. 
and with Guderian's dismissal as chief of the general staff at the end of March, the last semblance of feisty determination to counter what he saw as calamitous operational decisions was gone. His replacement, General Hans Krebs, was a capable staff officer, but had scarcely been selected for his readiness to challenge higher authority. Personally far more emollient than Guderian, he was quickly assimilated into the bunker community and amounted to little more than a cipher. The division of responsibilities between the high commands of the Wehrmacht and of the army had long been a structural weakness in the running of the war. Now, with the war almost over, the division ceased to be significant. But the new unity in kowtowing to Hitler at every turn was even more disastrous than the former split had been. And certainly nothing to deflect Hitler from his decisions was to be expected of the commanders-in-chief of the Luftwaffe and Navy, Göring and Dönitz. Göring had long been out of favor. But when he attended military briefings, his lasting humiliation made him, if anything, even more determined to show his mettle and back Hitler. Dönitz, for his part, proved himself in these last weeks to be among the most fanatical of Hitler's military leaders in insisting on the fight to the last. On the 7th of April, Dönitz, echoing Hitler's own sentiments, declared, We soldiers of the Navy know how we have to act. Our military duty, which we unerringly fulfill, whatever happens around us, leaves us standing as a rock of resistance, bold, hard, and loyal. Anyone not acting in this way is a scumbag and must be hanged with a notice round his neck saying, Here hangs a traitor who from the most base cowardice has helped German women and children to die instead of protecting them like a man. On the 19th of April, he commended the example of a prisoner of war in Australia who had quietly bumped off communists in the camp and said he would be promoted to a leadership position on his return. There are more such men in the Navy, he added, who show their mastery of difficult positions and prove their inner value. Just over a week earlier, Donuts expounded his own views on the presence of the enemy deep inside German territory. Capitulation, he stated, meant the destruction of Germany through Bolshevism. He defended National Socialism and Hitler's policies as necessary to prevent the Russians overrunning Germany. Grumbling, moaning, and complaining was fruitless and born of weakness, he declared. Cowardice and weakness made people stupid and blind. The leadership was aware of all possibilities. The Fuhrer alone, years ago, had clearly seen the threat of Bolshevism. At the latest in a year, perhaps within this year, the whole of Europe will recognize Adolf Hitler as the only statesman of standing. Europe's blindness would one day be removed and result in political possibilities for Germany. Donuts urged a commitment to duty, honor, obedience, hardness, and loyalty. He demanded of his commanders ruthless action against any officers failing in their soldierly duty. A crew would always go down with their ship in honor rather than surrender it. The same principle applied to the fight on land. Every naval base would be defended to the last in accordance with the Fuhrer's orders. It was victory or death. The Navy would fight to the end. This would earn it respect in coming times. It had to represent the will to existence of the people. There was no situation that could not be improved by heroism. Every alternative led to chaos and inextinguishable disgrace. Donitz's unconditional obedience to Hitler's will and conviction in the need to continue the fight was equally plainly expressed in a meeting with a number of Gauleiter and other leading party figures in northern Germany on the 25th of April. Interestingly, the question was raised at the meeting, by whom is not stated, whether it might be better to end the fighting in the interest of maintaining the substance of the German people. Dönitz replied that the assessment of this question was exclusively a matter of the state leadership embodied by the Fuhrer, and nobody had the right to deviate from the line laid down by him. The action of the Fuhrer was exclusively determined by concern for the German people. Though, as we know, Hitler had actually stated on more than one occasion that they did not deserve to survive. 
since the capitulation must in any case mean the destruction of the substance of the German people. It is from this standpoint, too, correct to fight on, Dönitz added. He stated his determination to put into action what was ordered by the Führer. Among the very few frontline generals to show any independence of mind and try to assert himself against Hitler in the last weeks was Colonel General Gotthard Heinrichi, presented with the unenviable task of defending against massively superior forces the coming attack on Berlin from the Oder. Other than Model, there was no general better equipped to conduct a defensive struggle. But Heinrichi was well aware that his forces were weak in armor and heavy artillery, and had large numbers of young, ill-trained soldiers. He was therefore appalled to learn, at the beginning of April, that Hitler was depriving him of several reserve divisions, including two panzer divisions, and relocating them to Army Group Center, now forced back into defending what was left of the Protectorate of Bohemia and Moravia. Henrique had been summoned to Berlin on the 6th of April to outline his defensive preparations for the forthcoming offensive. At the meeting in the Führer bunker, the general, accompanied only by his operations chief, Colonel Hans-Georg Eismann, had to face not just Hitler, but his entire supporting military entourage, including Keitel, Jodl, Dönitz, Göring, Krebs, and Himmler. He coolly summarized the situation of his army group. A particular weakness was the front near Frankfurt under Oder, where defenses depended heavily upon the Volkssturm. Henrique asked for fortress status for Frankfurt to be given up, and the 18 battalions holding the city to be redeployed in his own defensive forces. Hitler, seemingly at first to accept the proposal, suddenly erupted into a thunderous outburst of fury at generals and advisers who failed to understand him. The rage soon subsided, but Heinrichi was granted only six out of the eighteen battalions he had wanted. The general emphasized the weakness of his infantry reserves and requested reinforcements of at least three divisions. For an imminent battle of such significance, the situation was unacceptable, he stated. For a moment there was silence. Then, Göring volunteered one hundred thousand men from the Luftwaffe, followed by Dönitz and Himmler, who said they would provide between them thirty to forty thousand men from the Navy and SS. Henrique's objection that these were young recruits, not trained and inexperienced in hard infantry defensive warfare, was ignored. Weapons for them could only be provided by taking them from units of foreign troops serving with the Germans. When Heinrichi pointed out the weakness, not just of his infantry, but also of his armored formations, after losing important units to Schorner, Hitler told him that the Red Army would launch its offensive not at first towards Berlin, but towards Dresden, then Prague. Heinrichi looked in astonishment at General Krebs, but the chief of the general staff backed Hitler, saying the possibility could not be ruled out. Throughout, Hitler, supported by his entourage, had swept over the serious problems which Heinrichi had raised and provided the most optimistic gloss possible. At the end of the audience, Heinrichi questioned whether the fighting quality of the troops could withstand the opening barrage of the attack, and asked again where, since the outcome of the battle depended on it, he could find replacements for the inevitable losses. Hitler reminded him of the reinforcements promised by the Luftwaffe, Navy, and SS. On the first question, he told Heinrichi that he bore the responsibility for conveying faith and confidence to the troops. If all possessed this faith, this battle will be the bloodiest defeat of the war for the enemy and the greatest defensive success, he concluded. Leaving the Reich Chancellery some while later, after a prolonged wait in the bunker because of an air raid, Heinrichi and Eismann sat in silence in their car until the general said simply, It's come to this for us. Heinrichi was to undergo worse conflict with Hitler's military advisers in the high command of the Wehrmacht later in the month, as the Battle of Berlin reached its denouement. But his audience with the dictator on the 6th of April already highlighted the ambivalence of his continuing stance. He thought Hitler was mistaken and wrong-headed in his decisions. Nevertheless, he felt obliged to implement these decisions to the best of his ability. As he saw it, making every allowance for the fact that his 
post-war memoirs were intended to vindicate his own actions. His duty was a patriotic one, to defend Germany, not serve Hitler and National Socialism. But carrying out what his conscience and upbringing told him was his duty could only be done by helping to sustain the regime. He was, it is true, unlike Kesselring, open to Speer's request not to implement Hitler's scorched-earth decree. But that was about as far as his defiance went, as an incident in mid-April demonstrates. Speer, visiting Heinrichi in his headquarters near Prenzlau, broached the question of assassinating Hitler and asking whether the general was prepared to act. The question was purely rhetorical, since Speer's talk of killing Hitler was no more than hypothetical, and backed by no preparation. He possibly raised the matter with thoughts already in mind of his defense when faced with charges of participation in the regime's crimes. The answer was prompt and straightforward. In a personal sense, Heinrich said he had no bonds to Hitler or his entourage, but as a soldier he had sworn an oath of allegiance, and as a Christian he had learnt, Thou shalt not kill. Killing in war was plainly a different matter. He could imagine that in extreme circumstances he could reject the obedience bound up in the oath. But as a soldier, to murder the supreme commander to whom I swore an oath of loyalty, in the face of enemy attack, that I cannot do. He was, moreover, sure that it would prompt later belief in a stab in the back. Speer agreed. They were, he acknowledged, trapped. They could only go on. Whatever their varying attitudes towards Hitler and National Socialism, ranging from fanatical commitment to little more than contempt, no general, and the same applied to the vast majority of the soldiers in their commands, wanted to see Germany defeated, least of all to be subjugated by the Bolsheviks. The consequence of doing all in their power to prevent this happening was the prolongation of the war, and of the lifespan of the Nazi regime, with all the suffering this entailed. Hopes that, even now, something could be salvaged from the war and Germany saved outweighed the desire for an end to Nazism. For some, indeed, there was no estrangement from Nazism and the lingering dream that a miracle could still happen. In his retirement near Würzburg, after his dismissal for failure in East Prussia, Colonel General Reinhardt, for example, could plaintively ask when and how the salvation that we still believe in will come. A week later, just like Hitler and Goebbels, he saw in President Roosevelt's death on the 12th of April a glimmer of hope. Meanwhile, the deadly machinery of war ground on. Reserves of manpower were exhausted. Orders were still going out involving the party in cooperating with the Wehrmacht to round up stragglers and send them back to the front. But whatever the brutal methods used, the numbers amounted to a mere drop in the ocean. At the end of February, Hitler had approved using 6,000 boys, born in 1929, some of them therefore not yet 16 years old, to strengthen rear defensive lines, as well as the training of a women's battalion. But by April, boys were being sent out to fight not in the rear, but in the front lines. The Reich youth leader, Arthur Oxman, agreed at the end of March to establish Panzer Close Combat Units of the Hitler Youth. At the start of April, the first battalion of 700 Hitler Youth was ferried out on lorries to fight as close combat troops to shoot down tanks near Gotha. When the Soviet offensive began, 15- and 16-year-olds were to find themselves facing up to the onslaught from Russian tanks. The Waffen-SS were still press-ganging young Germans to join up a month later, even as the Soviets were battling their way into the center of Berlin. It was far from the case, however, that all young Germans had to be coerced into almost suicidal combat. Whether through indoctrination in the Hitler Youth, idealism, or a sense of adventure, many went willingly to the front, some ready even at this desperate stage of the war to offer the last sacrifice for their country. Few could have been prepared for what lay in store. 
Most of the Hitler Youth recruits were, in any case, far from being fanatics ready to die for their country, and were just frightened, disoriented boys, forced into action, and often wantonly slaughtered in a hopeless cause. Improvisation was by now the order of the day. In the south of Germany, the Volkssturm were used to carry out road repairs after bombing raids to enable troop movements to continue. Most road workers were, by this time in any case, serving in the Volkssturm, it was pointed out. Orders were still being dispatched for the hasty erection of tank barriers by means of the ruthless and comprehensive deployment of the entire population. The dearth of equipment for the fighting troops was partly to be made good by distribution from Wehrmacht's stores in the path of enemy advance. In Württemberg, Army Group G was grateful to come across 100,000 pairs of boots to replace the down-at-heel footwear of the troops, along with large amounts of leather clothing. Astonishingly, Hitler himself had to order, in the last week of his life, that all stocks of weapons and equipment left lingering for more than a week on wagons at railway stations should be unloaded and supplied to the troops. None of this was any more than papering over the cracks but it contributed towards enabling some sort of a fighting force to continue operations in the increasingly desperate circumstances. And pretenses had to be maintained. Remarkably, amid the extraordinary shortages of men and materiel in a lost war, preparations were still made in mid-April for an exhibition of the latest armaments models to be displayed in the courtyard of the Reich Chancellery for Hitler's usual birthday inspection on the 20th of April. Generalizations about mentalities among the rank and file of the armed forces is obviously hazardous. And however varied the political attitudes of individual soldiers, sailors, and airmen, the overwhelming number probably simply accepted that they had no choice but to do what they were ordered to do, fight on. The character of the fronts certainly affected attitudes. There was almost certainly greater tenacity, determination to fight, and even belief in Hitler among those directly facing the Red Army in the East, where the ideological conflict was most pronounced, even among the troops on the collapsing Western Front. How representative was a letter home at the beginning of April from an NCO serving with the 12th Panzer Division cut off in Cortland cannot be known, but it indicates that Nazified ideas were still present in his unit. Some will regard the war in these critical days as lost, he wrote but the war is only lost if we surrender. Even should Germany capitulate, would the war be over for us? No. The horror would be only just really beginning, and we would not even have weapons to defend ourselves. As long as we have weapons and the firm belief in our good cause, nothing is lost. I believe firmly in a decisive shift in fortunes. Providence, which sent us the Führer, will not allow all the terrible sacrifices to have been in vain, and will never abandon the world to the annihilatory terror of Bolshevism. There were, however, contrasting attitudes, even among soldiers in the East. Reflective diary entries in mid-April from an NCO based in Prague, with obvious anti-Nazi feelings, display critical distance from the regime, a realistic view of the hopelessness of the position and a sense that the fate now embracing the Reich had been earned by the crimes in the East that Germans had committed. He estimated that about 10% of the soldiers, with reference to statements by Hitler and Goebbels, still believed in a technical miracle. Remarkably, there was speculation about the splitting of the atom, and that Germany possessed a weapon of such force that it would make England disappear from the face of the earth. Even worse than such talk, the diarist thought, was that a great sector of the German population, while not believing in the existence of such a weapon, regretted that Germany did not have one, which it could use to destroy all its enemies in one strike. Then we would be the victors. In such notions, he saw the extent of the brutalization and moral decay which Nazi education had produced. This people will have nothing to complain of in its own fate, he commented. He had heard in the last days several times from older soldiers who had experienced the first two years of the Russian campaign 
the saying that all guilt is avenged on earth. They saw reports, he thought partly exaggerated, of Bolshevik atrocities in the occupied eastern parts of Germany as proof of this. Many think consciously of the things that they themselves saw or had to carry out and which have to be set against what is allegedly taking place now. We are guilty ourselves. We've earned it. That's the bitter recognition that many struggle through, too. Two days later, the same soldier commented on the fighting in central Germany and the surrender of Königsberg, with the attendant condemnation to death in absentia of the German commandant and the arrest of his family. He saw the demands of the Nazi leadership to defend every town and village to the last as leaving no lingering doubt about the fanatical will and the method to try to counter the imminent threat of collapse. Everyone not involved in the defense or acting against the decreed measures will be threatened with death. However, he thought there was growing acceptance of unconditional surrender, and that mass desertion and internal unrest would spread in the following days. The signs of rising anger were evident. People were saying more openly what they had earlier secretly thought, and the insight into the true situation and the intentions of our leadership is growing. In these days, the last arguments are being knocked out of even the most hard-nosed optimist, he wrote. Soon, nobody and nothing will be able to justify further resistance. The slogan of heroic downfall will then, in its naked madness, be plain to the entire people. However divided they were in their political stance, for soldiers awaiting the Red Army's odor offensive, east of Berlin, a prominent motive for continuing to fight was, unquestionably, defense of the homeland against a hated enemy. More telling in the heat of battle was the group camaraderie of the fighting unit. The most important of all, in the last resort, was the desire for self-preservation. German soldiers were well aware that they could expect no quarter from the Red Army if they were captured. They often knew, sometimes at first hand, of earlier German atrocities in the East. What awaited them on capture, they were sure, was death, or, at best, indefinite slave labor far away in the Soviet Union. Propaganda vilifying the enemy and depicting the horrors awaiting them should the Bolsheviks prevail, rammed home to the troops and pep talks from NSFOs naturally then fell on its most fertile ground in the East. For troops being pushed relentlessly back in northwestern, central, and southern Germany, there was a less clear focus. Fear of the enemy was far less pronounced. At the same time, revulsion at the notion that foreign enemies were occupying German soil doubtless spurred on many. A group of 14- and 15-year-old boys, evacuated from the Ruhr, who volunteered for service in the SS and Lower Franconia in early April 1945, had themselves mixed motives. Some were ardent Nazis. Others sought camaraderie and adventure. But all of them wanted to save the fatherland. There were still, if in a minority, plenty of ardent Nazis present in the armed forces, especially among younger soldiers. In one letter that came into British hands in April, a lieutenant serving in Lower Saxony told his parents in Westphalia, I simply cannot believe that the Fuhrer will sacrifice us senselessly. Nobody will be able to rob me of my faith in him. He is my all. Who knows what experiences I shall have before we meet again. But I am an officer, and will gladly do all I can for my fatherland. More, much more even, than duty requires. Volunteers were not lacking for service as suicide pilots, with the aim of ramming their fighters into Allied bombers. More than 2,000 men immediately came forward, motivated by the loss of their homeland in the East, the death of their families through Allied bombing, or Nazi fanaticism. The kamikaze-style tactic proved unsuccessful, and the self-sacrifice pointless. Only eight bombers were brought down through ramming, at a cost of 133 German planes and the lives of 77 pilots. Waffen-SS units still showed astonishing levels of morale, fighting power and commitment to the regime, as well as utter ruthlessness in blowing up houses where white flags were flying and taking reprisals against individuals raising them. In varying degrees, differing from person to person, 
ideological commitment, fanatical loyalty, a sense of comradely duty, fear of the consequences of non-compliance, and sheer lack of alternative, drove on the German will to resist. Perhaps, other than a vague notion that their actions were helping somehow save Germany, many soldiers in the West had no clear rationale for why they were still fighting. For in the West, too, self-preservation was the most prominent motive, according to a survey of 12,000 soldiers' letters during March. In almost all, the wish was expressed to survive the last phase of the war and rejoin their families. An impression of a disintegrating army can be glimpsed from the diary account cited on occasion in earlier chapters of Lieutenant Julius Dufner. By April 1945, Dufner was based in the Berkisches Land, south of Remscheid, near Vermelskirchen, then in nearby Zollingen, as Model's orders came through for the dissolution of Army Group B. On the 13th of April, he heard rumors that soldiers had thrown away their weapons and that the war in the West was over. As troops retreated, men and women were exhorting them to lay down their arms, offering accommodation and civilian clothing. Two days later, there were further rumors that Hitler, Goering, and Goebbels had been shot or committed suicide. Inhabitants were pulling down tank barriers in Zollingen. Wehrmacht goods were being distributed to the local population. Children were running round in steel helmets discarded by soldiers. Hatred against the party was now able to find voice. Everything smelling of the party was seen as fair game, he noted. By the 16th of April, nearly all the soldiers were wearing civilian clothes and acting as if they had been dismissed from army service, though an actual order to that effect had still not come through. Their senior officer, a major, was dressed in an ill-fitting suit and sports cap, giving up any pretense at command. The last munitions dump was detonated. The following day, the 17th of April, in the ruined city center of Zollingen, as German prisoners were loaded onto lorries to be taken into captivity, and American G.I.s, smoking camel cigarettes and chewing gum, took over the town, he set out for home in Baden, where he arrived nearly a fortnight later in civilian clothing, and on the bicycle that he had obtained by offering his motorbike and 100 Reichmarks in exchange. For him, the war was over. Other soldiers, particularly those tensely awaiting the battle on the Oder, were less lucky. 4. The regime's control in western areas was by now in an advanced stage of disillusion. Propaganda reports gave Goebbels an alarming picture of demoralization. There was no longer reluctance to voice sharp criticism of Hitler himself, and no fear of the Americans. White flags were put out as they approached, and they were greeted with enthusiasm, regarded as protectors against the Soviets. The population were often directly opposed to their own troops who wanted to continue the fight, with a predictably depressing effect on the soldiers. There was a good deal of looting. Alongside the defeatism and widespread fatalism, many people were now talking of suicide as the best way out. Characteristically Nazified demands were voiced for drastic action against those seen as responsible for Germany's plight. People pointed to the peremptory punishment of those who had failed to detonate the Remagen Bridge and thereby allow the Americans to cross the Rhine. They wanted similar treatment for those responsible for the catastrophe in the air war, even demanding the death penalty for Goering. Some believed, as did Hitler himself, that treason was behind the collapse on the Western Front. So negative were the reports reaching Bormann that he felt it necessary to write a lengthy complaint to Ernst Kaltenbrunner chief of the security police, at the tone of the typical SD report, which generalized broadly from a small number of individual cases, to paint a bleak picture. Bormann accepted that some segments of the population, but not the population, had welcomed the Americans, though he attributed this to an inability to counter the propaganda effect of enemy radio and to the readiness of people to believe that the war would soon be over and with that a release from the constant bombing raids. For his part, he was convinced that, as after 1918, there would soon be a very strong, sobering process. According to General Schultz, 
commander-in-chief of Army Group G, in a telex on the 8th of April to Karl Wall, Gauleiter of Swabia. The fighting of the last days has clearly shown that the population in the zone close to the front uses all means to deter soldiers from any fighting and resistance in order to protect their property from destruction. As a countermeasure, he urged the evacuation of the population near the combat zone. Vall took the view that this did not yet apply to the population of his region. A few days later, he nevertheless complied with an order to evacuate a zone either side of the Danube as a preventive measure in case it was drawn into the fighting area. Women and children were ordered to leave within two hours on foot or bicycle since no transport was available, and to use side roads to keep the main routes clear for the troops. In many parts of the West, evacuation, as Goebbels acknowledged, was impractical. We're issuing orders in Berlin that practically don't even arrive, let alone can be carried out, he wrote, seeing in this the danger of an extraordinary diminution of authority. Removing a largely unwilling population was impossible. No transport was available, and there were no areas to send them to. Evacuation orders of the Fuhrer could simply not be implemented and were quietly forgotten. In the South, following the collapse of Hungary and Austria, chaos arose from tens of thousands of refugees fleeing from the Soviets. Gauleiter August Eigruber of the Oberdonau region complained bitterly to the party chancellery that the Bayreuth region and the Munich Upper Bavaria region would not accept 15 trainloads of refugees numbering around 100,000 people from Vienna, the Lower Danube, and Hungary, nor, despite orders, send urgently needed cereals to the Upper Danube region, which had no corn supplies left. The refugees had been left in railway sidings for several days, Munich eventually agreed to take its share. The region of Tyrol was also forced into accepting some, though the Gauleiter, Franz Hofer, said that while he would do what he could for Germans, he could do nothing for Hungarians, Croats, and Slovenes. No one wanted to take the Hungarians. Gauleiter Fritz Wachtler, in Bayreuth, stubbornly continued to refuse to cooperate, the party chancellery sought in vain to get him to respond to its demands, eventually sending a special courier to obtain a reply. Wachtler had also failed to provide the daily situation reports, to which, it was said, the fewer attached great importance. His unwillingness or inability, Bayreuth was suffering severe air raids at the time, to comply with orders from Berlin was a further indication of the gathering disillusion of the regime. The collapsing communications network also contributed to the undermining of central control. By early April, it was almost impossible to sustain contact between Berlin and the regions in southern Germany and Austria. A motorbike courier service was proposed to relay urgent messages. The communications calamity had never been so great. Where communications still functioned, they brought an unceasing flood of new decrees and directives from Bormann. Thoroughly useless stuff, according to Goebbels, and largely ignored by Gauleiter, who did not even have time to read them. The propaganda minister contemptuously dismissed Bormann's efforts, saying he had turned the party chancellery into a paper chancellery. A glimpse of the profound lack of realism at lower levels of the party, existing to the end, can be found in the directive of the Christleiter of Freiburg in Saxony, as late as the 28th of April. Now that a certain stabilization of the situation has taken place, he wrote, two days before Hitler's suicide, it is necessary again to turn intensively to party work. A whole array of duties followed. In Vienna, the party was in a desolate state weeks before the city fell to the Red Army. There were reports of a rebellious mood among the working class, which indeed manifested itself in attempts by underground communist groups to assist the Soviets when they entered the city and high levels of antagonism towards the party. Functionaries were insulted, even spat at, and did not dare walk round after air raids unless armed. There was strong criticism of the Gauleiter, and one-time Hitler youth leader Balder von Schirach, and of Hitler. Women 
were said to have been especially prominent in the agitation, even inciting troops to mutiny. Goebbels could still try to claim, not least for Hitler's benefit, that the Werwolf activity marked a return to the revolutionary ethos of the party's time of struggle before the seizure of power in 1933. He continued to press for radical action, and he acted ruthlessly without hesitation. When 200 men and women stormed Baker's shops in a district of Berlin to get bread, he saw it as a symptom of inner weakness and budding defeatism, deciding instantly to stamp it out with brutal methods. Two of those singled out as ringleaders, a man and a woman, were summarily sentenced to death by the People's Court that afternoon and beheaded the next night. Posters, radio broadcasts, and a meeting held by the Chrysleiter about the incident aimed at discouraging any repetition. As Goebbels knew, such ruthlessness could not hide the evident fact that the party was disintegrating. The constant propaganda slogans to hold out to the last and to go down fighting in defense of towns and villages stood in stark contrast to the behavior of many party functionaries who disappeared into thin air at the approach of the enemy. The party chancellery repeatedly reminded functionaries to set the best example to the population. The Führer expected political leaders to master the situation in their regions with lightning speed and maximum severity, Bormann told them in mid-April. They had to educate their district leaders in the same way. Leaders, by nature, have burnt their bridges and show extreme commitment, he added. The honor of each one is worth only as much as his steadfastness, his commitment, and his deeds. The appeals fell mainly on deaf ears. The poor examples presented by the party have had an extraordinarily repellent impact on the population, Goebbels remarked at the beginning of April. Its reputation had been badly tarnished. A few days later he admitted that the behavior of the Gao and Chrysleiter in the West had led to a huge drop in confidence in the party. The population believed it could expect that our Gauleiter would fight in their regions and, if necessary, die there. This has not been the case in any instance. As a result, the party is fairly played out in the West. Some Gauleiter, and beneath them many Chrysleiter and lower functionaries of the party, had simply left the people in their areas in the lurch and fled. Much to the disgust of Goebbels, Josef Grohe, Gauleiter of Cologne Aachen, had failed to defend his region in March as the Americans entered and left in advance of the civilian population with his staff in a motorboat. He retained a skeletal staff for a short time at Bensburg, then dissolved his region administration entirely on the 8th of April and moved to Field Marshal Modell's headquarters before discarding his uniform a week later and setting out under an assumed name in a vain attempt to locate his family in central Germany. Albert Hoffmann, Gauleiter of Westphalia South, had tried in previous weeks through extreme severity to combat signs of collapsing morale and defeatism in his region. But, despite giving Speer the impression that he backed his attempts to prevent unnecessary destruction, he personally ordered a number of bridges to be blown up and made plans for his departure at the beginning of April. He moved to the headquarters of Modell's Army Group B and was seldom seen thereafter in his region offices. Without consulting either Hitler or Bormann, at a meeting with his Chrysleiter on the 13th of April, he announced the dissolution of the Nazi Party in the region of Westphalia South, fled that same evening, and vanished before joining his family in the middle of May, disguised as a farmhand. Gauleiter Koch, who for years had ruled East Prussia with a rod of iron and had been the target of much hatred for the belated and mismanaged evacuation of the population in January, was still in April producing slogans for the besieged provincial capital, such as, Victory is ours! Konigsberg will be the grave of the Bolsheviks! At the same time, he was making preparations to take himself, his family, and his possessions to safety. He made a final departure from East Prussia by air on the 25th of April, just before the harbor at Pilau was taken by the Red Army, and the fate of around 100,000 refugees still stranded on the Zomland was sealed. From the Hella Peninsula, he transferred to the icebreaker 
Ostpreußen, apparently with his Mercedes on board, and sailed to Denmark before traveling on to Flensburg, where he vainly demanded a U-boat to take him to South America. If these were the most blatant cases of the flight of the party's golden pheasants, few Gauleiter were prepared to entertain the prospect of the heroic death that the image of the leading Nazi fighters demanded. Only two out of forty-three serving Gauleiter, Karl Gerland of Kurhessen and the notably brutal Karl Holtz of Franconia, died at their posts in the fighting. Holtz's last report from Nuremberg, sent late in the evening on the 17th of April, painted a depressing picture of the situation in the city. Though the most negative sections were crossed out, perhaps in the party chancellery's Munich office, Troops were worn down by the enemy's superiority in materiel. The poor morale of stragglers was evident. One group of thirty or so men had approached the enemy with white flags before being shot down by machine gun fire from their own side. The population simply awaited its fate, cowering in the cellars and bunkers. He proudly reported that he had sent out some of his staff to organize the Verwolf and that his region had managed to assemble within only a few weeks a regiment of tank-destroying troops from the Hitler Youth, who had fought courageously, though with big losses, so that one battalion was already nearly wiped out. He and the mayor of the city, Willy Liebel, had decided to stay in Nuremberg and fight rather than leave the city. Next day, Nuremberg was under fire. Holtz's report to Hitler declared that, In these hours my heart beats more than ever, in love and loyalty to you and the wonderful German Reich and people, and that the National Socialist idea will be victorious, for which he was rewarded with the Golden Cross of the German Order, the highest honor of party and state. Just before midnight on the 19th of April, Holtz again wired Hitler for the last time, Our loyalty, our love, our lives belong to you, my Führer. All our good wishes for your birthday, which was the next day, the 20th of April. He refused to contemplate surrender and threatened even now to have anyone showing a white flag shot. On that day, the 20th of April, the City of the Reich Party rallies surrendered. Holtz had just dispatched the local SA leader to fight his way through to report to Hitler that we have defended Nuremberg to the last man. His final act was to order the SS men in his company to open fire on some policemen who were trying to cross to the Americans. An absolute fanatic to the end, Holtz was among a group that continued the fighting in the ruins of the police headquarters where he was killed. Farther east, Gauleiter Karl Hanke was coming to symbolize the genuine Nazi hero in the beleaguered city of Breslau. The situation there was worsening daily. From the beginning of April, with the loss of the aerodrome in Gandau, even provisioning of the city from the air was no longer possible. Houses were bulldozed, inflicting further misery on local inhabitants in order to construct an emergency airstrip. The living conditions of the population, still numbering more than 200,000, were, meanwhile, indescribable and became almost impossible when non-stop bombing raids on Easter Monday the 2nd of April, obliterated practically the entire city center. They were paying a terrible price for Hanke's decision in January to defend Fortress Breslau to the last. In Nazi eyes, however, he signified the indomitable spirit that refused to capitulate. For his personal leadership in the defense of Breslau, and to his great delight, Hitler bestowed upon the Gauleiter the Golden Cross of the German Order. In mid-April, Albert Speer sent Hanke a personal letter effusively thanking him for his personal friendship, for all that you have done for me, and praising him for his achievements as defender of Breslau, through which he had given much to Germany today. Your example, Speer went on, yet to be recognized in its greatness, will have the inestimable high value for the people of only few heroes of German history. He did not pity him, Speer concluded. You are heading for a fine and honorable end to your life. The hero had, however, no intention of going down with the city he had condemned to near total destruction. 
Hours before Breslau's capitulation on the 5th of May, Hanke would make his escape in a Fieseler stork, perhaps the only plane ever to leave the improvised airstrip in the city. 5. The brutal message which Bormann dispatched in Hitler's name to members of the party on the 1st of April clearly signaled, in its call to utter ruthlessness and demanding a fight to the last, the gathering desperation of the regime's leadership. It read, After the collapse of 1918, we devoted ourselves with life and limb to the struggle for the right of existence of our people. Now the high point of our test has come. The danger of renewed enslavement facing our people demands our last and supreme effort. From now on, the following applies. The fight against the enemy who has forced his way into the Reich is to be uncomprisingly conducted everywhere without pity. Gauleiter and Kreisleiter, other political leaders and heads of affiliates, are to fight in their region and district, to conquer or to fall. Any scumbag who leaves his region when under attack without express order of the Führer, anyone not fighting to the last breath, will be prescribed and treated as a deserter. Raise your hearts and overcome all weaknesses. Now there is only one slogan, conquer or fall. Long live Germany. Long live Adolf Hitler. It was a callous attempt at the final hour to turn back the tide. It could do nothing to stave off collapse as the inexorable military defeat grew closer by the day. Even so, in these last weeks, it set the tone for the gathering wave of unbridled violence against the regime's declared enemies as its control crumbled. Even the regime's high representatives were not immune from its venom. Gauleiter Fritz Wachtler, a prominent functionary in Thuringia almost since the time he joined the NSDAP in 1926, appointed Thuringian Minister of the Interior in 1933, and since 1935, Gauleiter of the Bayerische Ostmark with honorary status as an SS Obergruppenführer, had, as we saw, been unresponsive to missives from the party chancellery towards the end of the first week of April. This may have contributed to the readiness of Bormann and Hitler to believe the malicious report of his deputy, that Wachtler had deserted his region. Whether communications difficulties prevented Wachtler from letting Führer headquarters know his position is unclear. He certainly did face major problems at the time. Bayreuth, the seat of his region's headquarters, had been heavily bombed three times in early April, and by the middle of the month looked like a ghost town. Most of the Folkstrom men, who had been mobilized to defend the city, fled, followed by the Chrysleiter and his staff, before American tanks reached the outskirts in the night of the 13th of April. The party had by then effectively abdicated its power in the city, which was defended by no more than 200 or so soldiers under a combat commandant. Wachtler also secretly left Bayreuth about the same time with his regional staff to head south and take up residence in a hotel in Herzegau a district of the small town of Waldmunken, in the Upper Palatinate, close to the Czech border. It seems probable that Wachtler was transferring his command post, rather than deserting. But his deputy and long-standing rival, Ludwig Ruckdeschel, who had himself transferred his base to Regensburg, chose not to see it like that. It appears that Ruckdeschel contacted Führer headquarters in Berlin, accusing Wachtler of desertion. In the early morning of the 19th of April, Ruckdeschel and a squad of 35 SS men arrived at Wachtler's hotel. Ruckdeschel ignored Wachtler's plea that he had removed his staff to organize resistance from Waldmunken, and without hesitation pronounced the death sentence. Screaming dirty treason, Wachtler was taken away, stood up against a nearby tree, and immediately shot dead by a firing squad. Ruckdeschel proclaimed that Wachtler had been thrown out of the Nazi party and executed for cowardice in the face of the enemy, threatening any scoundrel and traitor acting similarly with the same fate. For ordinary citizens, compliance through fear of instant and arbitrary reprisals was a rational form of behavior. Anyone showing the least sign of opposing the regime's own death wish of senseless holding out against impossible odds faced great peril. 
Himmler decreed on the 3rd of April that, in a house in which a white flag appears, all males are to be shot. He was responding to an initiative from the party, referred to him by the OKW, which had recommended the burning down of any house showing a white flag. On the 12th of April, the high command of the Wehrmacht issued an order, signed by Keitel, Himmler, and Bormann, that every town was to be defended to the last. Any offer or promise by the enemy, should the town surrender, was to be rejected out of hand. The assigned combat commandant was personally responsible for ensuring that the defense of the town was carried out. Anyone acting against this order, or any official seeking to hinder the commandant in fulfilling his duty, would be sentenced to death. Publishing this order in Nuremberg, the Gauleiter and Reich Defense Commissar for Franconia, Karl Holtz, added his own writer. Every traitor hoisting a white flag will without fail be hanged. Every house where a white flag is hanging will be blown up or burnt down. Villages that raise white flags communally will be burnt down. Despite such uncompromising orders, backed by ruthless terror, even if the threat to burn down entire German villages does not appear to have been carried out, there were numerous cases of localized opposition. Few people wanted to end their lives in a futile show of heroism, or to see their homes and workplaces blown up senselessly. Whether they were able to avoid the worst of the destruction varied from place to place, depending on local conditions and the actions of those still holding the reins of power in their hands. Representatives of the dying regime in threatened areas, local government officials, party functionaries, town commandants who were handed military control over a locality, did not behave uniformly. In western regions, localized power struggles often decided whether a town was surrendered without a fight or went down in a hail of destruction. Many mayors of towns and even local party leaders behaved responsibly in defying demands to fight on. This could, however, bring savage reprisals if local desperados, party fanatics or SS men usually, gained the upper hand. In other instances, regime zealots still control the local levers of power and condemned inhabitants of towns or villages to unnecessary death and destruction in the final hours before occupation, and before, as a rule, they themselves fled at the last minute. There was no clear pattern. In many eastern areas, the approach of such a feared enemy brought no thought of handing over a town or village without a fight. But panic and attempts to flee, usually after party representatives, knowing what awaited them if they fell into Soviet hands, had abandoned them. Cottbus in Brandenburg was one of many such examples. Almost all the civilians in the town and surrounding area fled westwards in the days before the Soviet assault on Cottbus began on the 21st of April. By the early hours of the next morning, all the regular troops, including an SS panzer unit, had pulled out, destroying bridges as they went. Only the Folkstrom and a few groups of stragglers remained to defend the town. The last 200 soldiers, or Folkstrom men, fled that day. That was the last of the German Wehrmacht that I saw, recalled one eyewitness. The party Chrysleiter also vanished. The fortress commandant in Cottbus accepted that without regular troops the town was indefensible. That decision and the speed of the Red Army's advance meant that the last act in the fall of the town came quickly, and without further fighting or additional pointless destruction, those Soviet soldiers set on fire houses in which they found Nazi symbols. The fate of a village or town depended heavily upon the stance of the combat commandant and the actions of prominent citizens. The lovely university town of Greifswald close to the Pomeranian coast, was fortunate in avoiding destruction. The rector of the university, a 15th century foundation, and a small group of professors and prominent citizens were able to gain the backing of the combat commandant for the surrender of the town to the Soviets without a fight, despite the insistence of the Chrysleiter that it be defended, even if it held up the Red Army for only an hour. Without the support of the combat commandant, who encouraged citizens to put out white flags from their homes, the party officials in the town were powerless. 
In Western Germany, probably more than in Eastern areas, the collapsing control of the regime offered possibilities, despite the terror, for groups of citizens, women often prominent among them, sometimes led by local worthies, such as priests or doctors, to take the initiative to prevent the destruction of their townships. They could, if they were fortunate, win support from the mayor or other local government officials, and win over the combat commandant. Much hinged upon the individuals concerned and their readiness to take action, the stance of the local party officials, and the presence of the SS or Wehrmacht troops insistent upon terrorizing any scene as defeatists. In Stuttgart, the mayor, Dr. Karl Strohlen, himself a Nazi, was persuaded by anti-Nazi local notables to ignore the demands of the Gauleiter of Württemberg, Wilhelm Muhr, who was fanatically determined to fight on and punish any who stood in his way. Strohlen, gaining the support of the new combat commandant's superior, and through him the Wehrmacht commander in the area, opened clandestine negotiations with the Allies. On the 22nd of April, Stuttgart was surrendered without a struggle. On occasion, direct action prevented the worst. In the picturesque small town of Bad Windsheim, in Lower Franconia, in the most spectacular of a number of demonstrations led by women against the destruction of their towns, two to three hundred women, some of them with their children, protested in early April about the decision of the local military commander to hold out against the imminent arrival of strong American forces. After a tense confrontation, Bad Windsheim eventually fell without being subjected to total destruction and heavy loss of life. Such courageous protests were, however, not always effective. In Lahr, in the south of Baden, a large group of women in rebellious mood, hurling insults at Hitler and the party, persuaded a delegation of the town's officials to seek agreement from the local Wehrmacht commandant to surrender without a fight. Waiting for the return of the delegation, the women hoisted white flags throughout the town and started the bell tolling to signal surrender. Their hopes were premature. The delegation returned empty-handed. The SS commandant insisted on the defense of Lar, warning the women that if the white flags were not withdrawn that evening, his own men would open fire on the town. Instead of surrender, battle raged throughout the night and into the next day before the town fell to the French who then looted houses and shops, saying that the SS had behaved worse in France. Such actions to try to avoid futile destruction, when all was obviously lost, could provoke a drastic response. Hundreds of German citizens fell victim to uncontrolled violence in the last weeks of the Nazi regime. Examples could be multiplied without difficulty. Following the women's demonstration in Bad Windsheim, for instance, one woman, wrongly selected, probably because of her reputation as a critic of the NSDAP, as the ringleader by a hit squad sent down by the Gestapo in Nuremberg, was cold-bloodedly shot in front of her husband and daughter, and a notice pinned to her body announcing that a traitor has been executed. In Svevish Gmund, a small town in Württemberg not far from Stuttgart, the Chrysleiter and combat commandant had two men executed just before midnight on the 19th of April, hours before the Americans entered the town without a fight. One of the men was known to have been an opponent of the Nazis since 1933, when he had been arrested for distributing anti-Nazi pamphlets and returned from his stay in a concentration camp a changed person, psychiatrically disturbed. The other was a former soldier, no longer fit to fight after a serious injury. In a heated argument about handing over the city, or fighting on, with the certainty of the destruction of the lovely town with its beautiful medieval minster, they had been heard to shout, probably under the influence of alcohol, Drop dead, Hitler! Long live Stauffenberg! Long live freedom! The two were removed from their police cells late at night, taken to a wood at the edge of the town, and shot dead. The local Nazi representatives were ensuring with their last act of power, that long-standing opponents would not live to enjoy their downfall. Even as the executions were taking place, the Chrysleiter and his entourage were preparing to flee from the town. 
An extreme case was the arbitrary shooting dead of four civilians, among them a pastor, in a suburb of Heilbronn on the 6th of April, when the local Christlighter, Richard Droughts, and a group of fanatics, three of them in the Volkstrom, fleeing by car together with him as the Americans approached, came across a street in which white flags hung from several houses. In a rage, he stopped the car, ordering his men out. Shoot! Shoot everybody! Droughts' accomplices arbitrarily shot down their victims, men and women, within a frenzied few minutes, narrowly missing several others before driving off. Others fell victim not to random shootings or the actions of hit squads, but to the brutal summary justice of the flying court-martial. One such mobile corps traveled through parts of southern Germany in a gray Mercedes under the leadership of Major Erwin Helm, a special kind of berserker, proud of an earlier head wound that had left part of his brain protruding from his skull. Passing close to the village of Zellingen in Lower Franconia at the end of March, Helm's attention was drawn by the commander of the local Volkstrom Battalion, a doctor, to a sixty-year-old farmer, Karl Weiglein, who had allegedly made a sarcastic comment during a pep talk for the battalion, then later remarked that those responsible for blowing up the nearby bridge over the mine should be hanged. Helm's instant reaction, before hearing any details of the incidents, was that Weiglein should be executed. When the hurriedly constituted court-martial, there was no defender, took too long over its deliberations, Helm threatened to proclaim the sentence himself and prepared the place of execution, while the court was meeting. As soon as the inevitable death sentence was pronounced, he hung a notice around Weiglein's neck, sentenced to death for sabotage of the Wehrmacht and mutiny. In a particularly sadistic move, Weiglein was hanged from a branch of the pear tree just beneath the window of his farmhouse, while insults were hurled at his horror-struck wife. Walter Fernau, an NSFO and member of Helm's squad who had prosecuted Weiglein and demanded the death sentence, still justified it many years later. I really cannot say to you, he told his interviewer, decades after the event, that at the time I thought that was too harsh. He took the view that Weiglein was guilty even though the case against him was not proven. The situation necessitated harsh measures, he argued. There was also the deterrent effect. Helm said, Fairnow claimed to recall, that he has to be hanged and kept on display so that the Zellingen Volkssturm people see, well, if we step out of line, we'll get the same as him. The court rightly, in his view, did not have powers to give prison sentences. A few months in prison, while others were dying, would have been unjust. From the first to the last day of belonging to Helm's battalion, said Fernau, I never had the sense that I had made myself guilty. Though anyone seen to stand in the regime's way now ran the serious risk of summary execution, the main targets of the crimes of the last phase were nevertheless not random, but real or imagined opponents of the regime. Defeatists, subversives, supposed shirkers, presumed deserters or cowards, or anyone welcoming the end of Nazism or the arrival of the enemy. In this sense, the violence differed from the style of savagely arbitrary collective reprisals that had frequently been inflicted earlier in the war on the peoples of Nazi-occupied Europe. When directed by Germans against their fellow countrymen in the last weeks, the horror had a different pattern. Old scores were settled. Personal animosities, little to do with ideology, played their part. So did feelings of sheer revenge. Long-standing opponents were arbitrarily dispatched to prevent their enjoying their moment of triumph. Ideological indoctrination was, however, far from insignificant. Now, as before, the worst of the murderous violence was directed at the perceived racial and political enemies of the regime foreign workers, and, above all, concentration camp prisoners. Out of 288 crimes of the last phase, bringing convictions in post-war trials in West Germany, 114, or 39.6%, the highest single proportion, related to the shooting of prisoners and foreign workers. Apart from members of the Gestapo and other police units, 
Folkstrom men and prison personnel were most prominent among the convicted killers. Prominent individuals who had been involved in the resistance to Hitler could not be allowed to witness his downfall. Among those who had formerly belonged to the opposition within the Abwehr, the German military counterintelligence, Hans von Donanyi, who had worked for Hitler's downfall since 1938, was hanged in Sachsenhausen concentration camp on the 9th of April after a farcical trial before an SS court-martial. A similar flight in Flossenburg the same day befell Admiral Wilhelm Canaris, former head of the Abwehr. Colonel Hans Oster, who had been part of a plot against Hitler in 1938 and had leaked German invasion plans to the Dutch in 1940, and the evangelical theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer, whose courageous attempts to persuade the Western Allies to support the resistance in Germany had come to nothing. In Dachau, Georg Elser, the Swabian joiner who had tried to blow up Hitler in 1939, was also murdered, without even the semblance of a trial. But such killings were merely the tip of the iceberg. With the regime lurching almost visibly out of control, prisoners, whether in concentration camps or in state penitentiaries, lived or died at the whim of their guards or jailers. Violence towards prisoners, already escalating wildly, now became ubiquitous. It was even prompted in some cases by the military leadership. When his forces were cut off in the Ruhr, Field Marshal Model ordered on the 7th of April that prisoners in penitentiaries, including those under remand for political offenses, should be handed to the police for examination. The execution of more than 200 prisoners followed. There were numerous other killings in the final hours before penal institutions were evacuated or before the Allies arrived. Where an official executioner could not get to a penitentiary on time, prison officials, rewarded with money and cigarettes, carried out the killings. In one subsidiary of Emsland camp, a young apprentice chimney sweep, wearing an army captain's uniform, turned up and ordered the execution of dozens of prisoners. Astonishingly, his orders were followed, a sign of the mounting chaos in the collapsing regime. More than a hundred prisoners were executed over the next few days. 6. Amid the gathering mayhem and murderous frenzy, the violence and killing of the death marches of concentration camp prisoners in the final weeks of the regime marked a separate unholy chapter. The hurried, often chaotic evacuations and subsequent terrible death marches of prisoners from Auschwitz, Grossrosen, Stutthof, and other camps in the East, which we followed in Chapter 6, had at least a semblance of underlying rationale from the regime's perspective. The prisoners were to be kept out of the hands of the enemy and brought back into the interior of the Reich, where, in theory, though scarcely in practice for such emaciated, exhausted, frozen, starved, beaten, and otherwise maltreated human beings, they could be available for labor, or, as Himmler saw it, as potential pawns in any deal with the Allies. Those who were not killed en route or who did not die from exhaustion or exposure to the bitter winter conditions, eventually reached camps within Germany, including Bergen-Belsen. Following two days of negotiations, and amazingly Himmler's permission to hand over rather than evacuate the camp, unaware, given the dramatic decline in the already dreadful conditions in the camp over recent weeks, of exactly what horrors he was revealing— and hoping to exploit his humanitarian gesture in his dealings with Bernadotte, British troops entered Bergen-Belsen on the 15th of April. Most SS guards had by then left. Around 50,000 prisoners in a state closer to death than life were liberated. Thousands of decomposing corpses, many of them dead in the typhus epidemic that had raged for weeks, lay around. Some 37,000 had died since February, more than 9,000 in the two weeks before the liberation of the camp. Another 14,000 were to die from the effects of their suffering in the camp in the following weeks. That Bergen-Belsen was handed over, not evacuated, was a unique occurrence. The typhus epidemic ruled out evacuation. In all other camps, an attempt was made to remove the prisoners before the camp could be taken by the enemy. 
In March, as part of his attempt to reach some arrangement with the Allies, Himmler had ordered that Jews should be treated like other prisoners, informing camp commandants that they were no longer to be killed and that the death rate among prisoners should be reduced by all possible means. On the last day of March, the commandant of Buchenwald was expecting the camp to be handed over to the Allies. Within less than a week, that had diametrically altered. Himmler now ordered the camp's prisoners, where possible, to be sent to Flossenburg. In this, as an order sent to the commandant of Flossenburg in mid-April made clear, he reverted to the policy that there could be no question of surrendering concentration camps, and that no prisoners should be allowed to fall alive into enemy hands. Hitler's reaction to reports that newly liberated prisoners from Buchenwald had made their way to nearby Weimar, and had looted and raped, had probably caused the revision. Himmler now pressed for the swift evacuation of Mittelbau, Dora, and Buchenwald. During the night of the 4th to the 5th of April, removal of the Mittelbau prisoners in the direction of the concentration camps in Sachsenhausen, Ravensbrück, and Mauthausen began, and ended within 48 hours or so. On the 11th of April, American soldiers reached the camp complex in Middle Baldora, where they found 700 ill and emaciated prisoners, soon afterwards encountering further horrific scenes as they liberated the subsidiary camps. When the Americans arrived in Buchenwald, the largest camp in Germany, on the 13th of April, an unimaginably gruesome experience, they found around 21,000 prisoners, many little more than walking skeletons, remaining in the camp, out of the complement of 48,000, little more than a week earlier. The rest had set out, by rail or on foot, between the 7th and the 10th of April, heading for the concentration camps many kilometers away to the south of Flossenburg and Dachau, themselves bursting at the seams with swollen numbers of prisoners. These camps, too, and those still remaining at Mauthausen, not far from Linz in Austria, Sachsenhausen, just outside Berlin, Neuengamme near Hamburg, and Ravensbrück, a woman's camp about 80 kilometers north of Berlin, would evacuate their prisoners capable of marching, under catastrophic circumstances and with no obvious destination during the second half of April. The Buchenwald prisoners were among the numerous long columns of bedraggled, gaunt, shrunken figures from the remaining concentration camps now being driven by their merciless guards hundreds of kilometers crisscross through parts of Germany in disastrous conditions that defy description or obvious rationale. The prisoners were at this stage of the war plainly not of any use as forced labor, even if capable of working, and given the pace of the Allied advance they would, even if they reached their destinations, obviously fall in the near future into enemy hands. No consideration appears to have been given to the notion of killing all the prisoners in the camps, which, given the speed of the Allied advance, would in any case scarcely have been practicable. But if those removed were eventually going to be killed anyway, there was little logic to the lengthy treks beforehand. Himmler had not, it is true, given up expectation that the prisoners, or the Jews among them, could be used as pawns in some deal with the Allies. As long as they were alive and within his power, they might still serve a purpose in his illusory scheme. This dubious rationale apart, the death marches were completely pointless, except as a means of inflicting still further enormous suffering on those designated as the regime's internal enemies. But the commandants and the guards treating the prisoners on the marches with such sadistic brutality did not seek any rationale. Their system still functioned, after a fashion. They remained, even in its dissolution, set in the same mentality that had earlier seen them torture prisoners pointlessly, or force them to carry out pointless back-breaking labor. Ultimately, by April 1945, the regime just did not know what to do, with the hundreds of thousands of prisoners still in its domain. In the gathering chaos of the last weeks, the death marches reflected the futile flailing of a regime on the verge of its own destruction, but retaining its murderous capacity to the very end. As the regime collapsed, decisions on what to do with the prisoners were left increasingly 
to those guarding them. Only unclear or confused guidelines, though leaving much scope for initiative, came from Himmler and the now faltering concentration camp, Central Administration. Camp commandants were wary of acting prematurely, so gave evacuation orders at the last minute. Max Pauli, commandant of Neuengamme, near Hamburg, told interrogators after the war that in April 1945 he did not know what to do with his prisoners. When the marches set out, the fate of the prisoners was entirely in the hands of their guards, by this time far from all SS men, and including many drawn from the Volkssturm. How many were firm believers in Nazi ideology or even genuine regime loyalists cannot be known. But all had been in some way schooled in how to deal with the enemies of the people. There was no control over the guards' actions, no sanction for what they did. Their decisions on who should live or die were arbitrary. Prisoners were dispatched without a thought on a daily basis by guards to whom they were totally anonymous, lacking all identity. One blond-haired SS guard, only about twenty years old, casually shot a thirteen-year-old boy on a march from Sachsenhausen because he could not keep up with a fast pace, almost running speed. In their anger and despair, the boy's elder brother, a Jesuit priest, and his father tried to jump on the SS man, but he simply fired a few volleys from his machine gun at them. The machine guns rattled unceasingly as many prisoners were mowed down in the first two days. When, after a night in a barn, one prisoner refused to continue the march, the same young SS brute simply shot him dead. Then, a few minutes later, turned his gun on the prisoner's distraught brother-in-law, who had lagged behind. By now, the blond SS man simply pulled out prisoners who, in his opinion, did not walk fast enough and shot them on the spot. The guards thought of little besides themselves and their task of delivering their charges at the destination. As long as prisoners were capable of walking, obeying instructions, and serving the needs of their guards, not least keeping them away from the front, they might survive. But any sense that they had become a burden for the guards meant their instant death. Once on the march, no obvious distinction seems to have been drawn by the guards about the prisoners. All, Jewish or not, were subject to their arbitrary, murderous actions. In some cases, the killings became full-scale massacres. In Sella, 35 kilometers northeast of Hanover, almost 800 prisoners, men and women, fell victim on the night of the 8th to the 9th of April. The railway wagons transporting them, Russians, Poles, and Ukrainians predominantly, some but far from all Jewish, from two satellite camps of Neuengamme at Zaltzgitter to nearby Bergen-Belsen, were caught during a heavy air raid while standing in the station at Sella. Hundreds of prisoners burnt to death while trapped in the wagons. Those who escaped the inferno were able to take flight into the nearby woods. The manhunt rapidly set up to track them down consisted not only of their SS guards, but Volkssturm and SA men, local police and party functionaries, soldiers stationed nearby, members of the Hitler Youth, and also groups of local citizens who spontaneously joined in. When one thirteen-year-old boy inquired about the identity of the prisoners, as shots rang out in the woods, he was told they could well be Jews. The crowds were easily persuaded that the escapees were dangerous criminals and communists. The mass shooting of probably around two hundred prisoners was thus portrayed, and evidently viewed, as self-protection. Shortly afterwards, between the 9th and 11th of April, about three to 4,000 prisoners, many of them from Mittelbau Dora, heading for Bergen-Belsen, Sachsenhausen, and Neuengamme camps, arrived in the village of Mista, near Gardelegen, about 40 kilometers north of Magdeburg. When damaged tracks prevented their train from continuing, and the prisoners were force-marched to Gardelegen, the local Christlighter, Gerhard Thiele, exploiting stories that escaped prisoners had looted and raped in a village not far away, and declaring that he would do everything to prevent such an occurrence in his area, made preparations to have them killed. There was great urgency since the Americans were closing in on the town. 
The SS were aided in the meantime in guarding the prisoners by detachments from the Wehrmacht, Hitler Youth, and Volkssturm, the local fire brigade, and other organizations. When objections were raised that the site of the cavalry school he had proposed for the killing was too close to the town center, Tila came up with the idea of a large barn in an isolated position in a field on the outskirts. On the 13th of April, more than 1,000 prisoners, Jews among them, though predominantly politicals, were herded into the barn. Petrol was poured on the straw, the large doors were sealed, and the barn was set alight. Some prisoners trying desperately to escape were shot by the guards. The remainder died in the flames. Next day, the Americans arrived while the attempt was still being made to bury the charcoal remains of the prisoners. Unlike the earlier death marches that had left from the camps in the east, the thousands of prisoners who had been in every conceivable way degraded and dehumanized now trekked through Germany itself before the eyes of the German public. As in Gottelegen, their guards were often a motley bunch. Most were drawn from the SS and were well-armed and often accompanied by dogs, which they did not hesitate to turn on the prisoners. But a march from Ravensbrück in mid-April was guarded only by lightly armed older men, thought to be auxiliary police. Others had guards composed of SA men or ethnic Germans from different parts of Eastern Europe. Beatings and shootings of prisoners also took place before the eyes of the public, with no attempt to hide them. The hostile stance of the German population dominates the recollections of the victims, thankful though those doubtless were who benefited momentarily from any sign of human kindness. Post-war German accounts, on the other hand, had good reason to emphasize sympathy for the prisoners and condemnation of the crimes of the SS guards. Acts of solidarity, friendship, or support from bystanders seem at any rate to have been relatively rare. Years of demonization of Jews and indoctrination in racial stereotypes, along with the stoked-up fear of the people's enemies, reinforced through lurid radio reports of former Buchenwald prisoners rampaging and marauding through Weimar, and similar stories used to justify the massacre at Gardelegen, had clearly not been without their baleful effect. However much Germans saw themselves, increasingly as victims of Hitler and the Nazi regime, Many of them were not ready to extend their sympathies to concentration camp prisoners, least of all Jews, or to embrace the true victims of Nazism as part of their community. The human wrecks before their eyes looked like the caricatures of subhumans rammed home in incessant propaganda. But in all their evident frailty, they were still, perversely, seen by many as a threat. What crimes they must have committed to be treated so cruelly, was one comment. Another person, justifying the shooting by Wehrmacht soldiers of thirteen escaped prisoners, recaptured with help of the local population, remarked, They were political prisoners and mere criminals. Survivors of the marches recounted, depressingly but unsurprisingly, numerous cases where they had been insulted, jeered at, spat at, had had stones thrown at them, or were refused food and drink by local inhabitants. In some cases, German civilians, as at Sella, aided guards to capture prisoners who had escaped, and apparently participated in the killing. Alongside the horrific instances of callous support for murderous action, there were, nevertheless, indications that some civilians, even if they were the exceptions, tried to give food or succor to the prisoners, passing through their villages. A British report on the massacre at Sella stated that numerous citizens tried, in the face of threats and abuse from the perpetrators, to aid the prisoners by giving them first aid or comforting them. Around 1,250 weak and starving prisoners who arrived in Hutten in Württemberg at the beginning of April were said to have been given food by some local families. The local mayor apparently succeeded in bringing in some supplies for the prisoners and appealed to the Wehrmacht for help. A Wehrmacht officer and veteran of the First World War called to the scene, then organized a meal for around 200 sick prisoners who remained after the others had been marched off. 
He also ordered the dead to be properly buried. In Altendorf, a village in the Upper Palatinate, where 650 prisoners stopped on the night of the 21st to the 22nd of April, on their trek from Buchenwald to Dachau. Thirteen prisoners who hid in a barn were hunted down by their SS guards with dogs and pitchforks. Twelve were caught and immediately shot. The thirteenth, a Pole, was able to escape when the head of the local constabulary chose not to hand him over to the SS and allowed him to be fed before he disappeared. The dead victims were then buried by Folkstrom men in a mass grave in the cemetery. In contrast to many instances, when local inhabitants elsewhere rapidly dug improvised graves where the prisoners had been killed, or simply pushed the corpses into a roadside ditch and covered them over. The examples could be multiplied of inhabitants recalling feelings of shock and shame at the beatings and shootings that they witnessed, of providing prisoners with food and drink, not just when the guards simply requisitioned it, or, more rarely, of assisting escape or not betraying hiding places. Most people, however, it seems reasonable to surmise, simply remained passive, not participating but also showing no opposition, as the maltreatment and murder occurred beneath their gaze. The bystanders' own fear of reactions of the guards to support for the prisoners understandably played a part. With the war so close to its end, few were ready to invite retribution, least of all in the cause of prisoners, whose guilt was for the most part taken for granted. But some evidently did risk retribution, through signs of sympathy for the prisoners. Fear could not, therefore, have been the sole cause of the prevalent passivity. Even so, it was probably less the case that broad social support was given to the killing than that few were prepared to risk their own well-being by acting against guards ruthlessly wielding power in attempting humanitarian gestures, which, they felt, would change nothing towards people with whom they could not identify. That was enough to make them accomplices to murder. The passivity allowed the killing to continue until the guards fled on the approach of the enemy, and the prisoners were liberated not by Germans themselves, but by their conquerors. 7. In their Berlin bunker on the 20th of April, the Nazi grandees, having congratulated Hitler on his birthday, avowed their lasting loyalty and said what for most of them would be their final farewells, were chafing at the bit to depart before the roads out of the capital became blocked. Goebbels apart, hardly any were anxious to join their leader on the funeral pyre. Whatever their long-standing rhetoric about fighting or dying, when it came down to it, they thought predominantly about saving their own skins. Goering's copious belongings were packed and on their way to Berchtesgaden. He had sent his wife and family to relative safety there some weeks earlier. His ranch at Karen Hall, north of Berlin, was now deserted and waiting to be detonated. A few weeks later, he was telling Allied interrogators that until late in the day he had thought Germany might be able to fight to a stalemate. Now he was off, to await an uncertain end, but certainly not self-immolation in the Berlin catacombs. Speer headed north to Hamburg, though he felt he had not properly said goodbye to the man who had dominated his life for more than a decade, and with whom, even now, he could not completely break the ties which had bound them together. To remedy this, he was to make an arduous and pointless, fleeting return to the bunker on the 23rd of April. Perhaps he was even now thinking that, once the end had come, all might not be lost for him, and hoped that Hitler would anoint him as his successor. To Speer's dismay, Hitler could scarcely bring himself to offer more than a perfunctory goodbye. Himmler was also on his way north, and set to continue his clandestine dealings with Count Bernadotte, in the hope of extracting something out of the disaster for himself even at the end. In his desperation, he was even willing to meet a prominent member of the Jewish World Congress and to agree to the release of female Jews from Ravensbrück concentration camp. He was also ready to make a promise he could not have kept even if he had wanted to, that no more Jews would be killed. He had ordered the SS to fight to the last and never capitulate. 
he himself, was contemplating doing precisely the opposite of what he had preached. Bormann, the eminence grise of the regime, must have been aware by now that his leadership of the party chancellery had become little more than an empty title. Few Gauleiter were even in a position to receive his directives. He could not leave the bunker, that was clear. But once Hitler was dead, which could not be far off, he had every intention of escaping both his own demise and the clutches of the Russians. Goebbels, the last of the quartet, who, beneath Hitler, had dominated internal politics in the last months, and ensured that the regime continued to operate until the end, had, whatever his public rhetoric, and notwithstanding his private flights of fantasy, clearly seen what was coming for quite some time. He continued to do all he could to help in the fight to fend off the Soviets. Even on Hitler's birthday, he laid on Berlin buses to carry soldiers out to the Oder Front. But he knew it would be in vain. By then, he had had his personal belongings destroyed. The originals of his diaries he had diligently kept for over twenty years were among them. However, he ensured that his daily record of his role alongside Hitler in Germany's lost but heroic fight, what he saw as his lasting legacy for future generations, would be preserved for posterity by sending out three copies into hiding. He and his wife, Magda, then made ready to move into the Führer bunker to join Hitler. They knew that in doing so, they were taking the decision to end their lives. They had already decided to kill their six children. By the next morning, the 21st of April, the government district in the heart of Berlin was being shelled. There was a rumble like distant thunder, but unceasing and growing louder by the hour. The Soviets were now only about 12 kilometers away to the east. As the encirclement of the city advanced, a unit of the Red Army liberated some 3,000 prisoners, mainly sick women and children, left behind in Sachsenhausen concentration camp when most of the prisoners had been marched off on the 20th of April. By the 24th of April, Busse's Ninth Army was caught in a tightening Soviet vice. Colonel General Heinrichi's warnings of this fate had been ignored by Hitler and his military advisers. Heinrichi would eventually have the dubious distinction of being the last of Hitler's generals to be dismissed on the night of the 28th to the 29th of April when he finally refused to carry out an utterly impossible order from Keitel and Jodl. By then his army was breaking up in a westward stampede of soldiers desperate to avoid Soviet captivity. The constant interference in his command by unrealistic orders had ultimately proved too much for him. But there was also a personal grievance. He felt deeply insulted at the way Keitel and Jodl had treated him. Unworthy, he thought, of the manner in which the commander-in-chief of an army group should be addressed, and unbearable for an officer with forty years of service behind him. Heinrichi's stance even in these last days, and that of Field Marshal Keitel and General Jodl, said much about Hitler's generals. When Heinrichi objected to Keitel and Jodl about the minimal prospects of the slightest success in what his army group Vistula was expected to undertake— he was simply told it was his duty to rescue the Führer. Hitler's main advisers, he felt, either could not or would not accept the true situation and realized that the Battle of Berlin was lost. But Heinrichi did not offer his resignation. Instead, as he stated in a description of the battle he compiled less than a month later, the bond of my duty of obedience as a soldier, the impossibility of rejecting orders to save the supreme commander of the Wehrmacht, meant that he felt unable to refuse without committing treason. After the OKW had placed the saving of the Fuhrer at the head of all orders, this took precedence over other military considerations. For Keitel, however, even Hitler's death would not prevent the continuation of the struggle. If Berlin could not be saved, he suggested to Heinrichi, the army group should carry on the fight in northern Germany. Enrique retorted that this was neither economically nor militarily possible. The will to fight on the part of the soldiers was already falling sharply and would collapse altogether with the news of the death of the Führer. Keitel answered that this news would therefore have to be delayed as long as possible. 
Further resistance was necessary in order to enter negotiations with the Western enemies. Germany still possessed numerous bargaining counters, such as Denmark, Norway, and Bohemia, that would serve as a good basis for negotiation. Henrique thought Keitel was completely detached from reality, though his awareness of the preparations being made by Donitz in Plon, in line with Hitler's orders, to continue the fight in the northern half of the country as long as possible, made him take the proposition seriously. On the 25th of April, the Reich was cut in two as American and Soviet troops met at Torgau on the Elbe. By noon that day, Berlin was completely encircled. The city center now came under increasingly heavy artillery bombardment. Berlin had been declared a fortress to be defended to the last. The forces to do so were weak indeed compared with the Soviet behemoth. But Dönitz was among the military leaders who took the view that the battle for Berlin was necessary, whatever the cost to the civilian population, since they would otherwise be deported to Russia without any attempt to prevent their undergoing such a fate. As it was, civilians had to experience the misery, suffering, and death that accompanied the relentless destruction of their city. Soviet troops had to fight their way practically block by block, but amid intense and bitter street fighting, they pressed inexorably on towards the epicenter of Nazi rule and the Reich Chancellery. They knew Hitler was there. A combination of near hysteria and outright fatalism had by then caught hold in the bunker. Hitler had placed illusory hopes, not diffused by Keitel and Jodl, who knew better but were still fearful of giving him bad news, in the newly and hastily constituted 12th Army under General Walter Wenck, fighting on the Elbe, and especially in a counteroffensive to the north of Berlin, led by SS Obergruppenführer Felix Steiner's Panzer Corps. When he had learned on the 22nd of April that Steiner's attack had not taken place, the pent-up feelings had exploded in a torrential outburst of elemental fury. Hitler admitted openly for the first time that the war was lost. He told his shocked entourage that he was determined to stay in Berlin and take his life at the last moment. He seemed to be abdicating power and responsibility, saying he had no further orders for the Wehrmacht. He even implied that Goering might have to negotiate with the enemy. But astonishingly, he had pulled himself together again, refused to concede a grain of his authority, and exuded, as always, undiluted optimism in his military briefing just moments after speaking privately about his imminent death and the burning of his body. The act, which had slipped for a brief moment, was back in place. Keitel was sent to Venk's headquarters with orders, totally unfeasible, but temporarily cheering up Hitler once more, to march on Berlin. The high command of the Wehrmacht was now split between Krapnitz, near Potsdam, later moving north until finally based with Dönitz at Plön, and Berchtesgarten. Despite the despairing outburst during his temporary breakdown, Hitler was still in no mood to relinquish control. Goering learnt this when, mistaking the information he had received about Hitler's eruption as denoting incapacity or unwillingness to lead any longer, and assuming therefore that on the basis of the long-standing succession law he should take over, he was peremptorily dismissed from all his offices and put under house arrest at the Berghof. Bormann, an arch-enemy for years of the Reich Marshal, could savor a last triumph. Even now the generals in charge of Berlin's defense would not contemplate capitulation. When General Kurt von Tippelskirch arrived on the 27th of April to take over the 21st Army, hastily put together from whatever units could be found, he had a long conversation with Heinrichi, with whom he had served in Russia, about the position of Army Group Vistula. They acknowledged that every day brought further immense destruction to what remained of the Reich. Only capitulation could prevent it. Yet such a decision was still impossible, Tippelskirch argued. It would mean acting against the will of the Führer, and Jodl had recently emphasized that negotiations were impossible as long as Hitler lived. Moreover, an attempt to capitulate would be unsuccessful. 
the mass of soldiers would refuse to obey orders, to hand themselves over and start on the road to Siberia, and would seek to find their own way home. The enemy would then claim the conditions of capitulation had not been met. The war would continue. So would the destruction of the land. The soldiers would be taken prisoner anyway. No good would therefore have been served. But the army group would bear the disgrace of capitulation and desertion of the Fuhrer. The fight must therefore go on, with the aim of bringing the armies gradually so far to the west, that ultimately they would fall not into Russian, but into Anglo-American captivity. In this reasoning, plainly, the interests of the army exceeded all other concerns. Away from the madhouse and the bunker, the remnants of government were in terminal disarray. Most ministerial staffs, with the big exception of the propaganda ministry, had been relocated to southern Germany, beginning in March, leaving no more than skeletal arrangements in Berlin. A number of ministers and their staffs had followed in April, welcoming the opportunity to leave. Berlin was now a government capital without government apparatus. The head of the Reich Chancellery, Hans Heinrich Lammers, had left for Berchtesgaden at the end of March. He went on leave, claiming high blood pressure. In fact, he had suffered a severe, nervous breakdown. He had for long served little real purpose. The Reich Chancellery's function had, since the previous summer, been hardly more than residual, as its powers had drained off to Bormann in the party chancellery. In its last days, its acting head was the state secretary, Friedrich Wilhelm Kritzinger, who was left with the purely theoretical task of coordinating the other ministries and the remainder of the Reich Chancellery civil servants from Berlin. Asked after the end of the war why he had not resigned, Kritzinger seemed scarcely to understand the question. As a long-standing civil servant, I was duty-bound in loyalty to the state, he answered, expressing shame at its policies towards Jews and Poles. Even on the morning of the 21st of April, as Soviet rockets exploded in the government district of Berlin, civil servants continued to work, doing nothing useful, at their desks. When asked further why Lammers continued to do all he could for the war effort, Kutzinger replied, Well... There had to be some sort of organization. Think just of food for the people. That functioned to the end. Would it have been better had it not functioned to the end? His interrogator retorted. It was war, shrugged Kritzinger. On the evening of the 20th of April, Kritzinger gave instructions to the ministerial staffs still in Berlin to leave with all haste for the South by road. That proved impossible. A new order was given to leave next day by air. Not enough planes were available. It was then suggested that they should go to the north instead. Exasperated by now, the finance minister, Graf Schwerin von Krossig, who in previous weeks had pressed Goebbels and Speer to take action that would pave the way for the Western Allies to come to terms, demanded a clear order of the Führer, saying he had no intention of being hanged en route by the SS as a deserter. When, after much trying, Kritzinger managed through Bormann to obtain a recommendation from Hitler for the ministers to head north, it was not enough for Krosig. He now insisted on a written Führer order. Eventually, Kritzinger succeeded in persuading Bormann to get Hitler, for whom this was scarcely the highest priority at the moment, to sign a written order to head for Eutin, far to the north, in Schleswig-Holstein. Amid such panicky improvisation, the ministers of the Reich, with a long and proud tradition of state service, fled the capital, and a head of state set on self-destruction. With Hitler's earlier orders to split the Reich into northern and southern sectors coming into effect, there were by now, effectively, six centers of government in Germany. Hitler, in his Berlin bunker, his authority real and unchallenged, where it could still reach, the high command of the Wehrmacht, itself now divided between Krupnitz and Berchtesgaden, parts of the Reich cabinet based in the south and the remainder in the north under Donitz. Goering still presided until ousted by Hitler on the 23rd of April over his own remaining Luftwaffe command in Berchtesgaden, 
while Himmler had what was left of his SS and police power base in the Lübeck area in the north. There was no semblance any longer of a central government of the Reich. In the provinces, too, or what was left of them under German control, the regime was also imploding, accompanied inevitably by untrammeled violence in its very last days. On the 20th of April, the regional administration in Augsburg was told that the banks would run out of money within a week. Wages and salaries could then no longer be paid. No banknotes had been received from the Reichsbank for a week. The Bavarian Finance Ministry was printing money, but it would not be ready for eight to ten days, and it was itself awaiting a transport of 300 million Reichmarks from Berlin, after which Swabia could be allocated its share. Whether that happened is unclear, but Swabia had not much longer to limp on before Augsburg was surrendered to the Americans on the 28th of April. Near chaos was reported in late April by the Kreisleiter in the small town of Lindau, on the Bodensee at the western tip of Bavaria, close to the Swiss border. Drunken German soldiers were rampaging through the streets and looting property. Huge numbers of refugees and deserters had poured into the town. The Kreisleiter saw permission to restore order by having the first hundred seized and shot. Permission, mercifully, does not appear to have been granted. Lindau survived a few more days before surrendering on the 2nd of May. Violence also preceded the capitulation, without a fight, of Regensburg, the capital of the Upper Palatinate. The tone was set by Gauleiter Ruckdeschel, who had engineered Gauleiter Wachtler's execution. Ruckdeschel and the Nazi leadership in the city were determined to fight on. In a tense meeting in the city's velodrome on the evening of the 22nd of April, called by the Kreisleiter, Ruckdeschel declared that the city would be defended to the last stone. His speech, broadcast locally, merely succeeded in stirring up fear and dismay. The Americans were only a short distance away, and few people were prepared to go down in flames as the enemy took the town. Next morning, some women started going round shops, spreading the word that there was going to be another meeting that evening in Multkaplatz, in the city center, to demand that Regensburg be handed over to the Allies without a fight. Nearly a thousand people, many of them women with children, turned out. As the crowd started to become restless, it was addressed by a prominent member of the cathedral chapter, Dom Prediger Dr. Johann Mayer, who, however, was able to say only a few words before he and several others were arrested. When Ruck Deschel heard what had happened, he ordered that Mayer and the other ringleaders be hanged. A rapidly summoned drumhead court lost no time in pronouncing the death sentence on Mayer and a 70-year-old warehouse worker, Josef Zirkel. They were hanged in Multkaplatz in the early hours of the 24th of April. The terror apparatus had still functioned. But with the Americans on the doorstep, the town's military commandant, its head of regional government, the Kreisleiter, and the head of police, suddenly vanished into the night. Gauleiter Ruckdeschel had also disappeared. The way was all at once clear for the emissaries to hand over the city on the 27th of April, still largely undamaged by the war. In other parts of Bavaria, too, representatives of the regime were determined to leave the scene with shows of vengeful, last-minute murderous violence, as futile as they were horrific. The Nazis, as they knew, were on the way out. But their capacity for taking violent revenge on their political opponents continued. The murder of more than 40 people in different parts of the region, with the Americans in some cases only hours away, was prompted by the proclamation over a captured radio transmitter on the outskirts of Munich on the morning of the 28th of April of the Freedom Action of Bavaria, a courageous but ultimately counterproductive localized rising against the Nazi regime in its final days. The action was led by three officers in locally stationed Wehrmacht units, Captain Ruprecht Gerngross, Major Alois Braun, and Lieutenant Otto Heinz Leiling. It aimed at impressing the Allies that in Bavaria, at least, the Nazi regime did not represent the only face of Germany, and sought to achieve the restoration of traditional Bavarian values and the rebuilding of the province. It was, unquestionably, 
a brave mistake, at this juncture. An encouraging long-standing opponent of the regime in a number of Bavarian towns and villages to open shows of defiance, it was unwittingly signing their death warrant. There was little to be achieved militarily or politically by the rising. Villages, towns and cities were in most cases being handed over through often bold maneuvering at the appropriate moment by those on the spot. It was inconceivable that an attempted rising, planned and executed in little more than amateurish fashion, could bring an immediate end to the fighting in Bavaria. Instead, it merely served as a provocation for local Nazis still wielding power to take murderous revenge on their opponents, and the process settling some long-standing vendettas. The Gauleiter of Munich, Upper Bavaria, Paul Giesler, now a cornered fanatic, was behind the worst of the violence. Five men in Munich were taken out on his orders and shot. In Altotting, a Catholic pilgrimage center, the Christleiter led an SS squad which shot five people, local opponents for many years, on a list he had rapidly drawn up. When his hit squad reported the execution of another three in neighboring Berghausen, he shouted, What? Only three? The worst outrage was in the small mining town of Pensburg, somewhat incongruously situated in beautiful alpine scenery between Munich and Garmisch Partenkirchen. Local Nazi leaders wanted to blow up the coal mine, heart of the town's economic life, and the waterworks and bridges in the vicinity. To block the destruction, former Social Democrats and Communists participated in an attempt to take over the coal mine and depose the Nazi town leadership. It was not long, however, before the officer of a nearby Wehrmacht unit had the leaders of the revolt, including the former SPD mayor, arrested. With the deposed Nazi mayor, he then drove to Munich, where Gauleiter Giesler peremptorily gave orders that they were to be shot immediately without trial. On return to Pittsburgh, about 6 p.m., the sentences for treason were read out, and the executions of the seven prisoners were promptly carried out. A Werwolf squad, around 100 strong, given the task by Giesler of dealing with the politically unreliable, meanwhile hastened down to Pittsburgh, and that evening hanged a further eight people, among them two women, at different points of the town, placing notices round their necks declaring that they were traitors and in the service of the enemy. The next day, the Americans arrived. In Berlin, hardly any people were aware of the subterranean drama in the bunker. They had far more pressing things on their minds. They desperately wanted peace, an end with horror, rather than a horror without end, as the well-worn phrase had it. They had equally desperately wanted the Americans to get to Berlin before the Russians. Even that hope had disappeared. All that was left was fear of what was coming and the desire to survive. The streets were empty, apart from some queues of people outside shops trying to buy the food they needed for a long siege. Most were by now living in cellars, like wood lice, creeping into the farthest corners, constantly hungry as rations dwindled, without heating because of coal shortages, with little or no gas or electricity, having to stand in long queues to collect water in buckets from street pumps. People had the feeling that they were no longer governed. No orders anymore. No news. Nothing. No swine is bothered about us, as one woman expressed it. Without electricity, few by now could receive news by radio. As even the last of the two-page broadsheets that passed for newspapers disappeared, they had to rely upon word of mouth to glean fragments of often inaccurate information. At least they were spared the headlines of the People's Observer, still printed in Munich until the 28th of April, and proclaiming in its headlines that Germany stands firm and loyal to the Führer. The Führer, defender of Berlin. Or, the Führer inflames Berlin's fighting spirit. Anyone expressing such sentiments on the streets of Berlin was thought to be mad. But bodies hanging with notices round their necks proclaiming them to have been traitors were a warning not to speak out recklessly, and still to take extreme care of those still standing behind the fatally wounded regime. As long as the roads out of Berlin had remained open, thousands, many of them pale, worn-out women and their exhausted children, 
tried to escape to the west, on foot, in horse-drawn wagons, pushing wheelbarrows and prams containing remnants of their last few possessions. Then, the last escape routes were shut off. There was now nothing to do but wait, in dread, in cellars, wanting the end, but fearing what it meant. In the last week of April, the worst fears of many Berliners started to be realized, as soldiers of the Red Army arrived. In the bunker, too, the end was near. The final act in the drama had begun. The regime's ruthlessness in its own death agonies struck home within the small bunker community itself. When Eva Brown's brother-in-law, the dissolute and brutal Hermann Fegelein, an SS leader close to Himmler, tried to flee, and, after being dragged back, was summarily sentenced to death and executed. Fegelein was no more than a substitute for the real arch-traitor in Hitler's eyes in the last days of his life, Heinrich Himmler. The Reichsführer SS had, it seems, like Goering, taken news of Hitler's outburst on the 22nd of April as an effective abdication. He had finally cast off the caution which had dogged him throughout his dealings with Bernadotte and offered to capitulate in the West, though not in the East. This, for Hitler, was the ultimate betrayal. In his last volcanic explosion of rage, he had Himmler, too, thrown out of the party and ordered his arrest. But his reach no longer stretched far enough to have the Reichsfuhrer SS, in the north of the country, brought back to Berlin and subjected to a final disgrace and fearsome execution. With Himmler's betrayal, it seemed as if the fight had gone out of Hitler. In the last act of the drama, he married Eva Braun, his partner of many years, who had decided to end her life alongside him, and drew up his testament. In its political section, it included the names of the ministers in the successor government. Dönitz, his fanatical support throughout recognized, also in sending sailors to fight in Berlin's last battle, was to become Reich president. Goebbels, Bormann, Hanka, Zauer, Giesler, and Schorner, diehards all of them, were rewarded for their loyalty and zealotry. There was no place for Speer. The task done and the Soviets almost literally at the gates, all that was left was for Hitler and Eva Braun to make the last preparations to commit suicide. In the mid-afternoon of the 30th of April, Hitler shot himself and Eva Braun took poison. Dönitz, up in Plön, in Schleswig-Holstein, did not learn of Hitler's death until next morning, not long after he had sent a message, presuming him to be still alive, professing his continued unconditional loyalty. The Wehrmacht and the German people, those who were listening, were not informed until the late evening of the 1st of May that Hitler had fallen at the head of the heroic defenders of the Reich capital. A propaganda lie to the last. Josef and Magda Goebbels had committed suicide that day after poisoning their six children. The following day, the 2nd of May, the German troops in Berlin were ordered to cease fighting. The Soviet hammer and sickle flag fluttered over the Reichstag. The war was still not over. Outside Berlin, fighting continued. But with Hitler's death, the insuperable obstacle to capitulation was removed. What had been impossible as long as he was alive became immediately realizable as soon as he was dead. Nothing demonstrates more plainly the extent to which his personality held together the regime. The bonds with his charismatic community and the fragmented structures of rule that had existed throughout the Third Reich and guaranteed his own unchallengeable power, had allowed it, at terrible cost to the German people, to continue to operate until the Russians were at the very portals of the Reich Chancellery. 9. Liquidation Since the Western enemies continued their support of the Soviets, the fight against the Anglo-Americans, according to the order of the Grand Admiral, carries on. Head of Naval Operations Staff, the 4th of May, 1945. Only two or three years earlier, Hitler's death would have stunned the nation. 
before the invasion of the Soviet Union plunged Germany into a long, attritional, and ultimately unwinnable war, the sense of loss would have been immeasurable in every corner of the country. The reactions to Stauffenberg's assassination attempt in July 1944 show that even then, if Hitler had been killed, the shockwaves would have been enormous. By the evening of the 1st of May 1945, however, when the news of Hitler's death was broadcast, few tears were shed. There were, of course, exceptions. The crew of a minesweeper were said to have been close to tears when they heard the announcement, seeing it as the final heroic tones of a long war. An NCO based near Prague recorded the lengthy silence and feelings of dismay that greeted the news in his unit, noting that the death of the Fuhrer was regarded positively as an heroic gesture by the soldiers, at least by the majority, he added. Whether the assessment was accurate cannot be known. It is equally impossible to ascertain the common reaction among the soldiers to the proclamation issued on the 3rd of May by the most Nazified of all generals, Field Marshal Schorner, to his army group center, largely located now in Bohemia. Schorner described Hitler as a martyr to his idea and his belief, and as a soldier of the European mission, who had died fighting against Bolshevism to his last breath. Probably it seems fair to surmise most soldiers, wherever they were based, were concerned less with the death of the Führer than with their own struggle to escape falling into the clutches of the Red Army. There were indeed some fanatical supporters of Hitler in every military unit to the end, though usually by now in a minority. One officer recalled how, hearing the news that the Führer had fallen, a single young soldier leapt to his feet, raised his arm and shouted, Heil Hitler, while the others carried on eating their soup as if nothing had happened. There must have been a spectrum of emotions at the news among generals, ranging from relief to sorrow, mingled with a sense of the inevitable. Führer fallen, terrible, and yet expected, noted one former front commander, Colonel General Georg Hans Reinhardt, in his diary. When a small group of senior officers, gathered at the field headquarters of the 3rd Panzer Army in Mecklenburg, heard the announcement, there was no sign that any of them was moved. Even among senior officers in British captivity, divided opinions on Hitler were voiced when they heard of his death. A tragic personality, surrounded by an incompetent circle of criminals. A historical figure, whose achievements would only be recognized in a future age, summarized the overall view, as they debated whether, having sworn an oath of allegiance to him personally, they were now freed from their military oath. Among the civilian population, most Germans were too preoccupied with fending off hunger, eking out an existence in the ruins of their homes, avoiding marauding Soviet soldiers, or piecing together broken lives under enemy occupation to pay much attention to the demise of the Führer. A mother in Sella was concerned with a practical issue, whether her children should still greet people with Heil Hitler now that he was dead. I told them they could continue to say Heil Hitler because Hitler remained the Führer to the last, was her judgment. But if that seems odd to them, they should say good day or good morning. In Göttingen, which had been in Allied hands for three weeks, a woman observed that those who had effusively cheered Hitler a few years earlier now scarcely noticed his end. No one mourned him. Hitler is dead, and we, we act as if it's of no concern to us, as if it's a matter of the most indifferent person in the world, wrote a woman in Berlin, a long-standing opponent of National Socialism. What has changed? Nothing, except that we have forgotten Herr Hitler during the inferno of the last days. Increasing numbers had come to realize in the last months of the war that Hitler, more than anyone, had been responsible for the misery that had afflicted them. A pity that Hitler hasn't been sent to Siberia, one woman in Hamburg wrote, but the swine was so cowardly as to put a bullet through his head instead. Criminals and gamblers have led us, and we have let them lead us like sheep to the slaughter, was the view of one young woman in Berlin, exposed 
to the tender mercies of Red Army soldiers, and not yet aware of Hitler's death. Now hatred is blazing in the wretched mass of the people. No tree is high enough for him, it was said this morning at the water pump about Adolf. The earlier idolization, the personalized attribution to Hitler of praise and adulation for all that had seemed at one time positive and successful in the Third Reich, was already being transformed into demonization of the man on whom all blame for what had gone wrong could be focused. For ordinary people, concerned only with getting through the misery, Hitler's death on the face of it changed nothing. The same was true for soldiers in their billets, still serving on the front, and for naval and Luftwaffe crews, some of whom had been drafted into the increasingly desperate fight on land. Indeed, as Grand Admiral Dönitz took up the reins of office as President of the German Reich, continuity rather than a break with the immediate past seemed on the surface the order of the day. Nevertheless, a fundamental change had actually taken place. It was as if a bankrupt organization had, with the departure of a managing director who refused point-blank to accept realities, been placed in administration, left with the mere task of winding up orders and the process of liquidation. With Hitler gone, the chief and unyielding barrier to capitulation was removed. When Bormann's wireless message had informed Donitz at 6.35 p.m. on the 30th of April that Hitler had named him as his successor, there was no indication that the dictator was, by then, dead. Dönitz had, however, been given immediate full powers to take whatever steps were needed in the current situation. He felt an enormous sense of relief that he could act, immediately summoning Keitel, Jodl, and Himmler to discuss the situation. But remaining unsure, Dönitz telegraphed the bunker in the early hours of the 1st of May, a telegraph left unmentioned in his memoirs, to profess his unconditional loyalty to the Fuhrer, he presumed still alive, declaring his intention to do all possible, while knowing it to be a futile aim, to get him out of Berlin, and declaring, ambiguously, that he would bring this war to an end as the unique heroic struggle of the German people demands. Only later that morning did Donitz receive Bormann's message that the testament was in force. On this clear news of Hitler's death, Donitz now felt finally that his hands were free. As long as Hitler had lived, Donitz had seen himself bound to him as head of state and supreme commander of the Wehrmacht by his oath of military obedience, which the Grand Admiral saw, like most of his generation, who had been schooled as officers, as a sacred commitment. Beyond that, he had totally accepted, as had most leading figures in the military, the leadership principle that had been the basis of Hitler's authority in the party, then, in the state, and in his military command, throughout the Third Reich. He had consequently, and consistent with his unbending principles, refused all considerations of capitulation, and upheld the fanatical continuation of the struggle as long as Hitler was alive. Immediately that he knew Hitler was dead, however, he felt in a position to contemplate a negotiated end to a lost war. There could be no plainer illustration of the absolute centrality to the catastrophic continuation of the war, not just of the person of the Führer, but of the structures of rule and mentalities that underpinned Hitler's domination. Even now there was a process of liquidation of the war, not an immediate end. Donitz's proclaimed aim on the 1st of May, to rescue the German people from destruction through Bolshevism, denoted an attempt to give meaning to the continued fight in the East while looking to a negotiated end in the West. All at once, therefore, the question of capitulation, though not in the East, was a real and urgent one. Could general capitulation be avoided even now? Could the Western powers, even at this stage, through partial capitulations, be persuaded to join forces with the Wehrmacht to fight Bolshevism? Could some terms favorable to sustaining the Reich as a political unity be attained? Could a deal be struck that would save the German troops on the Eastern Front from Soviet captivity? The end was plainly imminent. But whereas Hitler had ruled out capitulation totally, and was prepared to take everything into the abyss with him, the new Donuts administration, 
concerned itself from the beginning with the type of surrender that, it thought, could potentially be negotiated and still stave off the worst, submission to Bolshevism. And whereas Hitler, at least until the visibly crumbling days before his death, had been able to depend upon residual loyalties backed by a high dosage of terror and repression to hold the fading regime together, Dönitz could rely upon neither personal standing nor the backing of a mass party or huge police apparatus, and was left with little at his disposal beyond the shrinking framework of military leadership, a restricted intelligence network, and the residues of ministerial bureaucracy. Who is this Herr Dönitz, General of the Waffen-SS, Obergruppenführer Felix Steiner, contemptuously asked on hearing that the Grand Admiral was to be the new head of state? My forces and I are not bound by oath to him. I will negotiate on my own footing with the English at my rear. Of the quartet beneath Hitler, and leaving aside military leadership, on whom the governance of the Reich since the previous July had heavily rested, only Speer, though omitted from Hitler's ministerial list in favor of his arch-rival, Zauer, was retained in the Donitz administration. As economics minister, he was, however, in charge of little but economic ruins. Goebbels, the designated Reich Chancellor in the ministerial list drawn up by Hitler, was alone among the quadrumvirate, enacting in accord with the Führer's imperative of going down with the Reich in an heroic end. And even Goebbels had entertained the prospect of a localized capitulation after Hitler's death, committing suicide after trying and failing, together with Bormann, to negotiate an arrangement with Marshal Zhukov in Berlin. Bormann, the nominated party minister, was disinclined, like most others in Hitler's entourage, to end his life in a Berlin catacomb, and fled from the bunker as soon as he could, supposedly on his way to join Dönitz in Plön. He managed to go only a short distance from the ruins of the Reich Chancellery, before swallowing a poison capsule to end his life in the early hours of the 2nd of May, to avoid capture by the Soviets. Himmler, in disgrace after being stripped by Hitler of all his powers, following his treachery, was initially hopeful of finding a position under Donitz and playing a prominent role in the coming combined struggle against Bolshevism of the Western powers in unison with the Reich, but was refused office in the new administration. Dönitz, as previous chapters have indicated, had proved himself one of the most fanatical Wehrmacht commanders in his backing of Hitler's determination to fight on to the last. I know you don't believe me, but I must again tell you my innermost conviction, he informed a colleague in March. The Führer is always right. His unswerving loyalty to Hitler had earned him the appellation Hitler Youth Quicks, named after the hero of the well-known propaganda film. A sign of his undiluted support had been to dispatch more than 10,000 sailors, equipped only with light arms, to Berlin on the 25th of April to serve in the futile struggle for the Reich capital. By then, Dönitz was already acting as Hitler's delegate, with plenipotentiary powers over party and state, though not over the Wehrmacht in its entirety in northern Germany. At Himmler's treachery at the end of April, Dönitz was relied upon by Hitler to act with lightning speed and hardness of steel against all traitors in the North German area without exception. Hitler, who had long regarded most army generals with little more than contempt, valued Dönitz highly and acknowledged his unwavering support by singling out the Navy for praise in its sense of honor, refusal to surrender, and fulfillment of duty unto death when composing his testament. Hitler's nomination of Dönitz to be his successor as head of state, though with the reconstituted title of Reich President in abeyance since 1934, and not Führer, did not then come to those in high positions in the regime as the surprise it was to those further from the center of power, or that it might appear to be in distant retrospect. In any case, Hitler was short of options. Goering, the designated successor for more than a decade, and until his disgrace commander-in-chief of the Luftwaffe, had been dismissed from all his offices following his betrayal on the 23rd of April, 
and was in Berchtesgaden under house arrest. Whether he could have commanded authority over all the armed forces is in any case, by this time, extremely doubtful. Himmler's only significant experience of military command had been as chief of the replacement army since July 1944, and then, in early 1945, a sobering one as a brief and unsuccessful commander-in-chief of Army Group Vistula. He had also been peremptorily dismissed from all offices in Hitler's thunderous rage at the end of April. Keitel was no more than the subservient executor of Hitler's orders, and held in contempt by many within the Wehrmacht. The only army general in whom Hitler had any confidence at the end was Field Marshal Schorner, but he was still a front commander, leading the beleaguered army group center, fighting in the former Czechoslovakia. Though much admired by Hitler, Schorner was heartily disliked by many other generals, and, even had he been available, would have been unthinkable as head of state. That left Dönitz. The Grand Admiral, who made no secret, even after the war, of the mutual respect between him and Hitler, claimed in an early post-war interrogation that he was chosen as the senior member of the armed forces, with the necessary authority to put in effect the capitulation. Since Hitler could not end the war, he asserted, someone else had to do it. This war could only be finished by a soldier who had the necessary authority with the armed forces. The point was to ensure that the army would obey, when told to capitulate. The Führer knew that I had the authority. Years later, Dönitz added a gloss. I assume that Hitler had nominated me because he wished to clear the way to enable an officer of the armed forces to put an end to the war. That this assumption was incorrect I did not find out until the winter of 1945-46 in Nuremberg, when for the first time I heard the provisions of Hitler's will, in which he demanded that the struggle be continued. Whether Dönitz at the time understood that the reason for his appointment was to enable him to bring about a capitulation is highly doubtful. Nothing in Hitler's stance during the last days or in his dealings with Dönitz implied that he was handing over power to seek the capitulation, which he himself could not undertake. That would have been totally out of character for Hitler, whose entire career had been based on the imperative that there would be no cowardly capitulation as in 1918, and who had on a number of occasions expressed the view that the German people did not deserve to survive him. On the contrary, Hitler saw in Dönitz precisely the military leader whose fanaticism was needed in order to continue the fight to the bitter end. Dönitz did, in fact, immediately deviate from Hitler's expressed wish that the struggle should on no account be abandoned, and began to explore avenues towards negotiating an end to the war short of complete and unconditional surrender on all fronts. But this was almost certainly not a result of misunderstanding the reason for his appointment as head of state and supreme commander of the Wehrmacht. It was simply the need to bow to military and political reality now that Hitler was dead. The end was near. Most of the Reich was under enemy occupation. The population was war-weary in the extreme. Loyalties were fragmenting rapidly, and the Wehrmacht was largely destroyed. Its remnants on the verge of total defeat. There was little alternative from Dönitz's point of view, now burdened with the responsibility not just for the Navy, but for the entire Reich, to try even at this late stage to negotiate an end which would be less than total disaster. In a post-war interrogation several months later, Field Marshal Keitel claimed that as soon as Hitler was dead, more or less the principal point was this, if somebody else has the responsibility, then the only thing to do was to seek an immediate armistice and attempt to save whatever can be saved. This was disingenuous. No immediate armistice was sought. Dönitz, who later asserted that his government program was clear, that he wanted to end the war as quickly as possible, but above all to save as many lives as he could, chose rather to prolong the fight for the time being on both eastern and western fronts in an attempt to buy time to bring back the troops from the east. 
He had also not altogether given up hopes of splitting the coalition and winning the Western powers for a continued war against Bolshevism. In doing so, he did enable hundreds of thousands of soldiers, and a far smaller number of civilians to avoid Soviet captivity. But he added a further week of death and suffering to the immense human cost of the war. 2. For those civilians imminently exposed to the prospect of Soviet conquest, the mortal fear and dread was completely unaltered by Hitler's death. Many, in any case, lacking radio, newspapers, and post, did not hear the news for days. One macabre way the deep anxiety manifested itself was in an epidemic of suicides in the closing weeks of the Third Reich, which continued into May as complete military defeat and enemy occupation loomed. Among the Nazi regime's rulers, suicide could be seen and portrayed as heroic self-sacrifice, eminently preferable to the cowardice of capitulation. This was, of course, how Hitler's own death was advertised. For military leaders, too, death at one's own hand was seen as a manly way out, rather than yielding and offering to surrender. In extreme cases, like that of Goebbels, there was the sense that after Germany's defeat there was nothing for him, his wife, or his children to live for. His life, stated Goebbels at the end, had no further value if it cannot be used in the service of the Führer and by his side. His wife, Magda, thought along the same lines, giving as justification for taking her own life and those of her children that the world to come after the Führer and National Socialism will no longer be worth living in. More prosaically, and for many, no doubt, the prime motive, Nazi leaders feared retribution at the hands of the victors, particularly the Russians. I do not wish to fall into the hands of enemies who, for the amusement of their whipped-up masses, will need a spectacle arranged by Jews, was Hitler's own inimitable way of expressing this fear. While most were prepared to take their chance and disappeared into hiding, or simply stayed where they were and waited to be arrested, a fair number of other leading Nazis and military leaders felt suicide was their only option. Bormann trying to flee from Berlin, and Himmler, Lai, and Goering in Allied custody were among those choosing to end their own lives, along with eight out of forty-one Gauleiter, and seven from forty-seven of the higher SS and police leaders, 53 out of 554 army generals, 14 of 98 Luftwaffe generals, and 11 from 53 admirals. For ordinary citizens, too, thoughts of suicide were commonplace. This was especially the case in Berlin and eastern parts of Germany, where despair and fear combined to encourage such thoughts. Many are getting used to the idea of putting an end to it. The demand for poison, a pistol, or other means of ending life is great everywhere, an SD report had already noted at the end of March. All Berliners know that the Russians will soon be in Berlin, and they see no alternative other than cyanide, one pastor had remarked around the same time. He blamed the rise in suicidal tendencies on the horror stories in Goebbels' propaganda about the behavior of the Soviets. This was undoubtedly a major contributing factor. But the propaganda had, as we have seen, some basis in fact, and tales of terrible experiences at the hands of Soviet soldiers, especially the rape of German women, circulated by word of mouth and independently of Goebbels' machinations. Women committed suicide rather than face the likelihood of being raped. Others killed themselves afterwards. More would have done so had they possessed the means. In Berlin, where suicide statistics, if incomplete, exist, the trend is plain to see. At the peak in April and May during the Battle of Berlin, 3,881 people killed themselves. Overall, in 1945, there were 7,057 suicides in the city. 3,996 of them women, compared with 2,108 in 1938 and 1,884 
in 1946. In Hamburg, by contrast, there were only 56 suicides in April 1945. In Bremen, flattened by repeated bombing, suicides rose markedly in 1945. But the level remained in fact lower than it had been in 1939. There was a sharp rise in Bavaria in the final phase of the war. Though the figure of 42 suicides in April and May 1945 was scarcely on a comparable scale with that of Berlin, and accountable at least in part by the disproportionate number of Nazi functionaries there who took their own lives. Some other parts of Western Germany also had modestly increased suicide rates in 1945, but nothing remotely comparable with those of Berlin. Plainly, the suicide wave was first and foremost a phenomenon of those parts of Germany where fear of occupation by the Red Army was most acute. Panic gripped the people in eastern localities as the Red Army approached. Along the front line, in numerous places, in Pomerania, Mecklenburg, Silesia, and Brandenburg, there were hundreds of suicides. No overall total can be calculated, but it is presumed to have been in the thousands, perhaps tens of thousands. In Demin, a town in western Pomerania of some 15,000 inhabitants before the war, but by this time also housing numerous refugees, more than 900 people, the majority of them women, committed suicide in the three days following the arrival of the Red Army on the 1st of May. There was enormous fear in Demin in the days before the Russians entered. The feeling of terror mounted as the frightening noise of Soviet tanks rolling into the town could be heard. German soldiers fled that morning, blowing up the bridges over the two local rivers as they went. White bedsheets were hung out of windows to offer surrender, though a group of Hitler youth fired at the Soviets. One man shot his wife and three children before blasting off a Panzerfaust, then hanging himself. Families barricaded themselves into their homes, blocking the doors with furniture. Then they heard loud foreign voices banging and kicking at the doors before Red Army soldiers, many looking very young, broke in, demanding watches and jewelry. The other ominous demand was Frau Komm. Plundering, marauding troops, often under the influence of drink, roamed the streets. The town's representatives were peremptorily shot. The houses of suspected Nazi party members were set on fire, and the flames spread, engulfing neighboring properties until much of the town center was burning. In the horror, women were paralyzed with the all-too-justified fear of being raped. They tried to hide, or dressed in men's clothes, but were all too often found. Many were raped numerous times. In this scene of Sodom and Gomorrah, as it appeared to one witness, terrified individuals decided on the instant to kill themselves, and sometimes their families, with whatever method was at hand, poison, shooting, hanging, or drowning in the local rivers, the Pena or the Tolensa. In one case, the death of thirteen family members is recorded. In another, a mother pushed her two tiny children in a pram while her six-year-old followed on his bike. Under a large oak tree on the edge of town, she poisoned her children, then tried to hang herself but was cut down by Soviet soldiers. She said she had seen propaganda posters claiming that the Russians killed children by putting an axe through their skull. There was something approaching mass hysteria among the townsfolk. Entire families headed for the river, tied themselves together, and plunged into the cold water. Many elderly people were among those who took their lives that way. For weeks afterwards, swollen corpses were found floating in the rivers. In some instances, panic-stricken women took their children by the hand and jumped into the water. One girl, eleven years old at the time, fleeing from her burning home, was dragged back by her grandmother as her mother suddenly grabbed her and made for the river bank. We all thought we were going to burn to death, she recalled, many years later. We had no hope left for life, and I myself, I had the feeling that this was the end of the world, this was the end of my life, and everyone in Demin felt like that. The rampaging of the Red Army and the gross maltreatment of the conquered German population were only gradually brought under control by the Soviet authorities once the war was over. 
But in the first days of May 1945, the war still continued. And so did the suffering. 3. Donitz's cabinet, fully formed on the 5th of May, bore only partial resemblance to the one nominated by Hitler. All that Dönitz had learned from Bormann, arising from Hitler's testament, was the names of three intended ministers, Bormann, Goebbels, and to replace Ribbentrop as foreign minister, Arthur Zeisinkvart, the Reich Commissar for the Netherlands. In establishing his administration, set up in the northernmost extremity of the Reich, in somewhat primitive accommodation in the Naval Academy at flensburg mervik after a hasty departure from Plön, as British troops approached, Dönitz had to presume that Bormann and Goebbels were dead or captured, while Seisingwart was involved in negotiations with the Allies about a partial capitulation, and also therefore unavailable to take up his nominated position. In any case, Dönitz was determined to form his own cabinet, not simply take over one prescribed for him. Nevertheless, continuity was the hallmark of the new government, what was later claimed to have been an unpolitical cabinet included several high-ranking SS officers and a party Gauleiter, Paul Wegener of the region Weser Ems. The Minister of the Interior, Wilhelm Stuckert, an SS Obergruppenführer, who had in effect run the ministry as Himmler's state secretary during the last months of the war, had been a participant in the notorious Wannsee Conference that in January 1942 had determined policy on the final solution of the Jewish question. Herbert Baca, the Minister for Agriculture, had the rank of an SS Gruppenführer, and had helped shape policies imposing starvation on occupied Soviet territories. Otto Ohlendorf, Deputy State Secretary in the Reich Economics Ministry, was an SS Gruppenführer who had formerly headed the SD Inland in the Reich Security Head Office, and had led Einstadtsgruppe D in the murder of hundreds of thousands of Jews. As late as the 16th of May, Ohlendorf was in discussion with Dönitz about reconstructing the security service, also for possible use by the occupying powers. In all, 230 of the 350 or so members of Dönitz's administrative personnel in Flensburg had belonged to the security services. There was no place for Himmler viewed as an obvious liability in any prospective dealings with the Western Allies. But it was easy to see why he thought he might have a part to play, and sought, after the 2nd of May, to enter the Dönitz government. He offered his services to Dönitz in any capacity, but, inquiring how the Wehrmacht regarded him, perhaps had his eye on taking over as war minister. Himmler argued that he would be crucial in the struggle against Bolshevism, and required only a brief audience with General Eisenhower or Field Marshal Montgomery to gain recognition of this. He was told in no uncertain terms, however, that every Englishman or American who thought for half a second of speaking to him would, in the next half a second, be swept away by public opinion in England and the USA. His treason against Hitler in the last days was reportedly also a reason why Dönitz rejected any involvement in his administration by Himmler. Dönitz finally broke off relations with him on the 6th of May, after which the once mighty and greatly feared police chief, as one prominent member of the Dönitz administration later put it, turned himself into a poor petitioner and disappeared without a trace. He fled in disgrace before being captured by the British in North Germany, escaping trial in a certain death sentence by swallowing a poison capsule in custody. Old survivors from pre-Hitler governments who had served throughout the Third Reich were the labor minister, Dr. Franz Selta, the transport minister, and Lutz Graf Schwerin von Krossig, the former finance minister, now elevated to chief minister, and also placed in charge of foreign affairs. Dr. Julius Dorpmuller, Reich transport minister since 1937, also continued in office. Speer was brought in to oversee what was optimistically termed Reconstruction. Not least, there was continuity in the military leadership. Dönitz's own replacement as head of the Navy was Admiral General Hans-Georg von Friedeberg, but the crucial positions as Chief of the High Command of the Wehrmacht and Head of the Wehrmacht Operations Staff 
were held, as before, by Field Marshal Keitel and Colonel General Jodl, who had made their way north to join Dönitz shortly after Hitler's death. In the days that followed, Keitel and Jodl, alongside Dönitz and Krosig, were the key players. The remainder had largely bit parts. Forming a cabinet had not been Dönitz's first priority on taking over the government, though he had been keen to appoint a foreign minister. He had wanted Hitler's first foreign minister, Konstantin von Neurath, but was unable to reach him. Instead, he gave the post to Krosik, whom he barely knew but had found impressive at a meeting in Plön at the end of April. Krosik had no obvious qualifications other than the interest he had shown in previous weeks in bombarding Goebbels in particular with wholly unrealistic propositions for seeking a negotiated settlement to the war. He was practically the only choice available to Donitz and carried no especially harmful baggage from the Hitler years. It was not just in personnel that there was no clean break with the immediate past. The old forms and structures were maintained. The organization of the high command of the Wehrmacht, as much of it as had survived, continued to function seamlessly. The Nazi party was neither banned nor dissolved. Pictures of Hitler still hung in government offices. The Heil Hitler greeting was used even now in the Wehrmacht, and summary courts, with their grisly sentences, were not abolished. Astonishingly, sailors were still being sentenced by court-martial and executed even after the signing of total capitulation. Mentalities, too, remained unaltered. Retaining the existence of the Reich by saving what could be saved was a central objective. Ribbentrop, like Himmler, had represented the unacceptable face of the old regime and was excluded by Dönitz from the new administration. But a letter from Ribbentrop to the new head of state, composed, though in the event it seems not sent, on the 2nd of May, probably in the vain hope that he would be invited to join the new administration, was clearly written with a view to influencing policy direction. The aim, wrote Ribbentrop, must be to give the Reich government under Dönitz's leadership the chance to rule from a free German territory. Because of the difficulty of the unconditional surrender demand, the attempt should be made to persuade Eisenhower and Montgomery that taking Schleswig-Holstein would be at a high price in Allied lives, and to imply that the British Army would someday need the Germans at its side in the fight against the Soviet Union. He suggested an offer to evacuate gradually the German presence in Scandinavia in return for retention of a Reich government in Schleswig-Holstein. This first step would slowly be extended, leaving behind the formula of unconditional surrender and enabling negotiations to take place with the Western Allies that would enable them to present an alibi acceptable to the Russians. The program in foreign policy would be to bring together all Germans in Europe without subjugation of other peoples and offering freedom of all nations in Europe and cooperation in upholding peace. At home, there would be an evolution in ideological questions where these might threaten peace. He saw only two possibilities for the future. The first would be complete occupation, internment of the Reich government, administration of the country by the Allies, and, in the foreseeable future, a return to a limited form of democracy under Allied tutelage, including Democrats, Communists, and Catholics. National Socialism would be eradicated, the Wehrmacht completely demolished, and the German people condemned to slavery for decades. Alternatively, through the attempt at a policy of cooperation with all nations, at least superficially also with Russia, and recognition of a Reich government and its program under Donitz's leadership, Germany would remain as a nation, and with it also the National Socialist system and a smaller Wehrmacht, thus paving the way for recovery for the German people. Ribbentrop, like Himmler, was soon disabused of his hopes of continuing his career. But variants of the ideas advanced in his unsent letter were certainly not absent from the leaders of the new administration. Already on the 2nd of May, Donitz laid down his aims. The only policy was to try to negotiate a series of partial surrenders in the West while continuing the fight in the East, at least until as many Germans as possible, 
soldiers and civilians, could be rescued from the clutches of the Soviets. The military situation is hopeless, the minutes of the first meeting of his administration began. In the current situation, the main aim of the government has to be to save as many German people as possible from destruction through Bolshevism. In so far as the Anglo-Saxons oppose the same, they must also be combated. In the East, therefore, continuation of the struggle with all available means was required, while ending the war against the Anglo-Saxons was desirable to avoid further sacrifice. This was blocked, however, Dönitz went on, by the Allied demand for unconditional total surrender, which would mean at a stroke handing over millions of soldiers and civilians to the Russians. The aim was, therefore, capitulation only to the Western powers. But since their political conditions made this impossible, it had to be attempted through partial actions at the level of the army groups, utilizing existing contacts. 4. Developments in the Netherlands appeared to hold out some hope. Even in mid-April, the German authorities there had been uncompromising in their determination to stave off the Allies. The biggest danger to the Netherlands was the deliberate inundation of the countryside. The Wehrmacht had flooded 16,000 hectares of coastal areas in July 1944 in an attempt to hinder the Allied advance. The prospect now was that this dire tactic would be extended. At a meeting with leaders of the Dutch underground movement, Reich Commissar Seisingfart had threatened destruction of locks and dikes in western Holland, which would have made the country uninhabitable during a number of years for several million people, and, had it been carried out, would have inordinately exacerbated the famine of the previous winter. The Allied response had been, should this happen, Zeiss and Colonel General Johannes Blaskowitz, Commander-in-Chief of the Netherlands, would be treated as war criminals. With defeat certain and imminent, this reaction evidently concentrated German minds. As soon as Hitler was dead, the stance changed. Zeiss, as Dönitz and his colleagues noted, now successfully engaged in talks with Eisenhower's chief of staff, General Walter Bedell Smith, to alleviate the food crisis in the Netherlands. Even so, Zeiss himself reported on the 3rd of May that a partial capitulation would be difficult to achieve. Smith had offered discussions about possible armistice negotiations, but Zeiss, on the instructions of Blaskowitz, had refused, awaiting a directive from Dunitz. Meanwhile, the fight for Fortress Holland was to be continued. However, there was to be no flooding of the land. An honorable transition, surrender by any other name, would, it was thought, bring a small credit to the German administration. During the morning of the 2nd of May, Dönitz had already been confronted with the unexpected news of the surrender of Army Group C in Italy. Moves to engineer a capitulation in Italy dated back to March, to the clandestine meetings in Switzerland, mentioned in Chapter 7, between Himmler's former right-hand man, SS Obergruppenführer Karl Wolff, and the head of the American Intelligence Services, the OSS, in Central Europe, Alan Dulles. Cautious steps towards a capitulation had quickened throughout April as the military situation in Italy had worsened. The German commander-in-chief, Colonel General Heinrich von Fiedinghoff Scheel, remained anxious that news of the continued dealings between Wolf and Dulles should not leak out. Even at this stage... German generals were fearful of the dire consequences should they be seen to be implicated in treasonable activities. Fiedinghoff also argued, justifying his hesitancy, though by the end of April a dubious proposition, that Goebbels would create, out of any disclosure of the capitulation soundings, a new stab-in-the-back legend, and deflect blame from the Reich leadership on to the traitors in Italy who had prevented a last-minute change in war fortunes. There were other difficulties. The likelihood, as it seemed, that Hitler would be flown out of Berlin to establish an alpine fortress in the Berchtesgaden area was a complication, leaving the Gauleiter of the Tyrol, Franz Hofer, torn between his continued loyalty to the Führer and his desire to prevent his province becoming a battleground. 
Hoffer's continued backing for Hitler remained a worry for Friedinghoff and those trying to reach terms with the Allies. His support for the armistice negotiations could not be taken for granted. Field Marshal Kesselring, based by late April in southern Bavaria and responsible for military direction in the southern part of the Reich, from the 28th of April for the military command over the entire southern front covering Italy and the Balkans as well as the south of Germany, was a further problem. As late as the 27th of April, Kesselring was still hesitant. At a meeting that day in Gauleiter Hoffer's house with Fiedinghoff, the Gauleiter and the German ambassador in Italy, Dr. Rudolf Rahn, Kesselring backed the steps that were being taken and agreed to be associated with them, but he added a cautionary rider. It had to be presumed, he stated, that the Führer was basing his proclamation, Berlin will remain German, the fight for Berlin will bring the great turn in war fortune, on a reasoned basis. As long as he had faith in that, Kesselring added, he could not act on his own accord. He was prepared to let his name be used in the moves towards capitulation, but added that an end only came into question for him if the Fuhrer was no longer alive. The bonds with Hitler were evidently vital for Kesselring, even in what were obviously the closing days of his power. Reports on foreign radio stations in the evening of the 28th of April that Hitler was dead turned out to be untrue. Kesselring still wanted to wait, though the military situation was worsening by the hour. The deterioration was reported by Kaltenbrunner, unaware of the suicide in the bunker, in a message for Hitler sent in the early morning of the 1st of May, though, because there was no communications with Berlin, related to Donitz. Kaltenbrunner, informed by Gauleiter Hoffer, noted the demand for capitulation by the 29th of April, mentioning, too, the death of Mussolini at the hands of partisans. Meanwhile, a German delegation had flown to meet Allied representatives in Caserta to be faced with the ultimatum to agree to unconditional surrender in Italy or see negotiations broken off. The German position was by then hopeless. The final Allied offensive had begun on the 9th of April. German forces in Italy, totaling around 600,000 men, including 160,000 Italian troops, were greatly outnumbered by some 1.5 million Allied troops, 70,000 of them Italians. By the 25th of April, the Allies had crossed the Po, sweeping northwards and forcing the Germans into headlong retreat towards the Alps. Surrender was the only sensible option. The capitulation was signed at 2 p.m. on the 29th of April, to come into effect exactly three days later on the 2nd of May. It was the only capitulation to be signed before Hitler's death, though by chance it did not come into effect while he was alive. Even now, Kesselring belatedly distanced himself from what had taken place, and dismissed Fiedinghoff and his chief of staff, Hans Rudiger, threatening to report the matter to the Führer and demand the necessary consequences for their treasonable actions. His own involvement probably prevented him carrying out this threat, and the field marshal contented himself with the fiction that Fiedinghoff and Rüdinger were resigning at their own request. Whether the capitulation, though signed, would be effected, remained in doubt until the news, authentic this time, of Hitler's death came through, and Kesselring finally, at 4 a.m. on the 2nd of May, gave his approval. Kesselring told Dönitz and Keitel that day that the armistice negotiations had taken place without his knowledge or approval, and that he had felt compelled to support the armistice that had been concluded in order to prevent an open revolt. At 2 p.m. that afternoon, the weapons in northern Italy finally fell silent. General Winter, deputy head of the OKW operations staff, telexed his chief, Yodel, that day, Perfidious behavior of the commander-in-chief there will for all time be inexplicable to me. As late as this, the top military leadership retained its perverse notion of loyalty. In northwest Germany, East Frisia and Schleswig-Holstein were not yet occupied, and further north, Denmark and Norway remained in German hands. On the 2nd of May, Jodl sent out instructions to Field Marshal 
Ernst Busch, Commander-in-Chief of Army Group Northwest, to fight on in order to gain time for negotiations. The orders were, however, swiftly overtaken by events, which were by now, moving far too rapidly for Dönitz to have any hope of controlling them. The British advance to Lüneburg and the American push through Schwerin to Wismar meant that overnight the last gateway for Germans to escape westwards from Pomerania and Mecklenburg was sealed off. Army Group Vistula, the 12th Army, and the remains of the 9th Army were left to fight their way back to western lines as best they could. With this development, it was acknowledged that there was no longer any point in fighting on against the western forces in northern Germany. It was decided to try to open talks with Montgomery as quickly as possible. On the 3rd of May, the date on which the city of Hamburg capitulated under threat of renewed British bombing, Admiral General von Friedeberg was therefore dispatched to try to negotiate an armistice in northwest Germany with a British military commander. When Montgomery refused unless German forces in Holland, Denmark, Frisia, and Schleswig stopped fighting, offering only to treat Germans fleeing from the east as prisoners of war and not hand them over to the Soviets, increasingly chaotic circumstances in the west forced Donitz's hand. German troops had flooded back in disorder westwards through Mecklenburg while there was still a chance to escape from the Red Army. And there were signs of disintegration in those troop units already in the West, where the civilian population was set to oppose any continuation of the war with the Western Allies, amid fears that they would take matters into their own hands and simply refuse to fight any longer. After discussing the dilemma with Krosig, Speer, Keitel, Jodl, and Gauleiter Wegener, Donut saw no alternative but to comply with Montgomery's demands. On the 4th of May, he approved the signing of the partial capitulation under the terms laid down. At the same time, he ordered a halt to the U-boat war. The order was not, in fact, received by all U-boats. Four further attacks on Allied shipping took place. And the last U-boat attack of the war, on the 7th of May, shortly before the total capitulation of the Wehrmacht, two freighters were sunk off the Firth of Forth. On the 5th of May, hostilities officially ceased in the Netherlands, Denmark, and northwest Germany. Against earlier intentions to scuttle warships rather than allow them to fall into enemy hands, the Germans agreed to sink no ships. Montgomery left open their continued use for refugee transportation. Norway, however, where the commander-in-chief, Colonel General Georg Lindemann, was still claiming that his troops, remarkably even now around 400,000 strong, were ready to fight on and requested in vain the continued use of the Heil Hitler greeting, remained under German occupation. As late as the 3rd of May, Dönitz had continued to regard Denmark and Norway as possible bargaining counters with the Western powers. Only now did Dönitz take steps to discard all lingering features of the Hitler regime. Actions of the Werwolf, though only in the West, were now banned and deemed contrary to laws of combat. The Heil Hitler greeting was at last prohibited in the Wehrmacht. Pictures of Hitler were on British orders to be removed from government offices. And only on the 6th of May did Dönitz finally ban all destruction or temporary dismantling of factories, canals, and rail and communications networks, finally reversing Hitler's scorched earth orders of March. In the South, too, there were clear signs of disintegration among the troops and of hostility towards the Wehrmacht by the civilian population in Bavaria and Austria. Kesselring took the view that the end had arrived and sought permission from Dönitz on the 3rd of May to negotiate with the Western Allies. The capitulation to the Americans on the 5th of May of German forces of Army Group G, left in a hopeless position in Bavaria and Austria, and that of the 19th Army in the Austrian Alpine region, had been preceded on the 3rd and 4th of May by the surrender, also to the Americans, of around 200,000 men from General Walter Wenck's 12th Army, once earmarked for extracting Hitler from Berlin, which had battled its way back to the Elbe, and parts of General Theodor Busse's 9th Army. The amenability of the Americans to these partial surrenders gave Donitz short-lived hope that he could come to an arrangement with Eisenhower that would fall short of total capitulation, 
He imagined he could still reach a deal to prevent the huge numbers of troops facing the Red Army being taken into Soviet captivity. Announcing the surrender in the West, since the fight against the Western powers has lost its meaning, Keitel added that, in the East, nevertheless, the struggle continues in order to rescue as many Germans as possible from Bolshevization and slavery. Even on the 4th of May, the Navy leadership was still declaring, the aim of the Grand Admiral is to remove as many Germans as possible from the clutches of Bolshevism. Since the Western enemies continue their support of the Soviets, the fight against the Anglo-Americans, according to the order of the Grand Admiral, carries on. The aim of this fight is to gain the state leadership, space and time for measures in the political arena. Nearly two million soldiers of the Wehrmacht remained at risk of falling into Soviet hands. Still fighting against the Red Army were Army Group Ostmark, renamed from South on the 30th of April, now pushed back into Lower Austria, and comprising around 450,000 men under the command of Colonel General Lothar Rendelik. Army Group E, with around 180,000 men, fighting a rearguard struggle in Croatia under Colonel General Alexander Lohr, and Field Marshal Ferdinand Schorner's Army Group Center, whose 600,000 or so men were pinned back mainly in the Protectorate of Bohemia and Moravia, large parts of the former Czechoslovakia. In addition, some 150,000 German troops who had been evacuated from East Prussia remained stranded on the Hela Peninsula, and 180,000 or so were still cut off and fighting in Courland. The latter were not yet ready to give in. A message to Dönitz on the 5th of May from the commander of the Courland army informed the Grand Admiral that the Latvian people were ready in common struggle against Bolshevism to fight shoulder to shoulder with the German Wehrmacht to the last, and asked for instructions about whether the army group should fight on as a Freikorps unit if a Latvian state should proclaim independence. Immediately following his negotiations with Montgomery, and in the hope still of avoiding total capitulation, Admiral von Friedeberg was commissioned on the 4th of May to contact Eisenhower about a further partial capitulation in the West, while explaining to him why a total capitulation on all fronts is impossible for us. Next day, Kesselring offered the surrender of Army Groups Ostmark, E, and Center to Eisenhower, though the offer was promptly rejected, unless all forces also capitulated to the Red Army. Rendelik, unable to make contact with OKW headquarters, promptly sought to arrange a partial surrender of his own forces to General Patton. Even now he had not given up hope of persuading the Americans to join him in repelling the Red Army, and went so far as to request permission to allow German troops stationed in the West through their lines to support his Eastern Front. He eventually capitulated unilaterally on the 7th of May, after himself fleeing to the Americans and offering the surrender of his forces. The offer was rejected, though the Americans were prepared to allow his troops to cross their lines westward until 1 a.m. on the 9th of May, and be treated as prisoners of war. On the 5th of May, Donuts gave Lohr permission, since he argued that it could not be prevented, and in any case accorded with the political aims of his government, to approach Field Marshal Sir Harold Alexander, Allied Commander-in-Chief in the Mediterranean, about a surrender with the aim of saving Austria from Bolshevism, accepting its separation from the Reich. Eisenhower refused, however, to accept the capitulation, unless it was also made to the Red Army. The main concern remained Schorner's army. Already on the 3rd of May, Donuts accepted that the entire situation, as such, demands capitulation. But it is impossible because Schorner with his army would then fall completely into the hands of the Russians. Schorner had reported on the 2nd of May that he could not hold out for long. His chief of staff, Lieutenant General Ulvig von Natzmer, thought two weeks was the maximum, though he continued to insist on an orderly retreat. Preparations for sudden orders to retreat were laid while political options were under consideration. The possibilities of saving Army Group Center depended upon the political as well as military situation in Bohemia. Dönitz, together with Keitel, Krosig, Wegener, and Himmler, had deliberated on the 2nd of May without holding Bohemia for the time being as a bargaining counter. 
It was acknowledged that the protectorate of Bohemia and Moravia, known to be on the verge of revolution, could neither politically nor militarily be sustained in the long run. But with a view to rescuing Germans in the area, there were thoughts of having Prague declared an open city, and sounding out political options by sending emissaries to Eisenhower. Himmler and the OKW briefly entertained the idea of relocating what was left of German government to Bohemia, but Dönitz ruled out the proposition since the territory was not part of Germany and the political situation too unstable. This swiftly proved to be true. Any lingering hopes invested in Bohemia rapidly dissolved with the news that a popular rising had broken out in Prague on the 5th of May. Immediately, orders were issued to rescue as many soldiers as possible from Soviet hands by retreating westwards. Schorner's men had placed their hopes in the Americans advancing into Bohemia before the Soviets could get there. However, Eisenhower held to his agreement with the Soviets to hold the American advance at a line west of Prague, near Pilsen, and refused General Patton permission to march on the city. Once the uprising broke out, the Red Army's orders to take Prague were brought forward. The Soviet advance on Bohemia began on the 6th of May, though it was only in the early hours of the 9th of May, after the general capitulation had been signed, that the Red Army's tanks entered Prague and destroyed the remnants of German resistance in the city. In the intervening four days, several thousand Czech citizens were killed or wounded in brutal German attempts to suppress the rising. There were also bloody acts of vengeance taken against the Germans. Demands of the SS commander in Bohemia and Moravia, SS Gruppenführer Karl Graf von puckler berghaus for Prague to be intensively firebombed, were vitiated only by the lack of fuel for planes. The situation for Schorner's troops had meanwhile become critical, not just on account of the uprising in Prague, which had prompted the Soviet offensive from the north, blocking possible routes of retreat, but because of events much farther north. On the morning of the 6th of May, Friedeberg let Dönitz know that Eisenhower was insisting on immediate, simultaneous, and unconditional surrender on all fronts. Troop units were to stay in their positions. No ships were to be sunk. No aeroplanes to be damaged. Eisenhower threatened a renewal of bombing raids and closure of borders to those fleeing from the east if his demands were not met. These conditions are unacceptable, a meeting of Dönitz, Keitel, Jodl, and Gauleiter Wegener concluded, because we cannot abandon the armies in the east to the Russians. They are not capable of implementation, since no soldier on the Eastern Front will hold to the command to lay down arms and stay in position. On the other hand, the hopeless military situation, the danger of further losses in the West through bombing raids and combat, and the certainty of the inevitable military collapse in the near future, compel us to find a solution for the still intact armies. Since there was no way out of the dilemma, it was decided to send Jodl to explain with all force to Eisenhower why a complete capitulation is impossible, but a capitulation only in the West would be immediately accepted. In the early hours of the next morning, the 7th of May, Jodl's wire from Eisenhower's headquarters brought the depressing news that the Allied commander-in-chief insisted that total capitulation be signed that day, otherwise all negotiations would be broken off. Eisenhower's demand was seen in Donitz's headquarters as absolute blackmail, since, if refused, it would mean the abandonment of all Germans beyond American lines to the Russians. But with the capitulation to go into effect at midnight on the 8th to the 9th of May, it would give 48 hours to extract at least most of the troops still fighting in the east. With a heavy heart, Donitz therefore gave Yodel powers to sign the capitulation. At 2.41 a.m. on the 7th of May, Jodl, in the presence of Admiral General von Friedeberg, signed the Act of Military Surrender together with General Walter Bedell Smith and the Soviet General Ivan Soslopolov in Eisenhower's headquarters in Reims. All military operations were to cease at 23.01 hours Central European time on the 8th of May. Given the hours, time difference, a minute past midnight on the 9th of May in London. 
The act of capitulation was, however, not yet complete. The text of the surrender document, the Soviets complained, differed from the agreed text, and Soslaparov had been given no authorization to sign it. This was, however, merely the pretext. Both the issue of prestige, since the Red Army had borne the lion's share of the fighting over four long years, and continued suspicion of the West, prompted Stalin's insistence on a further signing, of a lengthier version of the capitulation document, this time by the highest representatives of all sectors of the Wehrmacht, as well as leading Allied representatives. This second signing took place in Karlshorst, in the former mess of the Military Engineering School, now Zhukov's headquarters, on the outskirts of Berlin. The German representatives, flown from Flensburg to Berlin in an American plane, were kept waiting throughout the day on the 8th of May, until the Allied delegation arrived between 10 and 11 p.m. At last, Keitel, accompanied by Colonel General Hans-Jürgen Stumpf, representing the Luftwaffe, and Admiral General von Friedeberg, on behalf of the Navy, came slowly through the doorway for the surrender ceremony. Keitel raised his field marshal's baton in salute. The Allied representatives, Marshal Georgi Zhukov, the British Air Marshal, Arthur W. Tedder, on behalf of Eisenhower, the French General, Jean de Latre de Tassigny, and the U.S. General, Carl Spatz, did not respond. The German delegation were then invited by Zhukov to sign the instrument of unconditional surrender. Keitel, his face blotched red, replacing his monocle, which had dropped and dangled on a cord, his hand shaking slightly, signed five copies of the capitulation document before putting his right glove back on. It was almost a quarter to one in the early morning of the 9th of May, so the capitulation was backdated to the previous day to comply with the terms of the Reims Agreement. Once Keitel and the German delegation withdrew, bowing stiffly as they went, their heads sunken, it was time for the Soviet officers to sing and dance the night away. However little appetite the German delegation had, they were given a good meal with caviar and champagne. Somewhat surprisingly, at such a catastrophic moment for their country, Keitel and his fellow officers sipped the celebratory drink. Keitel was asked whether Hitler was really dead, since it was said his body had not been found. The Soviets inferred that he might still be ruling behind the scenes. Once Dönitz had agreed to the capitulation in Reims, a rapidly accelerated, desperate attempt was made to transport westwards troops still on the Eastern Front before the surrender took effect. Hurriedly, he instructed the army groups Southeast, Ostmark, and Center to fight their way back to Eisenhower's domain with the aim of being taken prisoner by the Americans. A flotilla of German ships ferried backwards and forwards across the Baltic to try to carry soldiers and with lower priority, refugees, to the west. Overland, soldiers and civilians alike fled in their droves beyond the Elba and from Bohemia towards Bavaria. Many of the soldiers were from Army Group Ostmark, left leaderless at Rendelik's surrender, and now flooding back pell-mell towards the American lines, up to 150 kilometers away in the west. Wild rumors circulated among soldiers in the east that the Americans would set free their German prisoners and rearm them to throw the Bolsheviks out of Germany. Even though most soldiers were hoping for an end to the war, they would, one recorded in his diary, all have been prepared to fight on if they could attack the Russians alongside the Americans, for the homeland must sometime be liberated again. Schorner endeavored as ever through ferocious discipline and vehement exhortation to keep his army together. On the 5th of May, he issued a final proclamation to the soldiers of Army Group Center. Only the eastern front of the southern army groups remains unbroken, he told them. According to the order given him by the head of state and commander-in-chief of the Wehrmacht, nominated by the Führer, Grand Admiral Dönitz, it was the task of his soldiers to carry on fighting until the most valuable German people are saved. It was his intention, he declared, to lead his troops in formation, heads held high in proud bearing back into the homeland. No picture of disintegration was to be conveyed in this final phase. 
Any attempt to break ranks and seek an independent way back to the homeland is dishonorable treason towards comrades and people and must be dealt with accordingly. Our discipline and our weapons in the hand are the guarantee for us to leave this war in decency and bravery. The plight of Army Group Center, once Dönitz had been forced to agree to the capitulation in Reims, was unenviable in the extreme. Bringing back Schorner's troops was seen as imperative on the 6th of May, but the capitulation made this impossible. The order to retreat had come too late. The Soviet attack from the north, from Saxony towards Prague, blocked the path. On the 7th of May, a British plane flew a German general staff officer, Colonel Wilhelm Meyer Detring, south from Flensburg, to meet Schorner to explain the unavoidability of the capitulation in Reims and pressed the urgent case for his men to fight their way to the west. From Pilsen, Mayor Detring was escorted by 40 American soldiers to Schorner's field headquarters, where they met next day. He described the background to the unavoidable total capitulation. An orderly retreat, the colonel told Schorner, had been ruled out by the speedy conclusion of the capitulation. He gave Schorner the order to leave all heavy equipment behind, and to move his divisions to the southwest as rapidly as possible. Schoener issued the command to comply with the stipulations of the surrender, though it was doubtful that troops would obey if it meant abandoning their fellow soldiers fighting to escape Soviet captivity, or meaning that they themselves would fall into Russian hands. The Czech uprising had led to a breakdown in communications. Leadership possibilities, he added, scarcely existed any longer and he saw no possibility everywhere of preventing complete disorganization and non-compliance with the terms. There was the danger that individual troop sectors or lower-ranking commanders would take matters into their own hands, ignoring orders and simply trying to fight their way to the West. In his proclamation of the 5th of May, Schorner had promised his soldiers, You can have trust in me that I will lead you out of this crisis. But after his return from years of Soviet captivity, Schorner, facing trial in West Germany on account of his brutal treatment of his soldiers under his command, was forced to defend himself vehemently against accusations leveled by his own former chief of staff, Lieutenant General Natzimer, that he, the most fervent follower throughout of Hitler and the most ferocious adherent of fighting to the last, had left his troops in the lurch at the end. It was said that on the 8th of May he had fled in civilian clothing by plane to the Austrian Alps, hiding for some days in a hut before handing himself over to the Americans, who, a few weeks later, delivered him to the Russians. According to Schorner's own later account, he left Army Group Center only on the morning of the 9th of May, when his command had been removed following the capitulation. He had, he claimed, been led to believe from Flensburg that the capitulation could be postponed until around the 12th of May, and he had until then to bring his troops home. Taken completely by surprise by the sudden news of the Reims' surrender, which, through communications difficulties, reached him only after a costly delay of several hours, he had been unable to fulfill his promise of the 5th of May to lead his troops back in formation, and instead, on the 7th of May, had given the orders for an organized flight. To the end of his life he asserted that his flight to Austria had been with the intention of carrying out Hitler's orders to establish an Alpine front to continue the fight. But although Schorner left his troops as he claimed on the 9th of May when his command had formally ceased following the capitulation, it remains the case that the men whose discipline he had enforced with a rod of iron were now suddenly abandoned to their fate. And the justification he gave for his flight to Austria shows, true or not, that even now he was prepared to argue that he was following an order from Hitler. Army Group Center had been the last largely intact Wehrmacht force in the field. The vast majority of its troops were taken into Soviet captivity, along with most other German soldiers still left on the Eastern Front in a total capitulation. It has been estimated that 202,000 soldiers were taken prisoner by the Red Army, between the 1st and 8th of May, and as many as 1.6 million after the capitulation. 
around 450,000 of those earlier fighting in the East had been able, though not all in the last week of the war, to reach the relative security of Western lines. Eisenhower's refusal to the end to contemplate any breach of the coalition with the Soviet Union, his insistence at the meeting with Yodel on the 6th of May upon unconditional surrender on all fronts, and the speed of the final moves to sign the capitulation, had ruined Donitz's intention of bringing the troops in the East back to the West and keeping them out of the hands of the Red Army. At a cost of continuing the war for more than a week after Hitler's death, Donitz did partially succeed. In the overall balance, no more than around 30% of the 10 million German troops entered Soviet captivity, though far more soldiers had fought in the East than in the West. Despite the flight to the West in the first week of May, the great majority of those on the Eastern Front when Dönitz took office were still there at Germany's surrender. They were marched off to the East and forced to endure years of Soviet captivity. A great many did not return. On the best estimates, about a third of those captured during the entire war in the East, around a million German prisoners of war, died in Soviet hands. Dönitz, as we have seen, had endeavored to postpone the inevitable defeat as long as possible through a series of partial surrenders calculated to find time to bring back the troops and, as a much lower priority, civilians from the East, and also in the hope, if rapidly fading, that even now the wartime coalition of the Western powers and the Soviet Union might crack. The strategy was largely, if not totally, a failure, and at a high cost. Did Dönitz have an alternative? Only once Eisenhower's blackmail, as Dönitz saw it, of complete capitulation within hours could not be avoided, were the troops still engaged in the East instructed to fight their way to the West. The order, as the fate of Army Group Center shows, came too late for most of them. Instead of gambling on the potential of a series of partial surrenders in the West, following the model which had worked in Italy, Dönitz's best option was arguably to have opened the Western Front completely, ordering the troops in all areas facing the Allies simply to stop fighting and lay down their arms. This would have allowed the Western powers to advance their lines immediately and rapidly to the east, shortening the lines to those still trapped there. Simultaneous orders to the three army groups still in the east to fight their way back straight away towards the Western powers might well then have saved far more of them then turned out to be the case. Even if the flight from the east had been chaotic rather than the planned and orderly retreat that German military leaders dreamed of. The speculation is, of course, pointless. The mentality in the high ranks of the German leadership ran counter to such notions. Even officers in British captivity had, as late as spring 1945, rejected the idea of German officers simply allowing the Western Allies to break through as incompatible with military honor. For Dönitz, whose acute sense of military honor had married so easily with his fervent belief in the ideology of National Socialism, orders to troops in the West unilaterally to stop fighting without formal capitulation would have been impossible to contemplate. So the war, even with Hitler dead, could not be immediately ended, but was forced to drag on until... With the civilian population demoralized and resigned to their fate, Germany's armies had either been destroyed or were on the verge of destruction. This time there could be no claim, as in 1918, that the army had been defeated not on the battlefield, but through subversion at home. On the 9th of May, the Wehrmacht issued its final report. From midnight, the weapons are silent on all fronts. On command of the General Admiral, the Wehrmacht has ended the fight that had become hopeless, it ran. The struggle lasting almost six years is thereby over. The unique achievement of front and homeland would, it stated, find its final appreciation in a later, just verdict of history. The war, caused primarily by Germany's expansionist aims and ultimately spreading to most parts of the globe, had left over 40 million people dead in the European conflict alone, 
leaving aside those killed in the Far East. More than four times the mortalities of the First World War, once seen as the war to end all wars. 5. Oddly, the capitulation was not quite the end for the Third Reich. The Donuts administration, an ever more pointless curiosity, was allowed to continue for a further 15 days in office, its sovereignty confined to a tiny enclave in Flensburg. SS uniforms were swiftly discarded and civilian dress adopted. A couple of ministers, Baca and Dorpmuller, were ordered to fly to Eisenhower's headquarters to provide advice on the first steps of reconstruction. Keitel, still chief of the OKW, was arrested on the 13th of May, and Jodl, who three days after he had signed the capitulation in Reims, was belatedly, and by now somewhat pointlessly, awarded the oak leaves to go with his knight's cross, took over the running of a largely redundant OKW. Government business went on, if in a surreal way. It was little more than the pretense of government. Dönitz and his remaining colleagues discussed the issue of the national flag, because the swastika was banned by the enemy powers. Another emblem of Hitler's Reich was at stake. Since pictures of the Führer had been removed or defaced by members of the Allied forces, the question arose as to whether, as a preventative measure, they should all be taken down. Dönitz was opposed, since, until now, the incidents had all been localized. Three days later he relented in part, conceding their removal in rooms where there were meetings with members of the occupying forces. Deprived of all effectiveness, the cabinet still felt it had a responsibility to help the German people where it could. This was hardly at all. A cabinet meeting took place every morning at 10 a.m. in an old schoolroom. It seemed to Speer as if Krossig, the acting head of government, was making up for all the years under Hitler in which there had not been a single cabinet meeting. Members of the government had to bring their own glasses and cups from their rooms. They discussed, among other things, how to reform the cabinet and whether to include a church minister. Dönitz, still addressed as Grand Admiral, was driven backwards and forwards from his apartment five hundred meters away in one of Hitler's big Mercedes that had somehow, found its way to Flensburg. This was not the only element of continuity with Hitler's regime that the Grand Admiral held to. At a meeting with Admiral General von Friedeberg on the 15th of May, Dönitz stipulated that defamatory orders to remove medals were to be refused, that the soldier should be proud of his service for the Wehrmacht and people during the war, and that the true people's community created by National Socialism must be maintained. The madness of the parties, as before 1933, must never again arise. On the 15th of May, Speer wrote to Krosig asking to be released from his duties as acting minister of economics and production, stating that a new Reich government was needed, untainted by any connection with the Hitler regime. He still cherished hopes that he might be seen as useful to the Americans. He received no reply, and two days later described as Minister Speer, was still involved in the administration. The entire cabinet considered resigning, but did not do so. The prime consideration was the Reich idea and the question of sovereignty. State Secretary Stuckert, now heading the Ministry of the Interior, produced a memorandum stipulating that unconditional surrender did not affect the further existence of the Reich as a state under international law. Germany had not ceased to exist as a state. Moreover, Dönitz had been legally appointed by the Führer as head of state, and therefore commander-in-chief of the Wehrmacht, whose oath to Hitler had passed to him automatically. Dönitz could only resign by appointing a successor. As regards legal theory, the Reich continued in existence. The pantomime of the rump Dönitz regime did not last long. On the 23rd of May, Dönitz... Friedeberg and Jodl were suddenly summoned to the temporary headquarters of the Allied Control Commission, located on the steamship Patria, a former German passenger ship of the Hamburg America Line, now moored in Flensburg Harbor. Three Wehrmacht limousines ferried them the short journey. 
Dönitz was wearing full dress uniform and carrying his gold tipped baton. On arrival, they were ushered up the gangplank and into a lounge to await Allied representatives, who entered the room some minutes later. U.S. Major General Lowell W. Rooks, heading the Allied mission, then read a prepared text. I am under instructions to tell you that the Supreme Commander, General Eisenhower, has decided, in concert with the Soviet High Command, that today the acting German government and the German High Command shall be taken into custody with these several members as prisoners of war. Thereby, the acting German government is dissolved. The Third Reich was over. The bankrupt concern was liquidated. The long process of reckoning was about to begin. But the debts for crimes against humanity of such magnitude would not, and could not, ever be repaid. 6. For Germany itself, leaving aside the untold misery and suffering and vast numbers of war casualties suffered by the citizens of other countries, a colossal price was paid for continuing the war to the bitter end. In the ten months between July 1944 and May 1945, far more German civilians died than in the previous years of the war, mostly through air raids and in the calamitous conditions in the eastern regions after January 1945. In all, more than 400,000 were killed and 800,000 injured by Allied bombing, which had destroyed more than 1.8 million homes and forced the evacuation of almost 5 million people, the vast majority of the devastation being inflicted in the last months of the war. The Soviet invasion, then occupation of the eastern regions of Germany, after January 1945, resulted in the deaths, apart from the immeasurable suffering caused and the deportation of many German citizens to an uncertain fate in the Soviet Union, of around half a million civilians. German military losses in the last phase of the war were immense. As high in the last ten months of the war as in the four years to July 1944. Had the attack on Hitler's life in July succeeded, and the war then been promptly brought to an end, the lives of around 50% of the German soldiers who died would have been saved. A total of 5.3 million servicemen, out of the 18.2 million who served in the Army, Luftwaffe, Navy, and Waffen-SS, lost their lives during the entire course of the conflict. Of these, 2.7 million died down to the end of July 1944. As many as 49% of the deaths, or 2.26 million, more than 1.5 million of them on the Eastern Front, were killed in the last 10 months. Towards the very end, three to 400,000 were dying each month. In the ruins of their country, people could look only dimly and with great foreboding into an uncertain future. Enormous relief that the war was finally over mingled with dismay at the catastrophe that had engulfed Germany and anxiety about life under enemy control. For the vast majority, the victory of the Allies was not seen as liberation. And for those in central and eastern Germany, Soviet rule was a fearful prospect. Passivity and compliance marked the behavior of the subdued German population, as the victors took over. After the ferocious pounding the country and its people had taken over previous months, there was no appetite for the sort of insurrectionist guerrilla activity that so often meets an occupying force. Probably, too, a conditioned readiness to comply with authority played its part. Most importantly, the existential demands of daily life did not alter with the capitulation. The drain on energies through doing no more than surviving in the ruins, getting by in chaotic circumstances, finding lost loved ones, mourning personal losses and trying to pick up the pieces of broken families and homes, was enormous. As the heavy hand of occupation started to be felt, deep recriminations began to be voiced, and the arrests of tens of thousands of Nazi functionaries and others implicated in the Hitler regime gathered pace. Germans, in high places and low, 
were meanwhile already laying the foundations of their apologia, attempting to establish distance between themselves and the crimes of Nazism. Claims for the exoneration of the Wehrmacht were underway in Flensburg. Keidel, just prior to his arrest, had asserted that the Wehrmacht had had nothing to do with the SS, apart from the Waffen-SS, or SD, and bore no responsibility for them. And as news, and what was described as mounting enemy propaganda about conditions in German concentration camps spread, Dönitz and Jodl were among those who saw the need of a public statement that neither the German Wehrmacht nor the German people had knowledge of these things. The myth of the good Wehrmacht, which had such currency for decades in post-war Germany, was being forged. At the grassroots, a not dissimilar, if differently accentuated, process of dissociation from Nazism was underway. Everywhere the symbols of Nazism, where they still survived, were rapidly destroyed. No one willingly admitted to having been an enthusiastic follower of the regime. Initially there were numerous denunciations of those functionaries who, only a year or two earlier, had strutted arrogantly in their Nazi uniforms and acted like little Hitlers in their localities. But as the big shots were gradually rounded up, the major war criminals put on trial, and the attention of the Allies shifted to the process of denazification at lower levels, the impression was increasingly given that hardly anyone had really backed the regime, but had at best, under duress, gone along with the policies dictated by the tyranny of Hitler and his henchmen. Everybody pulls away from Adolf. Nobody took part. Everybody was persecuted, and nobody denounced anybody, was the cynical assessment of a young Berlin woman in May 1945, listening to voices in the queues for vegetables and water. A report written in June 1946 by the Lutheran pastor in Berchtesgaden, a predominantly Catholic district nestling below the Obersalzburg, Nazi Germany's holy mountain, where Hitler had built his Alpine palace, expressed sentiments that were far from uncommon in the months after the demise of the Third Reich. The pastor spoke of all the disappointments under the National Socialist regime and the collapse of the hopes harbored by many idealists. He also referred to the revelation of all the atrocities of this regime. Then came the dissociation from Nazism. He regretted that our people as a whole is nevertheless still held responsible for the misdeeds of National Socialism, although the vast majority throughout all those years had only the single wish to be liberated from this violent regime because it saw its most sacred possessions, of family, church, and personal freedom, destroyed or threatened. His neighbor, the priest of the Catholic parish of St. Andreas in Berchtesgaden, emphasized that our truly believing population, good middle-class and farming families, fundamentally rejected Nazism, that 80% of the local Catholic population was opposed to the party, horrified by the stories of the brutal manner of party leaders on the Obel Salzburg, which had been hermetically sealed off from the village below. In a prisoner of war camp in the winter of 1945-46, Major General Eric Detlefsen, former head of operations in Army High Command, began his memoirs of the last weeks of the war with his own reflections, thoughtful, if emphasizing lack of knowledge of barbarity and guiltless exploitation by a ruthless regime, on how Germans were facing the trauma that still held them in its grip. He wrote, It is still only a few months since the collapse. We haven't yet gained the distance in time or in mind to be able to judge, to some extent objectively, what was error, guilt and crime, or inexorable fate. We Germans are still too taken up by prejudice. Only slowly, in shock, and with reluctance are we awakening from the agony of the last years, and recognizing ourselves and our situation. We search for exoneration to escape responsibility, for all that which led to the recent war, its terrible sacrifices and dreadful consequences. We believe ourselves to have been fooled, led astray, misused. We plead that we acted according to the best of our knowledge and conscience, 
and knew little or nothing of all the terrible crimes. And millions did know nothing of them, especially those who fought at the front or homeland, house and home, and family, and believed they were only doing their duty. But we are also ashamed that we let ourselves be led astray, and misused, and that we knew nothing. Shame mainly finds expression at first in defiance and undignified self-denigration, only gradually and slowly in regret. That is how it is among the nations. We are experiencing that now in our people. Such words, and many other accounts in similar vein in the early months after Germany's total defeat, convey, even if they can only faintly express, some sense of the trauma felt by people who had undergone the desperate last phase of the war and were now being fully confronted with the magnitude of the crimes committed by their fellow citizens. For the generation that endured the apocalyptic collapse of the Third Reich, it was a trauma that would never fully pass. It is unsurprising, then, that in Germany, memory of the Third Reich, the final Armageddon of 1944-45, came to overshadow all else. The rise of Hitler amid the almost complete rejection of liberal democracy as Germany's economy crumbled, the first triumphant years of the regime when so many had rejoiced at national resurgence and economic recovery, and the early phase of the war with German military power laying the base for the conquest and ruthless exploitation of almost the whole of the European continent. These were more distant, less sharp memories. What had accompanied the good times, the persecution of unloved minorities, first and foremost Jews, and the violent repression of political opponents, the terroristic framework on which the people's community had been built, had been tolerated, if not welcomed outright then, and could later be viewed as mere excesses of the regime. If only National Socialism hadn't become so depraved in itself, it was the right thing for the German people, the view expressed by a German officer in British captivity just after the capitulation was not an uncommon one. According to Allied opinion surveys in the immediate post-war years, about 50% of Germans still thought National Socialism had been, in essence, a good idea that had been badly carried out. What really lasted in memory was the experience devastating for so many Germans, of those last terrible months. It was perhaps not surprising, then, that the Germans thought of themselves as the helpless victims of a war they had not wanted, foisted on them by a tyrannical regime that had brought only misery to the land and produced catastrophe. One man from a town in the east, whose mother had killed herself out of fear of the Russians, complained many years later, there were memorials for everybody, concentration camp prisoners, Jewish victims, Russians who had fallen, but nobody bothered about the other side. In the generation that experienced it, this sense of being the victims, exploited, misled, misused, of the uncontrollable tyranny of Hitler and his henchmen that in their name perpetrated terrible crimes, though it was often averred less heinous than those of Stalin, has remained scarcely diluted. Of course, it was not wholly incorrect. Germans themselves were, in this final phase of the war, indisputably also victims of events far beyond their control. The bombed-out homeless were evidently victims of a ruthless bombing campaign, but also of the expansionist policies of their government that had prompted the horror. The women children and elderly people forced to flee their homes and farmsteads in eastern Germany and join the millions trekking through ice and snow were also victims of the Red Army juggernaut and of the self-serving Nazi leaders in their areas, but also of the war of aggression waged by their government against the Soviet Union that had invented such terrible reprisals. The soldiers dying in their thousands at the fronts in those horrific last months were themselves, in a sense, victims of a military leadership, using draconian methods to coerce compliance in the ranks, but also of an inculcated sense of duty that they were fighting in a good cause, and of a political leadership prepared for its own selfish ends 
to take the country into oblivion rather than surrender when all was evidently lost. Yet, considering themselves victims, few stopped to consider why they had allowed themselves to be misled and exploited. Few of those bombed in the Ruhr had given much thought to the arsenal of weapons they were producing for the regime and enabling it to attack other countries and bomb the citizens of Warsaw, Rotterdam, Coventry, London, Belgrade, and many other cities, inviting the obliteration of their own cities in return. As long as the bombs were falling elsewhere, on others, they had no complaints. Few of those expelled from East Prussia, in such horrific circumstances in early 1945, were willing to recall that the province had been the most Nazified in Germany, that its support for Hitler had been far above average before 1933, or that they had cheered to the rafters during the 1930s as their area benefited from Nazi policies. Most people throughout Germany were unwilling to recollect their earlier enthusiasm for Hitler, their jubilation at his successes, and the hopes they invested in a brave new world for themselves and their children to be constructed on German conquest and dispoliation of Europe. None wanted to dwell on what horror their own fathers, sons, or brothers had inflicted on the peoples of Eastern Europe, let alone ponder the reports, or rumors bordering on hard fact, that they heard of the slaughter of the Jews. The gross inhumanity for which Germany had been responsible was suppressed, forced out of mind. What remained, seared in memory, was how the Third Reich had gone so tragically wrong. And even in those terrible last months of the war, few, it seems, preoccupied as they were by their own pressing existential needs, were prepared to give much thought to the real victims of what was taking place, the armies of foreigners who had been taken to Germany and forced to work against their will, the hundreds of thousands of inmates of concentration camps and prisons, more dead than alive, and the bedraggled and grossly maltreated prisoners, most of them Jews, on the death marches of the final weeks. The racial prejudice that Nazism could so easily exploit was something that few later wanted to admit to, but the old ideas died hard. According to American opinion surveys in October 1945, 20% of those questioned went along with Hitler on his treatment of the Jews, and a further 19% remained generally in favor but thought he had gone too far. A lasting partial affinity with Nazi ideas was not all. As the Third Reich disintegrated, an inevitable ambiguity lingered in most people's minds. The overwhelming desire to see the war end was almost universal in these last months. It went along with a fervent wish to see the back of the Nazi regime that had inflicted such horror and suffering on the people. But one of Nazism's greatest strengths in early years had been its ability to usurp and exploit all feelings of patriotism and pride in the nation and turn them into such a dangerous and aggressive form of hyper-nationalism that could so easily become racial imperialism. The collapsing regime in 1944-45 did not erase, among all those who had come to detest Nazism, the determination still to fight for their country, to defend their homeland against foreign invasion, and especially years of anti-Bolshevik propaganda, but also the bitter experience of conquest in the eastern regions had done their job, to protect against what was viewed as an alien, repugnant, and inhumane enemy to the East. So people wanted to see an end to Nazism, but not an end to the Reich. Since, however, the fight to preserve Germany was still directed by the very people whose policies had wrecked the country, the Nazi regime could still, if in a negative way, bank on support from both soldiers and civilians to the end. In western parts of Germany, the relatively lenient treatment by the American and British conquerors, if not by the French, inevitably prompted a more rapid erosion of the regime and swifter process of disintegration in civilian society and within the army than was the case in the East. There, despite the by now almost universal feelings of revulsion towards the Nazi party and its representatives, people had little choice but to place their trust in the Wehrmacht and hope that it could stave off the Red Army. 
the ambiguity in attitudes of ordinary Germans, civilians and soldiers, in the last dreadful months of the war was even more prevalent in the upper echelons of the Wehrmacht's officer corps. We have seen ample evidence, leaving aside fanatics like Dönitz and Schorner, who associated closely and directly with Hitler, of the belief systems and mentalities of generals who felt obliged to carry out orders that they thought were senseless, who were contemptuous of the Nazi leadership, but nevertheless saw it as their unswerving duty to do all they could to fend off enemy conquest, above all in the East. Defense of the homeland, not ideological commitment to Nazism, was what counted for the majority of high-ranking officers. But their nationalist and patriotic feelings sufficed to keep them completely bound up in the service of the regime, which they had been so ready to serve in better times. After the failure of the bomb plot of July 1944, scarcely a thought to regime change was given among the generals, who could see more plainly than anyone that Germany was heading for complete catastrophe. This was ultimately crucial. It meant that Hitler would remain in power, the war would go on, and there would be no putsch from within. Only once Hitler was dead did it seem feasible to move toward surrender, and only then, in conditions of complete collapse and impotence, were the links that bound the military leadership to Hitler and his regime reluctantly broken. Conclusion Anatomy of Self-Destruction This book began by pointing out the extreme rarity of a country being able and prepared to fight on in war to the point of total destruction. It is equally rare that the useful elites of a country, most obviously the military, are unable or unwilling to remove a leader seen to be taking them down with him to complete disaster. Yet, recognized by all to be taking place, and increasingly to be inevitable, this drive to all-enveloping national catastrophe, comprehensive military defeat, physical ruination, enemy occupation, and even beyond this, moral bankruptcy, was precisely what happened in Germany in 1945. The preceding chapters have tried to explain how this was possible, they have shown the long process of inexorable collapse of Europe's most powerful state under external military pressure. They have also tried to bring out the self-destructive dynamic, by no means confined to Hitler, built into the Nazi state. Most of all, they have sought to demonstrate that the reasons why Germany chose to fight to the very end, and was capable of doing so, are complex, not reducible to a single easy generalization. The Allied demand for unconditional surrender, often seen as ruling out any alternative to fighting on to the end, provides no adequate explanation. German propaganda, of course, exploited the demand in its ceaseless efforts to bolster the will to hold out, claiming that the enemy, East and West, intended to destroy Germany's very existence as a nation. But ever fewer people in the last months, as we have seen, believed such messages, at least as regards the Western powers. More significant were the implications of the policy for the regime's elite. Certainly unconditional surrender was grist to Hitler's mill, insistent as he was that there could be no consideration of capitulation. And unconditional surrender did make it impossible to end the war in the West, which most German leaders, though not Hitler, would have been prepared to negotiate without also ending it in the East. Even the Donuts administration, following Hitler's death, rejected this option, since it meant condemning nearly two million German soldiers to Soviet captivity, until Eisenhower gave it no choice in the matter, thus ensuring that the war went on for a further eight days of bloodshed and suffering. On the other hand, the demand for unconditional surrender did not lead to any reconsideration by the Wehrmacht High Command of German strategy, from early 1943 onwards, insofar as any overall strategy existed, beyond an ideologically framed, self-destructive drive to hold out to the point of total perdition. It provided useful justification for fighting on to the end, but it was not the cause of the determination to do so. 
The claim that it undermined the possibility of the resistance movement, gaining wider support, and a greater possibility of toppling Hitler, also remains a doubtful proposition. In any case, unconditional surrender did not, of course, prevent an attempted coup d'etat. Stauffenberg and his co-conspirators in the bomb plot of July 1944 acted in full awareness of the Allied demand, and, had they succeeded, would immediately have tried to sue for peace terms. And most of Hitler's paladins and numerous generals would have been willing, as we have noted, at one point or another, to parlay their way to a settlement if Hitler had agreed, undeterred by the uncompromising Allied position. So, although unconditional surrender was undoubtedly a factor in the equation, it cannot be regarded as the decisive or dominant issue in compelling the Germans to fight on. Churchill himself later rejected the claim that unconditional surrender had been a mistake which had prolonged the war. In fact, he went so far as to state that an alternative statement on peace terms, which the Allies had several times attempted to draft, would have been more harmful to any German attempts to seek peace, since the conditions looked so terrible when set forth on paper, and so far exceeded what was in fact done, that their publication would have only stimulated German resistance. Nor can Allied mistakes in strategy and tactics, weakening their own efforts to bring the war to an early end, and contributing to the protracted end, to the great conflict also by temporarily boosting the confidence of the German defenders, be seen as the key factor. Important errors were certainly made and contributed to the inability of the Allies, after the Normandy landings in the West and the Red Army's surge through Poland in the East, to finish off Germany by Christmas, as they had in their early optimism initially thought possible. As we saw in earlier chapters, in the West, the divergence in strategic aims between Eisenhower and Montgomery, underpinned by their personal differences, owing mainly to the latter's overbearing personality and some ingrained anti-American prejudice in the British military elite, prevented full exploitation of the breakthrough in France in August 1944, which had left the German Western Front in great disarray. As a result, compounded by the British failure to secure the port in Antwerp, and by the disaster at Arnhem. The Wehrmacht was able to reinforce Western defenses and bring the Allied attack almost to a standstill for several precious weeks. The Allies never fully regained their momentum and suffered a further temporary setback in the Ardennes offensive until March 1945. On the Eastern Front, the Red Army's mistakes in operational planning also meant that the massive assault of the summer of 1944, devastating though it was for the Wehrmacht, did not bring an early end to the war. A bold thrust to the Pomeranian coast, which German defense planners had feared, would have cleared the way for a much earlier attack on Berlin that in fact took place and could possibly have brought total collapse long before May 1945. What might have occurred had the British and Americans in the West and the Soviets in the East taken different strategic decisions can of course only be a matter of speculation. Perhaps the war would have been over much earlier. But just as possibly, other errors or hesitations, war inevitably producing its own frequent surprises and seldom going according to plans laid down on paper, might have played their part and prevented a more rapid conclusion. In a similar realm of ultimately futile speculation is the question of what the outcome might have been to a successful assassination of Hitler and takeover of the state by the conspirators behind the July plot of 1944. Had they succeeded, Stauffenberg and the successful plotters would, unquestionably, have sought peace with the West, though almost certainly not in the East. Most likely the West would have refused consideration of anything other than unconditional surrender on all fronts, since to do otherwise would have split the coalition with the Soviet Union, which rested fundamentally on the complete destruction of German militarism as well as Nazism. With Hitler dead, the leaders of the successful coup would have been faced with a choice of either accepting the terms of complete capitulation or fighting on. Probably they would have felt compelled to agree to total surrender. The war might therefore have been over in July 1944, with the saving of the immense bloodshed that occurred 
in subsequent months. But would the military leadership, especially in the East, have agreed? And would Nazi diehards, most notably in the SS, have gone along with it? Shored up by a new stab-in-the-back legend focused on the image of the dead heroic Führer, portrayed as killed by his own officers when leading Germany's fight for existence, powerful internal forces might have resisted and even toppled the new government. Civil war might have ensued. In the nature of things, the endless fascination of such what-if speculation can provide no answers. This book has attempted, therefore, to assess not what might have been, but what did, in fact, happen, and to evaluate on that basis the reasons for Germany fighting on to the end. On the basis of the evidence presented in earlier chapters, it is time to draw the threads of an answer together. First of all, it was plainly not the case, as has sometimes been claimed, that the population backed Hitler and the Nazi regime to the end. The people have no confidence any longer in the leadership, ran an internal report, one of the many cited previously, in March 1945. The Fuhrer is drawn more strongly by the day into the question of confidence and into the criticism. The bonds with Hitler at the top and bottom of society had, it is true, at least in the short term, been strengthened in July 1944 by the failure of Stauffenberg's bomb plot. As we saw, there was a surge in Hitler's lagging popularity among the civilian population and among frontline soldiers to go from their letters home. And most of the generals, even those who were far from regime enthusiasts, were utterly dismayed by the attempt on Hitler's life, as their private diary entries and remarks, not meant for public consumption, demonstrate. But apart from this brief resurgence, Hitler's popularity had been on the wane since winter 1941, and by 1944-45 was in freefall. Significant reserves of his popularity did remain among a dwindling minority of the population, though to be sure a minority that still held power. By early 1945, however, support for Hitler was very low. And by now the Nazi party was widely hated. As Goebbels admitted, the party was largely played out well before the end, the target of bitter resentment as its functionaries disappeared into the ether, abandoning the population. Despite the intensified efforts of propaganda, the reports reaching Goebbels spoke with a clear voice. Propaganda could do little or nothing to counter what people were seeing with their own eyes. Its gung-ho messages were increasingly scorned by a population yearning for an end to the war and inexorably turning against the regime which had brought such misery upon Germany. There is little to be said for the view that the people's community retained its cohesion and integrative force behind the war effort. The much-vaunted people's community had in fact long since dissolved, as it became a question of save yourself if you can. Yet there were important partial affinities that went beyond support for the regime, but still objectively underpinned it. Crucially, the regime's existence was intertwined with defense of country and homeland, a cause upheld by most Germans, even when they despised Hitler and the Nazis. The overwhelming proportion of the population, as numerous internal reports acknowledged, yearned for the end of the war. But there was an obvious ambivalence. Few wanted foreign occupation, least of all by the feared Russians. But as long as they fought to their utmost to avoid being overrun by the enemy, Germans were, whatever their motives and desires, helping the regime to continue functioning. And however demoralized for the vast majority of Germans, there was, in any case, simply no alternative to carrying on. The role played by terror in this can scarcely be overstated. Without it, there may well have been a popular uprising. But the regime was a grave danger to its own citizens, increasingly so after the sharp intensification of terror in February 1945. Very justifiably, people felt greatly intimidated. In the death throes of the regime, the terror earlier exported, rebounded back onto the population of Germany itself, and not just its persecuted minorities. 
Among ordinary soldiers, the numbers of deserters, intermingled with stragglers, soared. Military courts, as we noted, reacted with harsh, exemplary punishment. The summary courts martial introduced in mid February were no more than kangaroo courts, meeting out little other than death sentences. And in early March, when such courts were made itinerant, a flying court martial could turn up in any frontline area and within minutes have sentenced to death those denounced as shirkers, defeatists, or subversives, carrying out the sentence instantly. Remarkably, military courts were still passing death sentences even after the capitulation. Among civilians, too, anyone stepping out of line, even in desperation, could, to the very end, meet brutal retribution. Largely owing to the intimidatory effect of such terror, the popular mood was resigned, war-weary and pessimistic, but not rebellious. Those who dared raise their voices, let alone take any action against the regime, were viciously struck down. Most, sensibly, took the view that they could do nothing except wait for the end and hope that the Americans and British got there before the Russians. Yet terror does not explain all. It works as an explanation mainly at the grassroots level. Tens of thousands of soldiers deserted, and many faced summary execution as a consequence. But even here, and bearing in mind the wider, intimidatory effect of the drastic punishment awaiting those refusing to fight, the vast majority did not desert, or even contemplate deserting. They fought on, often fatalistically, even reluctantly, but frequently even to the last desperate weeks with high commitment, even enthusiasm. That cannot be accounted for by terror. And at the higher level of the Wehrmacht, among those senior officers with power of decision and command, terror played little role. Apart from those involved in the bomb plot, generals were not terrorized. Some were dismissed, but they were not executed. For the German people, and even more for the racial and political victims of Nazism, the intensified terror alongside the terrible suffering could not end until the regime itself was destroyed by military might. This was in no small part because many of those wielding power, in particular those in high places, but also functionaries and representatives of the party and its affiliates at regional and local level, realized that they had burnt their boats and had no future. Party and SS leaders had been involved in the worst atrocities against Jews and others. Goebbels saw this as a positive factor in ensuring their continued fanaticism and backing for the regime, often underpinned by belief in some ferocious Jewish revenge. Hitler thought exactly the same way. As Nazi rule fragmented, the regime increasingly ran amok, as police, SS, regional and local party officials took matters in the provinces into their own hands. Hundreds of citizens fell victim to uncontrolled violence by Nazi fanatics in the last weeks of the regime, often in an attempt to prevent the senseless destruction of their towns or villages and continued fighting as the enemy approached. Prisoners and foreign workers were now more exposed than ever to the wild and unconstrained violence, and with the enemy on the doorstep, Pointless, forced marches of thousands of concentration camp prisoners, many of them Jews, left countless numbers dead, the rest terrorized and traumatized. The desperado actions of many party activists in the last weeks reflected the readiness of those who were well aware that they had no future to take enemies down with them, to exact revenge against long-standing opponents, to settle personal scores, and to ensure that those who had rejected the regime should not be around to triumph at its downfall. Though these fanatics were a small minority, they were a minority still wielding power over life and death. Their self-destructive urges paralleled those of Hitler and the regime leadership, helping through their own brutality to guarantee that Nazi power continued and that any manifestations of resistance from below were swiftly extinguished. The party and its affiliates increasingly occupied all the organizational space beyond the military sphere after July 1944 and gained hugely extended powers over citizens and other civil administration. Martin Bormann, 
used his proximity to Hitler and his command of the party's central administration to reinvigorate the party and push the state administration out of any importance in policymaking. The time of struggle before the party gained power in 1933 was repeatedly evoked as activists were urged to take radical steps to complete the Nazi revolution. Below Bormann, a pivotal role was played by the Gauleiter. As Reich defense commissars, responsible for civil defense in their areas, they had enormous scope for interference in practically all spheres of daily life and for imposing summary retribution for non-compliance. They and their subordinates at district and local level controlled, among other things, distribution of welfare, compulsory evacuation of citizens from threatened areas, access to air raid shelters, clearance of bomb damage, and compulsory recruitment to forced labor on defense installations. And they were key agents for Goebbels' total war drive to comb out last reserves of manpower from offices and workplaces to raise men for the Wehrmacht. The increase in the party's dominance did nothing to create a streamlined administration, but it did massively strengthen its grip over government and society. In the last months of the war, Germany was as close to a totally mobilized and militarized society as it is possible to get. The mass of Germans were oppressed, browbeaten, and marshaled as never before. There was by now scarcely any avenue of life remaining free from the intrusions of the party and its affiliates. A big step towards the complete militarization of society was the introduction of the Volkssturm in the autumn of 1944. It was militarily as good as useless. It was lampooned as the awaited miracle weapon and generally derided. And it was a sign, recognized by all, of how desperate things had become. Sensible individuals did all they could to avoid having to serve in it, with justification given its high loss rate, especially on the Eastern Front. But as a control structure for the regime, it was far from devoid of significance. And its leadership was often in the hands of fervent Nazis, increasingly involved in many policing actions, including atrocities against other Germans viewed as cowards or defeatists. Despite the drain of actual power away from the state bureaucracy, reduced largely to an instrument of administrative implementation, and increasingly into the hands of the party at all levels, the regime was also sustained, to the end, by a sophisticated and experienced bureaucratic machine. This surmounted any number of huge difficulties to keep on functioning, if with sharply decreasing effectiveness, especially in the last months, till there was little or nothing left to administer. Without the organizational capacity that came from educated, well-trained civil servants at different levels, the administration would surely have collapsed much earlier. The judicial system, too, still meeting out draconian sentences, continued to function to the end, sustaining the radicalized terror against German citizens and against persecuted minorities. Through the civil service, there was an almost unthinking loyalty, not specifically to Hitler, but to the abstraction of the state, and commitment to what was seen as duty. Even for civil servants scornful of Hitler and disdainful of Nazi bosses, it was enough to provide support for a system in terminal collapse. We saw the near incomprehension of Kritzinger, the state secretary of the Reich Chancellery, when asked by his post-war interrogators why he had continued to work so hard when all was so obviously lost, replying, As a long-standing civil servant, I was duty-bound in loyalty to the state. The mentality was replicated at top and bottom of the large civil service. The savagery of the war in the East provided its own motivation for carrying on fighting and rejecting all thoughts of surrender. This was a war quite unlike the conflict in the West. Military leaders and rank-and-file soldiers alike were well aware that they had been responsible for, or implicated in, countless atrocities in the East. Torched villages, mass executions of partisans, shootings of tens of thousands of Jews— the barbarity of warfare on the Eastern Front meant, as they well knew, that they could expect no mercy if they fell into Soviet hands. 
The propaganda image of Nemersdorf, scene of Soviet atrocities in October 1944, was worse than the reality, but that had certainly been bad enough. Nemersdorf encapsulated the fear of Bolshevism, something hammered home over the years in incessant propaganda, but now no longer an abstraction. For soldiers fighting in the East or those elsewhere with families in the threatened Eastern regions, there was not simply an ideological reason for fighting on. The ideological fight against Asiatic hordes and Bolshevik beasts and even the patriotic defense of the nation merged subliminally into a desperate attempt to stave off the very obvious threat to families and homes or to avenge the atrocities of the Red Army. Beyond these motives, soldiers fought out of group solidarity for their immediate comrades and in the last resort for their own survival. Vital to the regime's ability to fight on was, not least, the role of the officer corps of the armed forces. The war brought soaring numbers, to nearly 200,000 including reserve officers in early 1944, and a very rapid turnover. The Army lost 269,000 officers during the war, 87,000 of them killed. In September 1944, an average of 317 officers a day mostly low-ranking, were killed, wounded, or taken captive. The junior and middle-ranking officers were crucial cogs in the military machine. Many had swallowed tenets of Nazi doctrine in the Hitler Youth and in subsequent training courses, and had been hardened by battle and involvement in murderous pacification and genocidal actions in the East. As we noted, Nazi penetration of the armed forces was sharply intensified after the failed bomb plot, with the introduction of the Heil Hitler greeting instead of the traditional military salute, and extended use of NSFOs to instill fanaticism and loyalty in the troops. The brutal reprisals against those involved in the Stauffenberg plot and the repeated tirades of vilification of army officers by Nazi leaders, from Hitler downwards, also produced their own pressure, not just to conform, but to display enthusiastic commitment. At the top, the generals held the key. Most were too old to have been schooled in Nazism like the more junior officers, but their older nationalist mentalities had blended easily with Nazi ideals, and they had wide experience of, and support for, the ideological war of annihilation on the Eastern Front. Only loyalists were left after the purge that followed the failed bomb plot, that did not prevent serious disputes over tactics developing between individual generals and Hitler. Numerous generals were made scapegoats for defeats or for their inability to fulfill absurd orders. But they were not, temperamentally or organizationally, capable of challenging Hitler or staging another attempted military coup. Most generals took their oath of allegiance to Hitler extremely seriously and were tortured by the thought that they might be compelled to disobey orders. Even where the oath served as little more than a pretext for compliance, and a retreat from any political responsibility on the grounds that they were purely soldiers carrying out their duty, the traditional military imperatives of order and obedience were distorted in the Third Reich, to an extreme readiness to yield to the commands of the Führer, however irrational. Ultimately, a deeply inculcated but utterly warped sense of duty provided both motivation and alibi for the Third Reich's military leaders. The generals were divided among themselves. The bugged conversations of those in British captivity, referred to on several occasions in preceding chapters, reveal sharp divergence in views. It was no different among those generals still holding positions of high command in Germany and on its borders. As fervent nationalists, they saw it as axiomatic to be ready to do their utmost for the defense of the Reich, even where they had inwardly broken with Hitler or despised the party and its representatives. But some, in fact, remained fanatical backers of Hitler, like the brutal field marshal Ferdinand Schorner, whose ruthlessness in enforcing discipline made him notorious even in the top ranks of the army, or Grand Admiral Karl Dönitz, who demanded in April 1945 that every ship and naval base be defended to the last in accordance with the Führer's orders, offering his men the choice of victory or death. 
Most high-ranking officers, like Dönitz, held to the fiction that they were unpolitical, and that political decisions were solely and rightly the concern of the state leadership. But without their support, whatever their motives, it is plain that the state leadership could not have continued, and nor could the war. Even where they disagreed fundamentally with Hitler's tactics, the generals did not dispute his right to issue them, and fought on loyally. Faced with increasingly insane orders for the defense of Berlin, Colonel General Heinrichi nonetheless felt that to refuse them was to commit treason. The example of Field Marshal Kesselring, refusing even at the end of April 1945 to condone surrender in Italy as long as the Führer was alive, is a further, graphic case. Crucial in enabling the regime to fight on was also the radicalization of the structure of power beneath Hitler in the last months. In the wake of Stauffenberg's assassination attempt, the regime was swiftly buttressed. Changes were made that shored it up in the last months and ruled out any internal collapse, with power below Hitler largely divided between the four Nazi grandees. Bormann, as we saw, greatly expanded the mobilizing and controlling role of the party, extending its hold over almost all facets of daily life. Goebbels now combined the key areas of propaganda and mobilization for the total war effort. Without the million extra men that he raised by the end of 1944, the Wehrmacht would simply not have been able to replace the extraordinary losses it was suffering. Himmler, with his takeover of the command of the replacement army, from which headquarters Stauffenberg had orchestrated the plot to kill Hitler, extended his terror apparatus into the Wehrmacht itself. Only the replacement army had been capable of planning the attempted coup d'etat in 1944. In Himmler's hands, that potential was removed, and Speer achieved miracles of management and organization in producing sufficient armaments, despite the growing crisis of production and transport through Allied bombing and territorial losses, to ensure that the troops still had weapons to fight with. If Speer, who was very late in accepting that the war was irredeemably lost, had worked half as hard, Germany could not have held out for remotely as long. The quadrumvirate of Bormann, Goebbels, Himmler, and Speer, three of them among the most brutal and radical fanatics, the fourth an ambitious, power-hungry organizational genius, was instrumental to the continuation of the war, but the four were divided among themselves and suspicious of each other, a characteristic of the Nazi state. And each of them knew that his power depended on a higher authority, that of Hitler. Finally, but far from least, we come to Hitler himself. He never deviated from what had been the leitmotif of his political existence, that there would never, ever, be a cowardly capitulation, an internal revolution, as there had been in 1918. He consequently and consistently refused all entreaties from his paladins to consider a negotiated settlement. For him, that could only follow a victory, not a defeat. There was never a chance of that, once the vice closed on the Third Reich after the major enemy successes, east and west, from June 1944 onwards. The Allied demand for unconditional surrender simply played to his mentality and convictions. Heroic total destruction was for him infinitely preferable to what he saw as the coward's way out of capitulation. The plight of the German people did not concern him. They had proved weak in the war and deserved to go under. After the failure of the Ardennes offensive, he was clear-sighted enough to see that his last card had been played. But he clutched at one straw after another in desperation and impotence to turn the tide that was about to engulf him. Suicide was the obvious and likely way out. In fact, it became the only way out. It was simply a matter of time, and of timing, so that he could not be captured by the Russians. It was also the easy way out for him, since he knew that whatever happened, he had no future after the war. But as long as he lived, his power, if over a rapidly diminishing Reich, could not be challenged, as Goering and Himmler learnt, even in the very last days of his life. Hitler's personality was self-evidently scarcely insignificant to Germany's continued fight. Generals and political leaders alike found him absolutely intransigent if they proposed any alternative course of action. 
Even in the last weeks, some went in to see him demoralized and disconsolate and came away with new enthusiasm and determination. Under a different head of state, say, Goering, until his ousting on the 23rd of April, 1945, Hitler's designated successor, it seems highly likely that Germany would have sued for peace at some point earlier than May 1945. It is indeed questionable whether in the event of Hitler's early demise, Goering or Himmler, the only other feasible candidate to have succeeded, would have had the internal authority with the generals to continue the prosecution of the war. Such a counterfactual scenario only emphasizes once more how much Hitler's insistence on the continuation of the war provided the major obstacle to halting it. This cannot, however, be regarded solely as a matter of Hitler's domineering personality, his intransigence, his detachment from reality, his readiness to take the country and German people down with him to total perdition, however important this was. Beyond this is the question of why the power elite was prepared to allow him to dictate in such disastrous fashion to the end. Albert Speer, ruminating in pseudo-self-reproach in his memoirs about why, when it was obvious that Germany was as good as finished economically and militarily, Hitler was not faced with any joint action from those military leaders in regular contact with him to demand an explanation of how he was going to end the war, with the implication that they might have forced him to do so. Speer thought of such a move coming from Goering, Keitel, Jodl, Dönitz, Guderian, and himself. The proposition, as he well knew, was absurd. Structurally, as well as individually, the group he mentioned was divided, and, his own and Guderian's growing estrangement aside, in any case, arch-loyalists, three of whom fervently backed Hitler's hold-out orders. Confronting Hitler in any organized body, political or military, was completely impossible. The dissolution, from early in the Third Reich, and ever more pronounced during the war, of all structures of collective government ensured that. Mussolini's deposition in July 1943 had come from within his own organization, the Fascist Grand Council, and above Mussolini, at least nominally, stood an alternative source of loyalty, the King of Italy. No similar structures existed in Nazi Germany. Hitler was head of state, commander-in-chief of the armed forces, head of government, and head of the party. He had consistently resisted suggestions to reinstate a form of collective government in the Reich cabinet and the creation of a Senate of the Nazi Party to determine, among other things, the succession. The Gauleiter were summoned to assemble periodically, but only to hear pep talks from Hitler. Even in the armed forces there was a damaging division between the high command of the Wehrmacht, responsible for operations outside the Eastern Front, and the high command of the army, responsible for only the Eastern Front. The problem was compounded by the fact that Hitler was not just supreme commander of the Wehrmacht as a whole, but also commander-in-chief of the army. Even compared with other authoritarian regimes, the personalization of rule in Hitler's regime was extreme. Structures of power, which imbued in varied measure with Nazi ideological values, were all bound to Hitler, gaining legitimization from his charismatic leadership. The fragmentation of governance reflected the character of Hitler's absolute power, even when this started to wane in the very last weeks. Though Hitler's mass appeal, as a charismatic leader, had been in steep decline since the middle of the war, a fragmentation of rule beneath him that had been a hallmark of his charismatic rule from the beginning lasted to the end. It was a fundamental reason why an earlier collapse or a resort to a negotiated settlement, any alternative to the inexorable course of self-destruction, did not take place. The mindset of the ruling elite had attuned to the character of charismatic domination and underpinned the structural determinants preventing any challenge to Hitler. Among Nazi leaders, the personal bonds forged with him at an earlier time proved almost impossible to break, even when the nimbus of infallibility built into the personality cult faded. So did the utter dependence on Hitler for positions of power. 
Speer admittedly distanced himself, though very belatedly, and even he felt an inward urge to make a perilous and futile last trip back into the Führer bunker in the very last days, to say his personal farewell to the leader he had once idolized. Goering, despite bearing the brunt of Hitler's fury at the failure of the Luftwaffe, never broke with him. His deposition from all his offices on the 23rd of April followed a misunderstanding willfully exploited by Bormann, one of the Reich Marshal's arch-enemies. Bormann himself was the loyal right hand of his master, turning Hitler's tirades and outbursts into bureaucratic regulations and orders. Himmler was the strong arm of repression, who, despite surreptitiously going his own way in the last months in an attempt to retain a position of power in a post-Hitler world, continued to recognize his dependency. The breach with Hitler came at the very last, and, as with Goering, seems to have followed a misunderstanding. When Himmler presumed reports of the dictator's breakdown on the 22nd of April had meant his effective abdication. The most committed of all the top Nazi leaders, and among the most clear-sighted of Hitler's acolytes, Josef Goebbels, was one of the very few prepared to stay with him to the end and cast himself on the great funeral pyre of the Third Reich. Beneath the top echelon of party bosses, the Gauleiter still presented a phalanx of outright loyalists, whatever their private feelings, who had long since bound themselves irredeemably to Hitler, even though in the last weeks they started, of necessity, to take independent action as communications with Berlin broke down. Their last collective meeting with Hitler, on the 24th of February, 1945, showed that Hitler's authority was still intact among this important group. Among military leaders, the stance of Grand Admiral Karl Dönitz, head of the Navy, and at Hitler's death his nominated successor, as head of state, is illustrative of the lasting bonds with Hitler. In contrast to his post-war reputation of a military professional who had simply done his duty, Dönitz had been one of the foremost fanatics in his support for Hitler's orders to fight to the last, an outright Nazi in his attitude. But with Hitler gone, the chief and unyielding barrier to capitulation was removed. Given overall responsibility, and feeling freed from his oath of loyalty to Hitler, Dönitz saw the need to bow to military and political reality, and looked immediately to find a negotiated end to a lost war. This sudden reversal of his stance by Dönitz underlies, as clearly as anything, how much the fight to the end, down to complete defeat and destruction, was owing not just to Hitler in person, but to the character of his rule and the mentalities that had upheld his charismatic domination. Of the reasons why Germany was able and willing to fight on to the end, these structures of rule and underlying mentalities behind them are the most fundamental. All the other factors, lingering popular backing for Hitler, the ferocious terror apparatus, the increased dominance of the party, the prominent roles of the Bormann, Goebbels, Himmler, Speer, Quadrumvirate, the negative integration produced by the fear of Bolshevik occupation, and the continued readiness of high-ranking civil servants and military leaders to continue doing their duty when all was obviously lost, were ultimately subordinate to the way the charismatic Führer regime was structured, and how it functioned in its dying phase. Paradoxically, it was by this time charismatic rule without charisma. Hitler's mass charismatic appeal had long since dissolved, but the structures and mentalities of his charismatic rule lasted until his death in the bunker. The dominant elites, divided as they were, possessed neither the collective will nor the mechanisms of power to prevent Hitler taking Germany to total destruction. That was decisive. This has been a Gildan Audio production. For more affordable, life-changing audio programs, visit our website at gildanmedia.com.